open during the break and can be visited during the break. Our first session for the day is creating infrastructure capabilities for advanced air mobility. Creative solutions are required in the short term to create efficient infrastructure required for encouraging advanced air mobility. In the long term, the scope for dedicated vertiports may be explored. This session will explore current infrastructure capabilities like helipads and vertiports and examine new alternative and affordable options for charging infrastructure, landing infrastructure, and vertiports. This session will focus on technical vertiport design specs released by IASA and FAA. City planning for locating vertiports and their multipurpose utility will be discussed. I invite the moderator for the session, Mr. Darrell Swanson, co-founder EA Mavin and former advisor NASA, and our session panelists, Mr. Mihir Bakshi, Senior Associate, HSP Design. Mr. Asa Kwesenberry, Chief Executive Officer, Skyscape. Mr. Ankit Das, Chief Technical Officer, Skyports. Welcome to the panel. Right, can everybody hear me? Can we uh, turn on the mics? Right, so I, I've got a real risk uh, with this panel. Uh, I, I consider these people my friends. Uh, I'm an airport planner at heart. Uh, I spent uh, 20 years planning and designing airports uh, around the world and helping people buy them. So this is a real opportunity for me to geek out um, with, with my friends here. Uh, instead of standing up here and trying to moderate the, the session, I'm going to participate with the guys uh, and we're going to sit down and have a good discussion. The intent is to try and have a discussion, uh, discuss the topics, the trends, what's going on, uh, and then try to draw out some of the unique challenges uh, associated with uh, advanced air mobility infrastructure. And of course, I'll be exploring the use of uh, regional airports uh, for regional air mobility and how that fits in uh, with the larger ecosystem. So in the same style as we did uh, yesterday, I'm gonna start at the end of the panel with Ankit, uh, ask him to give himself a, a brief introduction to him, the company that he's working with, uh, and his thoughts uh, on, on the panel session. Uh, then we'll go to Asa and then Mahir, please. Hello everyone. Um, I'm Ankit Das, the Chief Technology Officer at Skyports. We are a London-based organization uh, who are involved in designing, building, operating the wordy boats. Um, our primary goal is how can we define and create sustainable as well as commercially viable infrastructure for eVTOL operations? Because we do feel that is an essential piece of the puzzle of the advanced air mobility ecosystem. And I'm really happy to be on this panel to discuss you know, how we can share our ideas and progress this industry further in terms of infrastructure development for EV tools. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Asa Questenberry. I'm the founder and president of Skyscape Corporation. We are a Japan-based vertiport development and management company. Uh, we primarily focus really on two aspects with vertiport development. Um, one is profitability for the owners of these sites and as well as value for the communities that they're based in. Uh, we strongly believe that as any urban planner or any infrastructure developer, you know, these sites need to be interoperable. They need to have, you know, a variety of values that they can offer for their communities if we really want to see this industry succeed and become all that it can be. Um, again, thank you to CII and everyone for putting this together and happy to be here and happy to join the discussion today. Yep. Yeah. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to speak here. I am Mihir Bakshi. I am an airport planner. I have been working on the airport development projects across India, UK, and Australia. Uh, my current uh, interest is to kind of look at the transport infrastructure in India. How can it be more sustainable? How can it be future ready? And what can we do to kind of you know make sure that we are ready for the technologies that are coming in? So that that's my uh, goal to kind of learn right now and help everyone here to understand how we can create infrastructure. Thank you. And of course, I'm uh, Daryl, uh, and you know enough about me. Um, I, I think it's really interesting here that we've got uh, representation uh, across multiple continents, uh, and I really want to draw on the examples uh, between the two of them. But we're going to start off with a, a video, uh, Ankit, that you've provided uh, on the uh, Skyports uh, projects. So can, can we play the first video, please? 
Welcome to the Skyport's Vertibord at Pontoise Cormet Airfield in Paris. This is Europe's first fully integrated vertical test bed, which is designed to test the entire value chain of advanced air mobility technologies. This is a combination of project we've been doing with ADP since 2019. They invested in Skyports very early on, one of our first investors. And it allows us to get exposure to an airport company which has got a global reach, one of the biggest airport companies in the world. And to be able to build a vertiport air side at an operational airport is great for Skyports and ADP. It allows us to do operational testing in a live environment. We can test our technology, make sure it operates with existing aviation traffic. And we can test our people processes and do lots of things behind the scenes that we want to do ahead of our global expansion. And it's a natural step on the journey to permanent commercial operations. As passengers enter the Vertiport terminal, they will go through a check-in process where we verify their identity, and then they proceed to the lobby where passengers can wait before their departure. The entire passenger journey needs to be as quick and smooth as possible so that we minimize the dwell time and the overall passenger journey uh, from their origin to their destination. A couple of minutes before the flight, passengers will be asked to start boarding. The gate will verify their identity and confirm that they are designated to their departing flight. And then they will be escorted uh, by a member of staff to the aircraft before they do their pre-departure briefing and take off. This vertiport whilst on French soil is uh, a great testing environment for us to translate those learnings to other environments around the world. As we move towards our first operational cities, many of which will be with Group ADP, we can take these learnings, the technology we've got here, and use best-in-class practices in other environments around the world. So, Daryl, if I may just... Yeah, please. Uh, uh, so, this, this is a site which we had launched in north of Paris, uh, end of November last year. It is one of the first operational testing vertiport where OEMs are actively and regularly testing their flights and integration with the infrastructure. Uh, that has enabled us to learn a lot as to what is involved in the concept of operations, as well as what are the challenges which we face when you've got a Vertiport and eVTOL and some charging equipment all at the same site. Happy to discuss this further with you guys later. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that video is, is a, a great testimony to, to the amount of work that actually has to go into developing a Vertiport, getting all these systems uh, working together, the communication system, the passenger screening systems, how the energy side of, of it actually works. So I'm really happy that you're able to, to share that video. Um, and it, it's really important because uh, ADP are going to be doing uh, flights uh, for the Paris Olympics, which is just around the corner. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So uh, flights are kicking off from this side as well as other part of the network which ADP is creating uh, in, uh, in lineup for the Paris Olympics next year. And the challenge is how do we now not just build a node in a network which we have created, but how do you create an actual network and how do you optimize that network for energy usage as well as you know flight scheduling, the technology integration between various sites and how do those sites integrate with various parts of the locations in Paris, which would be chosen, you know, in terms of community perception, as well as, you know, technology advancements where the whole of the region benefits from it. So yeah, a massive challenge ahead. Great. Uh, Asa, I, I'm interested to understand about uh, the Japanese market uh, that you're working in and perceptions of how densely you can develop uh, vertiports in a city center, given the challenges that land availability is, is almost nil. If there's land available, it's been built on. Because I want to dispel some of this, this uh, idea that you're going to have a vertiport on every other rooftop or hundreds of vertiports in city center. It's, it's a myth. It's not going to happen. Uh, can you give us a bit on your experience? Yeah, of course. I think, you know, Japan and not even Japan, but, you know, Southeast Asia in general, APAC in general has, you know, its own unique challenges. And the really interesting point that we're at now in the industry is at the same time, you know, yesterday I talked about harmonization and moving towards global standards of everything. But at the same time, when you get into these regional and these different locations, they are innately different and they require their own different approach. So back to Japan, you know, when we look at the, the FAA guidelines that came out and the size requirements for those facilities, they don't make sense in Southeast no. Asia. You know, it, it's you don't have that land availability. Japan is 82 percent 
mountains and islands, right? So when you talk about the size requirements, you have to find a different approach. Um, so with this, you know, we work very, very closely with our partners to figure out, okay, well, if if the standard idea of a larger site with higher uh, flight traffic, higher capacity, higher frequencies, if that approach doesn't necessarily work, how do you still create profitability for those smaller locations? And how do you find ways to add that value on top of that? Um, in terms of the, you know, everyone wants to say, how can I convert my old helipad into a, a rooftop vertiport, right? And arguably, especially in our country, you know, it's it's not very realistic with earthquake standards, with, you know, very, very rigid building codes. Most likely what will be is new developments going forward. You'll see these rooftop facilities, but the older kind of um, exist, currently existing vertiports or helipads on top of rooftops, it's, it's a huge challenge to actually trying to convert them that oftentimes isn't really worth pursuing in many ways. I uh, absolutely agree with that. Mihir, can you give us a bit of your perspective of the Indian market in terms of what structures are in place to support the development of verti ports, um, drawing on your experience in, in, the, in planning and design and, and your architectural practice that you're working with? So uh, currently there is not much infrastructure or there's no thought process to try and kind of identify locations or safeguard land or things like that. But, uh, you know, the DGCA, uh, so uh, traditionally how the airports are done, right? So they, and uh, Hyderabad airport, Bangalore airport, all of them, the sites were identified long time back, whole regulation, connectivity, access, everything was established and the airport started going. The current Bangalore airport with two terminals has taken more than, I think, 20 years now. So, you know, we, we need to think ahead. We need to start talking of, you know, like, like what just Asa mentioned, that if you want to do a vertiport, which is defined by FAA or ESR, you will need a site which is as big as a airport or, or you will need something similar. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you know, uh, when, when they did the airports, uh, the, there were no regulations. So the terminal could be of any size, any uh, height, whatever, right? Because it, it's in a segregated location. If I'm trying to do the same vertiport in the center of the city, I will have to follow the development regulations. I will have to follow the FSI regulations. I will also have to look at the access that you will get on that site. So, so there, is, there is a lot of limitations if we actually talk of the vertiport that we are looking at and trying to build it in the city center, uh, I think is a, is a quite a bit of a challenge. Right, yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I, I think the idea of multiple verti ports in cities is, is difficult. And, and we did a, a, an analysis through the Future Flight Challenge in the UK on the Skybus project. Uh, and we did a deep dive in terms of the number of sites that might be suitable uh, for, for verti port operations. And we ended up concentrating on a, a site um, near London Bridge, which was actually out into the Thames because it, we could just could not find a space big enough. And, and that was only six stands. Now, mind you, the Skybus uh, EV tall was a 30 seat beast of an aircraft. So it's a very large aircraft, so disproportionate to everything else. But when you start putting in all the standards around how much separation you have to have between FATOs or TLOFs and the stands, um, it, it makes it very difficult. And, and it, it almost comes back to the way that airports are laid out and airports are, are big because you have all these space requirements between stands to, to allow for the safe operation of aircraft. So I, I want to switch a, a little bit. Um, we have two states of play that we're looking at right now. So the video that we showed earlier was uh, the test bed, a relatively small footprint uh, facility. What I'd like to understand from, from your perspective is what does it look like when we get to volume? So what does a, a, a volume operation look like where you're having a, an aircraft taking off and landing every minute or so? Uh, what, what does that future look like and how many people can we actually put through these uh, vertiports? And are we going to, uh, in theory, reduce congestion on the roads? Uh, good question. If I had the answer, I wouldn't be here today. You know? I would be <laughs> operating those vertiports and making money. Uh, but I, th I think what you got to uh, look at is we need to still understand and define the value chain a bit as to who are the stakeholders and what role they will play. Uh, because still those roles and responsibilities are not very precise or clear. It's hard to define in terms of who has the work to do in terms to operate a high frequency vertiport. But you know, we have done some internal studies and, you know, looking at some modeling and simulation data, uh, we think that a two FATO four stand vertiport can accommodate more than 35 flights an hour. 
right? So that's mm -hmm. like, you know, almost two minutes as a flight, less than two minutes. Now, there's a lot of challenges to be solved on the ground infrastructure level and what we term them as resource management uh, problems. For example, how do you maximize the efficiency or the throughput of all the ground infrastructure which is required for turning around an aircraft? like the FATO availability, the stand availability, and all the electrical equipment which might be located there. Then the challenge compounds because now you need to deal with the operator capability as well to support multiple flights. You know, Can they have enough of bandwidth in terms of the pilots as well as the flight planning capability, the scheduling of their aircraft at the right location at the right time, which is a big bottleneck as well in, in the initial days. And then the third problem which really becomes is the airspace problem. How do you classify your airspace so that all different types of vehicles can operate at the same time at a high throughput? Coupled with all of these things, there's a big challenge which our industry still has to solve is how do you electrify and charge so many aircrafts, right? If you want to do like 35 operations an hour, and if these aircrafts are going to require ultimately the MCS charging standard, the megawatt charging, how do you provide that sort of capability? So that's why I think it's important to understand those stakeholders because we have to take them on the journey as well, right? And that is still a process we are ongoing. Just want to, you know, like I think uh, Amit Datta yesterday mentioned, you know, like looking in the side mirror, you know, it appears closer it is, right? So we have a similar analogy at Skyports, right? Nowadays, where the industry has reached, you can look in the side mirror and you can see all the stakeholders who are trying to push advanced air mobility industry. Now the time is, how do we make sure we stick in our lane, support each other, and cross the last red light so we can get past and reach our destination? So that's what we are doing at the moment to really figure it out. Great. Asa, what, what, what do you think it looks like in, in the APAC region in terms of when we get the volume of operations? To me, when I look at like a mature network and what I imagine what how things will play out is in many ways that EVTOLs, you know, we have a, a plethora of EVTOL companies, OEMs, makers, everything from the larger players that we've heard today to people building craft in their garage, right? And with these EVTOLs, you're getting very use case specific kind of aircraft as well. And I think in many ways, Vertiport and the infrastructure development is going to end up mirroring that, where you have a variety of locations within an area for a variety of different use cases. So when you think of every all the challenges that Anka just mentioned, on top of things like storing the aircraft, where do they go at night, which we talked about yesterday? Uh, where do you go to maintenance these aircraft? Where do you go for you know any of the other things that are necessary? There's no way for one site to handle all of those systems and all of those kind of responsibilities. So with that, what you in you know my very humble opinion, what I think will play out is you'll have locations throughout a city, throughout a region where these aircraft are coordinated to go to for the different servicing that they need, right? One for charging. I mean, if you look at just kind of bringing people and deporting passengers, the turnaround time, if you have to charge those aircraft as well, it, it gets complicated really, really quickly. So in that sense, I imagine you'll have one area for charging, one area for storage, uh, another site for maintenance. To me, that's the most realistic Kind of approach and then as well it also creates a lot of opportunity for a variety of stakeholders as you mentioned to get involved a variety of owners to get involved and a variety of ways for people to actually profit off of having these facilities and, and operating them um in a business sense it, it, it's almost like thinking about uh f1 pit stops uh in, in the way that the aircraft are coming in you're in this case you're changing out passengers and you're trying to load on as many of the electrons as you possibly can you may not be able to get all the electrons on that, that you want, but you have to take that, uh, that, that power from somewhere else. So it's very interesting. I mean, here, what, what, what do you think um, UAM would look like in India in say 10 or 15 years time? How, how, how do you think it's gonna play out? I think for the starters, you know, we will be looking at all the heli bases or the small airports like the HL, the Blade is operating. Uh, in Bombay, you have an ONGC heli base, which is currently trying to sort, uh, provide the helicopter sorties for the rigs, right? So this smaller locations will start. That would be easy or a very low hanging fruit. And, you know, it will have a proof of concept that, yeah, there, it, it works. There is a connection. All of that infrastructure knowledge can be kind of gathered at these locations. And uh, uh, in India, right right now, the Railway Land Development Authority or the Transport Authority or uh, Smart Cities, all of them are actually planning for, say, 
five years, 10 years down the line. My, my view would be that, you know, we can start thinking of VertiPort or say VertiBase infrastructure in the smart city plan today, or the Railway Land Development Authority, which is a PPP where they actually do the railway terminals and then they do the rest of the commercial development. Maybe in the master plan, they include space or provide land for some of this infrastructure. And, you know, it, it helps in two or three ways. One, that, you know, the access or the connectivity to other modes of transport so is easily possible, mm -hmm. uh, which is a little bit tricky in India with the kind of road networks and the traffic congestion that we see in Bangalore, Mumbai, or any other cities. So, so it solves that one problem. Second, it also allows uh, to, you know, have uh, revenue streams for each other, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, the Railway Land Development Authority uh, is doing these projects, but there is no commercial uh, model like airport. So they're trying to follow the airport model, but there is not a real profitability or a commercial model that has yet evolved. Something like this can help and balance uh, a gap here. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what my view is. So I think these are the two things which I can you know, imagine. that. Mm. Okay, well, let, let's explore that a little bit more. So yesterday, a question was raised about the charges, uh, the, the financial charges uh, for landing and landing operating fees. passengers because it goes directly uh, to the, the cost per, per mile. Um, ASA. What 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 what's your yeah, opinion we, on that? We talked at breakfast yeah. about this, and, and this this is we're we're not setting this up at all. This is the challenge in in the early years of this, right? Where, as we mentioned yesterday, you know, well the 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 price per flight mile, price per seat, right? They'll say, oh, that's very dependent on what type of landing fees get charged. Yeah. Well, if you're a, a vertiport operator, and in the very early years, there's only so many flights per day, of course you want to maximize profits, and of course you would want to charge higher landing fees because that's how you can assure that your site is actually profitable in the long run. So there's an immediate kind of conflict, I think, in that space where the OEMs want the landing fees to be as low as possible, but from a viable business sense, the vertiport and the infrastructure operators have to charge a little bit more, especially in the early years when you won't have that high capacity, those, you know, a large number of flights. So, and I'm interested to hear what, what you both think as well, because when we talk about profitability of these sites, I, I think in the early years, just passenger operations, there's there's no way you actually generate profit from that in the short term, right? You have to have other services, whether services that the community can access, services for the actual um, operators themselves that can generate other profits. So I'm interested to hear, you know, what has your team looked at in that space or, or kind of what ideas come to mind? Because you can't just rely on passenger flights, especially the first two to three years of this. Skyports usually classifies uh, revenue under two categories. One is going to be error revenue. The other one's going to be non-error revenue. And if I start with error revenue, it's a function of the throughput of a vertiport, the requirement in terms of the standardization and regulatory requirements, which increases the cost in some cases, as well as the passenger demand and numbers and the projection of those, right? Uh, that itself produces a number which sometimes is not viable for many of the operators. You know, we get, we get that question every day. But what you got to really understand is that we want, as I said, right, every stakeholder has to succeed. We can't price ourselves out by, you know, having such a high charge that, you know, the operators don't want to operate, but you don't want the infrastructure uh, guys to fail as well because then you won't have any vertiports, right? So how do we find the balance whereby the initial costs might be high, but the projected EBITDA numbers or whatever, uh, you know, gives you a clear visibility as to when you start making the desired profit you might want. And with the growth of the network, how does that revenue compound? Mm -hmm. It will compound. It's not linear, right? It's exponential once you start building the network, right? Because you start getting the network effects, like in a social network. And that network, I'm not talking about just a Skyports network. It could be a network comprised of other competitors. And I think that's why that whole stakeholder and the ecosystem coming together is going to be very important initially. Mm. non error revenue, we do feel that the VertiPort footprints is going to be quite small, especially if you want to do it in urban areas. And if it's going to be small, we want to make sure that the space is optimized for the actual operation rather than for retail or other services. We do expect some sort of, you know, marketing in terms of, you know, 
uh, so advertisement and all that, but we do not expect any major retail facilities, especially if we are going to provide a high throughput operation where the passengers are going to expect the minimum amount of dwell time within a terminal. So it's just, it's just how we think about body ports and want to design them. Right. So uh, we, we've, we've said it before, uh, and I, I've mentioned it. I, I, I think uh, so Skyports uh, and Ferrovial uh, both have a, a strategy of providing relatively small facilities. I have a slightly different opinion. Uh, and, and the reason for that is if there is a delay within the system, um, I think one of the assumptions is that uh, they would contact the, the traveler and say, I'm sorry, your flight's delayed, uh, don't come to the Verdi port. But I think usually by the time that that delay is uh, recognized within the system, even with a good UTM system and good comms, that passenger is already on their way to the Verdi port. So that passenger is going to show up uh, and they're going to end up in a crowded facility uh, and people are going to get upset. Now, I think that's a small problem in the, in the first years, uh, but I think as, as the facilities grow and we start to get to volume, I think the, the master planning process will see us uh, expand out of that. My, my personal opinion is that uh, the, the services that should be offered in Verdi ports uh, in terms of commercial revenue are probably going to be more time-based uh, in terms of uh, small places for an executive or a business person to go to, to sit down to have a, uh, a, a few minutes to send that email or recharge their uh, phone or have a conversation with somebody or possibly uh, a meeting space uh, where you can have uh, several executives or salespeople flying in, uh, having that uh, important meeting and then going off. And then I'm starting to think that uh, in terms of the infrastructure around the Verdi port, you're going to start to see these businesses popping up to actually support it. And so this is something that uh, Clint Harper was talking about uh, yesterday uh, about how the ecosystem around Verdi ports, and, and we start to get this Verdi-tropolis uh, type development. So drawing uh, from uh, John Cascarda uh, and, and his book there. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious, uh, how, how, what, what do you guys think is going to happen to the areas around Verdi ports uh, as they begin to get busy? Uh, are we gonna have to think about different planning legislation um, to support the operation and make sure that we're not displacing uh, local communities um, or, or transforming the business so it's less value. You, you want to increase the value. So, Mahir, your, your, your thoughts on, on the planning uh, aspect of it. I, I, like I just mentioned, you know, we will have to think about all those areas. The urban, if we are doing a work report in an urban setting, we will have to get into an urban planning, urban design kind of a concept. We'll have to look at what kind of access and transport facilities you're going to provide, how you're going to make sure that the development around the vertiport is within that obstacle limitation. Like in the ESR, it still mentions 45 meters as the height. Now, if I'm doing a vertiport inside the city, 45 meter is nothing. That commercial value of the land will decrease. So, so we will have to think of innovative things. Mm -hmm. how, how, how can we kind of, you know, leverage the benefit of quick transport to what it gets converted to as a commercial value that that needs to be done that there needs to be more work to kind of see how it will fit into an urban fabric okay so, yeah so so question uh easa or fa uh, in terms of verdi ports uh standards just kind of curious i'll, I'll go first here yeah. okay um, I'm not taking any sides. It's not. It's not necessarily a sky <laughs> taking sides. Let's be clear here. Uh, but let's talk technical, right? Uh, FA Engineering Brief 105 is very light on details, specifically when you need to delve deep into the technical content to understand what you need to build. I think some of the suggestions about FATO, TLOFs, the load load bearing requirements. I think are really not well aligned as to how generally the advanced air mobility industry is planning to move ahead. Uh, but given that FA usually has always taken that approach, it's not the first time. So they're going to start like this. They're going to let the industry define things. We are one of the contributors to the reply to FA as to what changes they need to make in the next version of the engineering brief. And hopefully those will get reflected. Just on the basis, what I've said, you can understand. So EASA, PTS guidelines are way more detailed, involve a lot more stakeholders, is much more defined in terms of following it and building a test site. Paris, for example, is built on the ESA PTS guidelines. Uh, so at the moment, you know, we are making sure that at least the stricter guidelines, which ESA is, is more detailed and more defined, are being followed so that we can build a vertiport which can operate globally. 
it's very important for us to create a playbook of Vertipo design manual, as well as the whole technology so mm -hmm. that we can rinse and repeat it globally everywhere. And I think at that moment, uh, and based on that for us at the moment, EASA one is much more better suited for what we are trying to do. Right. Likewise, I, I think, um, echo a lot of the statements there with, with EASA, um, as Ankita just mentioned, if you can build it, if you can come up with your, your playbook, so to speak, for the most stringent uh, kind of approach in the most stringent regulatory space, you can then apply that in most locations without any issues. Um, I think, and again, not choosing one or the other, the FAA is designed with a country in mind that has ample space, mm -hmm. right? So when you have that ample space and when you imagine taking a traditional kind of aviation approach, that's how you get some of the, the results that were kind of described there in the design brief. Um, but very, very similar kind of thought. If you can come up with kind of your playbook for that stringent approach, you can apply it in whichever local market you're in with adjusting things here and there to actually fit uh, whatever region you might be operating in. Great. I, I think this is just a first edition. So I, I think they are also looking for validation. And I think like most of the aviation that has moved to performance-based uh, you know, safety and standards, uh, this will also kind of evolve as we move forward. Well, I agree with both of you that the ESI is, is much more detailed, much more uh, you know, con comprehensive in terms of what it covers. Okay. I think, I think if I might just add, right, so I think <laughs> I, I feel the same thing, you know, coming from you both as well, right? So when we are designing our vertiport specifications internally, whether it's digital systems or physical infrastructure, we follow a motto whereby it's like open for extension, but closed for modification. So and that close for modification is all about once we know what those regulations and guidelines are, which are well defined from ASA, you could, you know, really clear a wrap around it, you know, a ring fence it. And so you can close for modification, but you can always extend it as the regulation evolves, mm -hmm. right? Which is much more easier. And, you know, you won't have to recertify anything or have to completely change your strategy. So that's how our policy is, you know, just, yeah. yeah. Always open for extension, but no for modification. Yeah, yeah. So, so this vertiport, whatever we are talking, this is just the air side part. Okay. What, what about the building? So, so in in airport terminology, we have IATA, which basically combines all the airlines and you know tries to give you a standard, tries to tell you how it's to be operated. So, so, so what's your view on that? So, what's going to happen to the buildings? Are they just going to be individual, driven by the operators, or it's just going to get into some kind of standardization as well? So just to clarify, is this in terms of the development of the building around it? Is this the operations of the facility? The terminal buildings. The yeah, terminal, terminal buildings. buildings. And, I, and I think, again, this is, this is going to be determined by the facility or building itself, right? I, I think that what we're seeing right now is, is the need for local approaches. And with, with the terminals, I think it's going to be no different. Um, in terms of operations of the terminals, for us, I think our kind of goal is to remain flexible. Really, it's depending on who we're talking to. We've talked to groups that, you know, they have aviation background. They want to operate everything themselves. They just need a facility developed and kind of handed off to them. And then other groups as well who want to get involved, but they have no experience in this space. So you need to provide operations for them. Um, and I'm, I think, am I answering the right thing here? Right. Term so operations. Then, yeah. Just a follow up question on that, right? So again, the security part, right? So again, so when when we to talk of a flying object, security is one of the key aspects, right? So in India, at least, there is like TSA, we have CISF and BCAS who actually regulates how or what needs to be done for the security. So if I am left with individual operators, how are you going to control the security part of it? And, and, and that's also something that we will have to think. You know, I, I was just watching the video and uh, I, I don't know if you guys have looked at the DG Yatra video, which is uh, circulating on the internet. It, it's almost similar. So what, what we have done is a lot of stakeholders have come together and they've created a platform called DG Yatra where they use the face as your boarding pass and you don't have to do any paperwork. You just, yeah, you just go through the, exactly the way you were showing. Now, this is only possible if you have a common platform. If I have 10 operators, I'll have 10 systems, I'll have to register for 10 times. So I, I think that, that this also needs to kind of, you know, be thought of uh, in, in a little bit more detail. And, and, and we need to kind of take like exactly like the stakeholders, all the stakeholders on board and see. Yeah. And, and really, I think building off of the, the first panel yesterday with harmonization, 
right? You, you need to have the Vertiport and the Vertiport developers also moving towards that harmonization because you're not going to have a variety of systems from one location. You're not going to have one network of Vertiports that can't be accessed by another network of Vertiports, right? That's not how this industry grows. Um, so I think that's, that's on the responsibility for the Vertiport companies now. The startups really is to move towards how can we work together? How can we make sure that what one passenger experiences at one location, whether it's built by Skyports, whether it's built by Skyscape, whether it's built by Ferrovial, is within the same realm that it doesn't create any kind of friction or impedes the actual access or utilization of these facilities. So I think that's really what you're going to be seeing from this year on is that harmonization of these groups coming together, same way with the OEMs in terms of, for example, you know, charging infrastructure, right? Moving towards in one way that or moving towards something that can be applied anywhere, essentially. Uh, totally agree. Um, and I think, uh, so Skyport started that journey around a year and a half back. Um, and I can probably say over here, right? So all the integrations which we are building with various operators and OEMs are openly available from Skyports because we want to make sure that we can standardize that. And I know there are a lot of OEMs sitting here with whom I work personally and who have been interacting with our digital systems to create that standardized layer of data exchange mechanism, not for one region, not for one use case, but globally for every use case. My next challenge is how do I bring on other VertiPort operators to ad adopt that standard as well? We are also influencing the regulators, pardon me, don't take it in a wrong way, but you know, recommending uh, as to what the digital standards should be for VertiPort data interchange. We are working on the Agility Prime program with um, trying to influence the FAA through some of our partners, as well as the UK RI, whereby we are working on various projects, uh, Project Amec in UK, where we are again leveraging the same principle and trying to show to the regulator how they can help us establish a standard for digital interaction, which ultimately leads to consistent passenger experience. Brilliant. Uh, I'm starting to get a, a bit of time dilation effect here. I'm, I'm just absolutely geeking out on this. So uh, we're, we're going to have about 10 minutes left uh, before we have to start to prepare for the minister uh, arrival. Um, I've often said that uh, Vertiports have to complement, not compete with public transport. Um, and, and we know within Japan, the public transport is absolutely fantastic. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap this up with that and then we'll go to a, a Q&A. Uh, while we're waiting for the minister's arrival. So is this in terms of how this integrates with the existing transit, right? Is that correct, Dale? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's, if you're thinking any other way, then it's not gonna be successful, right? Um, in Japan, and this comes from working with transit groups, working with rail operators, working with uh, infrastructure developers already to make sure that at the Vertiport location within the Vertopolis or whatever the term was yesterday, um, these other existing modes of transportation are readily available. Um, because you, the reality is, you know, not for a very long time, we're not going to have a point where eBTOL solve the entire leg of the journey, right? It's going to be, at least in our domestic market, it's going to be a train ride to the location, uh, the eBTOL to the second point. And then from that point, it could be, you know, micro mobility or something that actually gets you there. there. There's a lot of options, but you have to make sure that not only are you making sure that your facility can operate with the, the OEMs and the aircraft, but then also it can be plugged into the existing infrastructure networks and the infrastructure or the transit infrastructure that's readily available. Um, really, I think the, the interesting part in, in having urban planners up here is fantastic because in my opinion, you know, this is arguably one of the largest urban planning challenges in modern history. I mean, we're taking aviation and, and aviation transit, which has been 100% separate since its inception and then trying to integrate it into the everyday fabric. And with that, you know, the urban planning aspect is is huge, right? It can't be understated. Um, so happy to see more urban planners getting involved in these discussions on intermobility and making sure that its other options are available for the passengers. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the that, that option that you have to have a system that's planned together um, I, I think if, if you put a, a Vertiport application into any city or local authority where you're going to start to increase the number of uh, single user taxi journeys to get to that Vertiport, um, I, I think a local authority would be insane to say yes. And I, I think we saw evidence of that uh, in Uber Elevate, uh, was it 2018 or 19, uh, when they were looking at converting car parks uh, in, into Vertiports or multi-story car parks. And my criticism there was that uh, to, to support the number of operations that they have, they, some, some of the plants had lots of Uber uh, vehicles coming up and dropping passengers off with 
areas for Uber drivers to sit and wait and recharge their vehicles. But the ground congestion that you're actually going to create uh, through that model just doesn't make sense. Uh, I, I think early on, I think 2017, the Uber Elevate, one of the concepts uh, was a, a vertiport that was going to handle 10,000 passengers an hour. Uh, just to put that into context, 10,000 passengers an hour um, on two acres of land. Uh, LAX, um, one of the biggest airports in, in the U.S., they do 20,000 passengers an hour on two and a half thousand acres of land. So you could imagine the chaos that would ensue on the ground if you tried to put 10,000 people through two acres of land and get them out onto, onto the road system. In fact, uh, at that time, uh, a lot of the concepts that the architects were coming up with were vertiport facilities that were spanning highways. It's like, well, that's kind of defeating the purpose of what advanced air mobility really should be about. It's about getting people to close to where they actually want to be. So I'm kind of glad that um, sense and sensibility is, is starting to come into it uh, and make it a little bit easier in terms of uh, developing that infrastructure. Right. Um, I'm going to take us now to the floor uh, in terms of questions. So if there's anybody with uh, questions uh, for our panelists uh, about the infrastructure side and how we provide it, uh, please raise your hand. We have uh, mics uh, that are available to go around. Uh, oh, we've got our first question here. Hi. Please uh, introduce yourself. And Hi, uh, I'm Arun. I uh, just wanted to check with you while we've been speaking about the uh, body port standards and the ESA and the FAA have come out with their uh, early uh, uh, proposals. Would you be able to throw some light on the early conversations you've had with uh, platform OEMs and uh, with other stakeholders as to what would be the, uh, in your opinion, some ideal locations in cities where you would want to see these vertiports come up based on use cases and based on uh, demand? Would you have been able to arrive at uh, some idea on what positions and locations you think would be most attractive and make best uh, business sense? I'll, I'll, go, I'll go and take that. Uh, so yes, um, our process of site selection involves, you know, talking to the operators or OEMs to start with, you know, like, you know, what use case they're trying to serve with their aircraft and, you know, what do they want to achieve in terms of passenger numbers? So usually when operators come to us, they've done some sort of passenger demand study, and then begins the Skyports process. So we take those numbers, but then we have a upside down pyramid uh, technical due diligence process. It's almost like a filtering process. So based on those numbers, we run it past our site selection process, which considers civil, electrical, airspace requirements, and try to understand you know, what of those criteria are being met, as well as the operator's criteria is being met to satisfy and come up with a list of actual locations, not the region now anymore, or not the use case, the locations where it makes sense to build the wordy port. So for us, it's a completely a function of commercial viability for the operator, plus technical viability in terms of all the requirements required from a wordy port point of view. Then it goes through a phase of making sure that that filtered list of sites which we have can meet and we can build it in such a way that we can meet the requirements of EASA PTS or the operational requirements which we may have onto us to make sure that you know it's viable for us to make that. So it's a, it's, it's a pretty hard process. Usually what happens is when operators start talking to us, it's usually like 10,000 sites in a region and ultimately it comes down to five sites. And uh, mm -hmm. so, and then we start doing detailed design on those sites. So. That's what one of my whole team, body port planning team does day in, day out. So it's it's not an exact defined science, but I think we've got the process quite well ironed out that the operators are really happy with some of the site selections we are proposing. Does that help you with the answer? Yeah, brilliant. Any other questions? Here we go. Check, check. I'm group captain Rajapan an aviation expert. My question is to Mr. Angitas. All over the world and India also, we have perfected the technology of airport construction and heliport construction. And being a specialist on the aviation, I can really say that construction of a worthy port is not so difficult. It is a matter of use of existing knowledge 
at the appropriate place. And the stakeholders, once they come together, it can be done without much of a problem. Now, what I find is, uh, is the issue of Hathi and Ankush. What is important is we have to bring down the cost of the advanced aerial mobility platforms, that is the air taxis. And the associated infrastructures can be built without much of a problem. The scaling up of the platforms, that is what is important and needs to be done on a priority in India. Thank you. A good comment. I totally agree with you. Uh, the, just to reference the video which you saw for Sergi Pontoa, that Vertiport was built. If you just look at the Vertiport building, that was built in eight to 10 weeks. Exactly. So it doesn't take long. It doesn't cost much. And as I told you, we want to create a playbook where we can rinse and repeat this everywhere. The cost comes in lack of standardization and rules and regulations as to how you work with various stakeholders, which increases the cost. Actually, the cost of the time to put into, you know, bring every stakeholder on the table and discuss that. And I think that will gradually reduce as well over time. And that's the whole idea. If you have to meet the promise of advanced mobility of whatever dollars the operators co uh, quote for per mile, um, I think there are some unknowns left, like electrification, that I'll hold my hand up. I don't have an answer to that, but rest of the things are pretty well defined and the cost is generally coming down. So I agree with you, yeah. Hey, sir, did you have anything? Yeah, it's it's the same. I think um, in you know, to build up what Ankit said in terms of the actual site selection process, you know, that's just from the operator's point of view at this very, very early point, you know, where the operators need to have sites. I think the next thing that's gonna come is, is what happens after this industry begins? What happens when we start seeing actual flights and then you have people that aren't operators suddenly considering, should I build a port here? I wanna get involved. Should I look at you know, this location or this location? What area makes sense? What's the value of one site compared mm -hmm. to another? Um, so making sure that you can take the processes from you know, helping the operator site or select locations, then move that into the future kind of developers side of things and people that are looking for their own sites as well is really important, while at the same time moving towards standardization so that the prices drop. Um, as well, supply chains are quite important. I think we attended a working group recently um, in Japan talking about the types of materials that are going to be commonly used um, in these facilities. So making sure that partners in the the main or the manufacturing side, the supply chains are also on boards so that you can continue to push these prices to a point that makes sense for people that aren't an operator to open yeah. up their own facility or to kind of invest in a vertiport. Yeah. So I I agree that the construction side is actually easy because that's there's great engineers uh, out there and great design companies and great architectural firms uh, that can do that. Um, the angle that I would spin on that is it's sometimes about the planning application process. Uh, and that can be very difficult. I, I do a lot of work uh, in London helping property developers get tall buildings uh, in the city. So we're going to be working on the tallest building in London again. Um, but of course, we have London City Airport, we have Heathrow Airport and airspace. So navigating that planning process can be very difficult. And sometimes it can take two years for a planning application uh, to go through. And, and you can imagine with the first Verdi ports, there are gonna be lots of objections and chances are there's gonna be judicial reviews that we'll have to go through. Uh, and, and I thought it was actually really interesting, a, a question a couple of years ago to Duncan Walker of Skyports, um, somebody asked him, uh, so when do we need to start putting in planning applications? And his answer was two years ago, because the process is just so difficult. So Mihir, your, your experience on, on the planning, um, authorities and, and how long it takes uh, no, to get I, an application through yeah I, I think i agree with you you know this, it is generally very long and uh, all of this will be new so they will have to kind of do all kind of risk assessments we'll have to do test cases and and do all that research yeah. to kind of support that this particular infrastructure can be built uh, at this location so yeah. i'm sure it's going to take a long time and i think we need to start planning in, in C. right Okay, I'm going to have to uh, call our session to the end. Uh, we have a little bit of housekeeping uh, work to do in terms of changeover for uh, when the minister arrives. Uh, so I'm going to say thank you very much uh, for your input, gentlemen. Really appreciate it. Uh, okay. we, we, we have one video that, uh, yeah, so we I think have there's one more video, video uh, which is showing the, the, the video which you saw earlier was about what we have already done. The next video is what we are doing next. Please have a look.
Thank you. And with that, thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Mihir, Asa, and Ankit. It will be an exciting time when Vertiports will engage communities that will be moving through these Vertiports to get to their destinations. The availability of infrastructure in crowded cities with the opportunity to keep a community engaged while they wait is an interesting problem to solve. I now request uh, Daryl to hand over a token of our appreciation to the panelists. I request everyone to remain seated. Uh, we will have our Honorable Minister of Civil Aviation joining us very shortly. Uh, please do not leave the room. We'll start, in, we'll start very, very shortly.
Slowed rotor compound technology was pioneered by Carter Aviation Technologies. At high speeds, the wings support the aircraft, allowing the rotor to be unloaded, and its spinning slow down, which dramatically reduces drag. Because the rotor supports the aircraft for takeoff and landing, the wings can be much smaller than regular airplane wings. It's this combination of small wings and slow rotor that allows slowed rotor compound aircraft to fly so fast and efficiently. Carter's most successful prototype was the personal air vehicle, or PAV. Jump takeoffs are routine in the PAV. Can I request everyone in the back of the room to please be seated? We're expecting our minister in the next five minutes. Helicopters. A high lip to drag leads directly to enhanced fuel economy, climb performance, and glide ratio. When the rotor slows to around 100 RPM, you can actually see the rotor turning. The rotor drag practically disappears, and the rotor becomes very quiet. In 2019, Jaunt Air Mobility acquired all intellectual property pertaining to slowed rotor technology. Their reduced rotor operating speed aircraft, or ROSA, offers the highest efficiency and lowest operating cost for urban air mobility passenger and package transportation. Jaunt was selected as an Uber Elevate partner, and is now developing an electric air taxi for Uber. The wing-mounted propellers counter rotor torque for hover, while ROSA technology enables efficient 175-mile-per-hour crews. The slowly turning rotor and propellers are much quieter than conventional helicopters to meet Uber's stringent noise requirements. People in the city will barely hear the aircraft. The high-inertia rotor almost always in auto-rotation acts like a built-in parachute, but better since it works at any altitude or airspeed and is controllable. Slowed rotor ROSA technology is changing the way we fly. Hello everybody, and welcome to the Gyrocopter Flying Club. In the 1950s with the development of the helicopter into civilian applications, it didn't take long before there were grand schemes that made much of a soon to be realized city center to city center air taxi service. Sabina ran such an air taxi service for a while and Westland, frustrated by the lack of government commitment, even built the London heliport at Battersea with the intention of serving the main London airports of the time being Southend, Gatwick and London Airport itself. There was even a more ambitious scheme to service international city centre destinations with the ferry Rotodyne. 70 years later, we know that none of those ambitions were fully realized. If they were realized- Can everyone all... please be seated? We're, we're ready to begin. Uh, those, at, those at the back at the exhibition stalls, can I request you to come forward and be seated, please? Very good morning. A big, big round of applause for the Honorable Minister. Sir, we are honored, privileged, and very fortunate to have you with us in our midst today. I know you had to travel late last night to be with us, but your blessings and encouragement to this event will really go a long way and means a lot, sir. 
uh, as you would be aware, Secretary Civil Aviation and DGCA and team were here almost the entire day yesterday and were part of deliberations. And this just goes to show the commitment of Government of India for ushering in new technologies in civil aviation. Thank you, sir, once again. And may I now invite our uh, Chairman of Southern Region, Mr. Kamal Bali, for a formal uh, welcome address. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Honorable Minister for Civil Aviation, Sri Jyoti Aditya Sindhya ji, my colleagues, Salil Gupte, Boeing India President, Mr. Amit Datta, Managing Director, Hunch Urban Mobility, former NASA expert, Mr. Daryl Swenson, delegates and friends from industry, friends from media, ladies and gentlemen, Good morning once again and a warm welcome to you all to this very special session with the Honorable Minister. It gives me immense pleasure to note that this is the second day of this important event, very aptly termed as ASHA, a new hope and avenue for mobility and connectivity for all. Friends, Bengaluru is a hub for innovation and entrepreneurship and I thank the Honorable Minister for making it to the city of innovation to provide Philip to this important initiative by the, by the CII. Sir, your presence here confirms your support and commitment to connectivity and to the new age technology centric new India. So thank you very much for coming to Bangalore. Friends, advanced air mobility is not only an emerging technology, but an emerging new ecosystem for mobility. And it is important to follow the developments and advancements in this area across the world. While drones and helicopters find a lot of use in India, especially for connecting inaccessible areas and promoting tourism, technologies like EV tolls are still new and need to evolve and to be embraced. While regulation and policy are aspects that certainly need to be deliberated, but businesses innovating in advanced air mobility arena are another critical pillar for commercializing the technology and taking it to the people for, th for the ease of their daily lives. Things are moving fast in this arena with many players becoming active. One would imagine that it is not long before we start witnessing solutions such as EV tolls operating in small numbers followed by larger adoption by the end of this decade. For me, this is also a situation akin to automated vehicles where we at Volvo have had some experience. Just a few years ago, the idea was looked at cynically by a lot of commentators. But today we have driverless, heavy truck trailer operating in commercial mines. We have demonstrated a tipper truck in underground mining and right now carrying a hub to hub long haul cargo truck trials in North America with the, with a truck trailer. And this is all thanks to availability of advanced sensors and perception equipment, ladies and gentlemen. This is also pretty much how one could expect the perceptions, beliefs, and acceptance to change with advanced air mobility systems. On a lighter vein, I would say, flying in the air should be probably far easier move than moving on ground in the traffic of our congested cities. However, more importantly for us in India, the use cases and applications could help address many present challenges. Besides the ability to outreach into remote areas and applications across areas such as agriculture, surveillance, mining, one could imagine the ability of advanced short haul air mobility system to help address the congestion that most of our large urban areas face. For India, this is also an opportunity to build a unique position in what is in, a, in an emerging market. While regulations with regard to passenger and complete transport solutions are to follow, the Indian government has already commenced acknowledging and supporting drone and drone related applications through the recent PLI schemes and the regulatory framework. 
considering the general focus towards emerging technology, I expect this government to be highly supportive of developments in this arena too. In fact, the Indian government has initiated a series of reforms to make India a global drone hub by 2030. So the advanced air mobility will call for a new ecosystem for its maturity. For any nation to take a strong position, it will require building a robust ecosystem for emerging industry. I am not an expert on air mobility, but I, one can imagine that the ecosystem would entail the vehicles, continuous R&D, training and education, the landing infrastructure, the customer-oriented interfaces, fleet and traffic management systems, demand management, linkages with other mobility systems, amongst other things. All this will be fueled by advancements across digital connectivity and automation area, as well as in the new and lighter materials, energy storage and proportional systems. So ladies and gentlemen, from industry point of view, this translates into a huge new value chain, new jobs and a new economic cluster that can fuel India's progress. Remember, human needs and wants are elastic. They expand with circumstances and possibilities. And here is a new possibility. Having said all of this, a, a comprehensive roadmap is required to establish advanced air mobility ecosystem and identify the problems it can solve and the new opportunities it can create. Friends, we not only have the opportunity to become a manufacturing hub, but we also have the opportunity to cater to large share of automation software and digital software component and systems and such solutions. We have, and the time to start is now. We have an extremely dynamic and forward-looking minister in Mr. Sindhya, who has already done, made a huge difference to civil aviation in India. Friends, there are a number of players from across the spectrum, which I could see who are attending ASHA conference. Through them, we can realize that the advanced air mobility space is abuzz with action. What we need to is to adopt these technologies and introduce them commercially. Scaling up these technologies would bring in competitiveness and also bring the cost down. These steps are so very essential for any technology to be widely adopted and demonstrated. With these few words, I once again welcome the Honorable Minister and other dignitaries to the ASHA event and hope for an equally exciting and insightful event, an eventful second day of exhibition and conference on ASHA. Thank you very much and welcome once again. Thank you, Mr. Bali, for setting the stage so beautifully. May I now call upon Mr. Salil Gupte, Chairman CII National Committee on Aerospace and President Boeing India for his remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, to the Honorable Minister uh, who's joining us today, uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Mr. Kamal Bali, the chairman uh, of the CI Southern Region, Mr. Uh, Daryl Swanson, Mr. Ahmed Datta, of course, as well, uh, who you've heard from before. Um, these two days, yesterday and today, as we consider this session or this topic uh, for short haul air mobility, uh, or hopefully as we Boeing see it, unmanned uh, capability, which we'll talk about a little bit here, um, is very important because it brings together what we view as a whole of nation approach. Um, if you look at the average Indian traveler, the average Indian commuter, they spend a substantial, substantially higher amount of time um, in transit, in travel for regional or short haul than their peers in many Asian cities and certainly compared to global cities. And the technologies that we've been discussing yesterday and today have an opportunity to revolutionize that and allow India to leapfrog. India has been very good at that, right? If you think about telephony uh, over the last 25 years, India skipped stages where the rest of the world had gotten stuck. 
in landline to mobile and jump directly to mobile. India is directly moving very rapidly into 4G and then 5G rollouts. And we'll, we believe that in transportation, India has the opportunity to do the same. But as was mentioned by my colleague, there are areas that we need to sort out here. Areas like the vehicle themselves, the various technologies for different use cases, rotorcraft versus fixed wing versus tilt rotors. And evaluation of those technologies, not just for civil, but also for defense in dual use purposes. The discussion that we just had a few moments ago on infrastructure, not just on the vertiports, but also on electrification and on the sustainable electrification of this technology. At this stage, traditional aviation is about 2% of global carbon emissions. We certainly don't want to do something in this space that drives that upwards and causes aviation to become a boogeyman for the rest of the world. That would be unacceptable. We at Boeing and many of our partners in the industry are committed uh, with IATA and ICAO to having net zero by 2050 for aviation. And that means that this space is gonna have to find a way to be part of that story as well. And so that means as we electrify these vehicles, sustainable electrification is gonna have to be a part of that story. So we need to think about that from a standpoint of infrastructure. We've talked about the command and control and the navigation uh, in real time for these vehicles. But another area that the government has been vocal about in terms of thinking about how to do this is of course the hardened pipes that are required, essentially the cybersecurity that's required to maintain a safe ecosystem. And then of course, there's integrated airspace management. Uh, this is something that we Boeing have been working on for a number of years. We have proposals in with the government to talk through how to take this forward. I'll give you an example on this of how complex this can be. Um, in a country elsewhere in Asia that I won't name, I won't mention uh, the name of, uh, about 10, 15 years ago, they had significant problems in terms of flight delays because of the integration or lack thereof between defense airspace and civil airspace. Now, India, to the contrary, has done a much better job of integrating those airspaces. But imagine now you throw in short haul mobility into the mix, especially if some of that is unmanned. You can see how there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, and then I would say, finally, there's regulation. We at Boeing believe that safety has to be paramount in this short haul space. And that means that in order for this industry to take off, we will have to demand a similar level of safety and reliability to what we get today in civil aviation. That means as an example, 99.97% .97 dispatch reliability. That is what it's gonna take for people to wanna get on board these things and for what, people are, what it's gonna take for people to trust these vehicles to get them to their meetings or other events on time. Now, this sounds like a lot. There's clearly a lot to unpack there. And a lot of this has been discussed yesterday and will continue to be today. But we have to give a tremendous amount of credit to this government for taking leadership and being proactive on many of these issues already, especially on the vehicles, the PLI schemes, uh, and then especially on the integrated airspace piece as well. Uh, we know this is a focus area for the government, and we know that working together, we're going to be able to ensure that this industry takes off here uh, and becomes a global leader, and India becomes a global leader uh, in this space. For us at Boeing, um, you know, we're in this space. We have a company called Whisk that we own. Uh, our vehicle, our two-seater vehicle, which was a demonstrator vehicle, has done over 1,500 safe flight tests to this point in California and other places. Um, and we introduced late last year our next generation vehicle, which will be the one that goes forward for certification, a four passenger vehicle uh, that's a tilt rotor that will uh, be fully electric and fully autonomous from day one. Uh, we believe that India has a large role to play, not just in partnership with us, but in partnership with everyone else in this space, in this room. 
Uh, and we thank the government again for being proactive in all of these areas. Lots more to do here. Uh, and it's really, really, really exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gupte, for very useful insights. Uh, may I now invite Mr. Daryl Swanson, co-founder EA Maven and former advisor NASA, who's come all the way from UK and has also helped us curate this event along with Mr. Amit Datta, chairman of CII Task Force on Short Haul Air Mobility uh, for your international perspective and the opportunities you see in India. Minister, thank you very much, uh, and fellow panelists. Um, so I'm the chair uh, for the event. Uh, so what I'm going to do is take you through uh, a bit of a summary of the presentations yesterday, uh, some of the key learnings that we had, uh, and some uh, a bit of an analysis of what the opportunity is uh, for the uh, Indian uh, market. So we wanted to start out with a, a quick review of distributed aviation. It's a paper that I wrote uh, along uh, on the same day uh, NASA published their regional air mobility paper. But it really just talks about what are the economics of advanced air mobility a little bit louder. So what, what, what are the opportunities of advanced air mobility and uh, what, what's the economic model of it? And basically, my opinion is the economic model of advanced air mobility is completely upside down from traditional uh, hydrocarbon aviation. So this sets out uh, the context of the opportunity. So in the UK, we did a, an assessment of these RABA airports. So it's about 32 airports across the UK uh, that are small, uh, have less than 3 million passengers per annum. And we wanted to analyze the opportunities uh, for advanced air mobility between them. In the end, what we were able to analyze uh, and determine was that there is 390 potential routes between these small airports because of the economics of advanced air mobility. When we looked at that in terms of the annual uh, volume of traffic, which is going through and how that applies to economic spin-off effect, we're generating about uh, 9 million pounds of additional economic activity a week. Uh, on an annualized basis in terms of time saving, we come up with about 1700 years of additional productivity that will go back into the economy. So this is the advantage of an advanced air mobility system, especially when we look at regional air mobility. We also looked at in terms of what aircraft are able to do, fly those markets and the opportunities that they'll have uh, when they go into that, uh, uh, into that space. Now we've taken that context and we've applied it to the Indian market. So we've uh, taken a look at uh, OAG uh, statistics, which is basically what's going on in terms of uh, scheduled airlines. Uh, and what we looked at this chart here is just a, a basic fre frequency distribution. What the chart is basically saying is that by the time you get up to about a thousand kilometers in range, we're covering about 95% of the frequencies on turboprop and uh, regional jet aircraft. Uh, we have a slightly different curve for 737s and uh, A320s, but what it's saying is for the range that's available for these new uh, electric aircraft, we can all of a sudden uh, provide um, advanced air mobility services that is much better for the environment because of the low carbon impact of, of travel. Again, when we looked at the numbers of uh, commercial operations going on, there's 89 uh, airports with uh, 558 uh, different uh, routes. And when we boiled it down into uh, the number of potential routes, uh, we found 162 potential viable routes between uh, the existing airports and about uh, 2,100 possible routes for fixed wing electric aircraft. Now, of course, it's actually going to be multiples of that when you start doing intercity and intercity uh, type operations for EV tolls. But it just starts to talk about the viability of advanced air mobility. We looked at the different aircraft that are operating or the different aircraft that are in, um, in production right now and will be certified in the next few years and the opportunities for them to fly within the Indian market. And basically anything to the right of those green dotted lines are the markets that those uh, aircraft operators can come in on day one and start offering these services. Again, we looked at the different aircraft in the uh, context of the actual uh, operations across India and the opportunities there uh, for the commercial system. Now, at about three in the morning, uh, I uh, woke up a bit nervous about uh, this presentation, uh, and I started doing some simple maths and just don't pay attention or don't don't focus too closely on the math. But what we what we calculated roughly was that there is about 1.3 million years of additional productivity that could be realized 
through using an advanced air mobility system. So we, we take a look at the size of the Indian market, the number of airports that are available, and we're comparing that against the, the work that we've done in the UK. So these are, are kind of uh, uh, back of a napkin uh, type calculations. But you could imagine what the economic impact is going to be if we can bring 1.29 million uh, additional years of time back into the economy. And then we can also turn that into what does that mean in terms of uh, the, the social impact? All of a sudden, we're giving people so much more time back to spend with their family so we can reduce stress, we can increase social connectivity and give opportunities uh, to the regions that they wouldn't have uh, necessarily had before. So in terms of some of the key learnings uh, and the international perspective, uh, yesterday we had uh, great conversations uh, with the, the DG of uh, DGCA. Um, we had uh, the secretary uh, talking to us and some of the key uh, issues that were coming uh, over were about harmonization. So harmonization of certi uh, certification standards, uh, the regulation side, uh, and then of course we want to really get the standards um, standardized across the system because it just makes life a lot easier. So how do we uh, do that? Well, we need government support, uh, and every uh, government around the world has been uh, supporting the advanced air mobility industry. So we need those kinds of uh, economic support, either investment programs, tax incentives, uh, or the startup uh, community support. Uh, sandbox exercises with the regulator are very important because it allows industry to get in there and start working with the regulator uh, to understand what the regulator needs and uh, the regulator equally has that opportunity to understand what the startup companies are needing in that space. And I'm also promoting the, the need for cross ministry support. Um, definitely, we have to bring these various different ministries together to understand what the opportunity is for advanced air mobility. Uh, so we don't have uh, miscommunications and one, one ministry may be saying yes and the other ministry saying no. So we need to bring uh, cross ministry support uh, to do that. And then, of course, there's the bilateral agreements uh, that we need uh, with different countries around the world so that we can get aircraft certified uh, to service the market. In terms of the international perspective, uh, I was really here, happy to hear about uh, what Boeing was talking about, India leapfrogging technologies. Uh, I think we have that leapfrog uh, opportunity here. Uh, and if we take a look at what other countries are doing around the world. Uh, so in the US, uh, the uh, my, my friends at NASA, they've been working on the transformative vertical flight program, uh, various different white papers working with industry to come up with solutions. Uh, the Agility Prime program is a perfect example that could be applied within the uh, Indian context. Uh, in terms of uh, providing quicker ways uh, for the OEMs to get to a certification pathway, uh, providing test facilities and flight testing areas. Uh, and then of course, the FAA advisory circu circulars on vertiport design. So we can draw on those types of experience. In the United Kingdom, we have the UKRI. Uh, so supporting uh, advanced air mobility through investment programs. Uh, the Future Flight Challenge was a very successful program in terms of investing in the supply chain for advanced air mobility. Uh, we have the Aerospace Technology Institute, which is looking at propulsion systems and whole airframe. Uh, and then we have a, an, another group called the Connected Places Catapult. So again, examples that we can draw upon to help uh, India leapfrog. And then, of course, there are examples uh, across the European Union, the Horizon 2020 funds, and uh, Australia in terms of UTM roadmaps. So there's lots of roadmaps out there that we can draw upon to actually help us uh, accelerate uh, the development of advanced air mobility uh, in India. And as a final thought, uh, I thought I would give you a bit of a homework uh, reading assignment. This is a book that I'm, I'm reading now, Transport for Humans. Uh, it's a different way of thinking about the transportation system. And I'm trying to understand uh, what, they're, what they're saying, because it's quite interesting, and apply it to advanced air mobility. So with that, thank you very much. Thanks, Daryl, and for all your help as well. Uh, now time to invite someone who has led from the front and made this initiative possible, Mr. Amit Datta, Chairman CII Task Force on Short Haul Air Mobility. Thank you, Amita. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are honored to have the Honorable Minister for Civil Aviation, Sri Sindhya, grace the occasion today. Over the last two years, the Honorable Minister has been instrumental in laying down his vision for developing advanced air mobility as a democratic transportation platform 
and encouraging CII and industry in accelerating plans for the roadmap to electric mobility. Asha, this first ever conference owes a lot to his vision and active support. Yesterday, we had a wide spectrum of the best global leadership in the advanced air mobility space share their thoughts on rollout plans and commercialization of services. India ranks as one of the most congested markets globally. There is absolute unanimity that India is the center of gravity of consumption and represents a massive untapped opportunity for global technologies. The consensus, uh, the consensus among the speakers on the status of AM development was akin to the line on automobile side mirrors. The objects in the mirror are closer than you think. Right. As a number of the speakers spoke about commercialization starting in 25, 26, I think we have a very exciting journey ahead. I would like to share a quick synopsis of yesterday developments. So day one, we had a quick, we had a privilege of interacting with the Secretary uh, of Civil Aviation, Sri Rajiv Bansal, uh, Senior Economic Advisor, uh, Mr. Piyush uh, Srivastava, Additional Chief Secretary, Government of Karnataka, Mr. Gaurav Gupta, Director General DGCA, Mr. Vikram, Dutt, Dev, uh, Vikram Devdat, and a wide spec uh, spectrum of industry leaders. The CEO Roundtable, discuss the emerging demand scenario of advanced air mobility. Leading EVTOL manufacturers met at the round table with Sri Rajiv Bansal and expressed their perspectives on the requirements they have from the ministry and the regulators to make India one of the first markets for advanced air mobility. A key insight was building a strong consumer need for this service was a critical success factor. We also had speaker sessions uh, from uh, Andre Stein, CEO of uh, 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 CEO of Eve, Melissa Tomkill, President of Blade, uh, Bruno of Sky and Po. The next session moved on to the uh, accelerating the policy and regulatory environment right, for advanced air mobility, right? And here we said the adoption of AAM vehicles will need a new approach on how regulators embrace advanced mode of transport in India. And we were privileged to have the Director General for DGCA, Sri Vikram Devdat, on this panel. The session was about sharing views on how regulators continue to support innovation without any compromise on the higher standards of safety and security. The next session was on the role of advanced air mobility in multimodal transportation, right? And we had Mr. Gaurav Gupta, ACS Karnataka, uh, join us along with Mr. Bhaskar Bhatt, uh, Chairman of Istara. The sessions discussed the various usage opportunities, uh, intra and intercity travel, business, leisure, pilgrimage, and emergency medical services. We also discussed integrating airports with advanced air mobility services for both passenger craft and cargo, and which has started happening in international markets. Uh, as you're aware, Blade India has in Karnataka and Maharashtra has actually started by the seat digital services across all these sectors and the consumer response has been extremely encouraging. From Bangalore airport to HEL airport, you can do the journey today for as low as 4,000 rupees and book just one seat. The next session was on innovating, designing, and manufacturing AAM craft, the emerging opportunity in India. We had Mr. Piyush Shivastha, Senior Economic Advisor, Moka, join for this discussion. What is very clear is India today has just about 280 helicopters. With AAM, we believe the market will be a couple of thousand, if not more. At this scale of the India opportunity, it clearly makes economical sense 
to move a significant part of the manufacturing value chain to the center of demand. And that's really the Make in India project. And today we will be having a series of MOUs which start the journey of committing investment on uh, making India a manufacturing hub. Today morning, we had a session on in the ecosystem. It's not just sufficient how to, how to have craft, but what's the infrastructure abilities, the entire vertiport design, right? How do, and we had views from a number of players, right? Later on the day, we are going to discuss the other technologies on urban traffic management, right? But, and that really uh, sir, is a synopsis of what we've discussed. Uh, with that, Amita, over to you. Thank you. I, I know that Honorable Minister is pressed for time. Very quickly, we would do, sir, take your blessing, sir, for some of the MOUs that have got signed. May I request very quickly the founder of Hunt Urban Mobility, Mr. Karan Pal Singh, on stage, please. Hunch has been the front runner in signing some MOUs. So if you could step forward on the stage, Minister, sir. By one, the companies they've signed with. Beta Technologies, I call upon Mr. Patrick Buckles, Chief Revenue Officer, Beta. Hunch will collaborate with Beta for operations, manufacturing, assembly, services, and maintenance of eVTOLs in India. The MOU also looks at establishing a common battery charging infrastructure. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, may I now call upon Mr. Simon Brickeno, Chief Commercial Officer of Jaunt. Sorry for the rush. Yeah. Uh, Simon, may I call you up on the stage? Jaunt and Hunch will work together to launch Jaunt's eVTOL operations in India by developing the relevant infrastructure, public education, and policy frameworks. Thank you, Simon. May I now request Mr. Ankit Das, Chief Technical Officer, Skyports on stage. Hunch will collaborate with Skyports towards the establishment of Vertiport infrastructure in India. Yeah. In Bangalore, Mumbai, Pune have been identified as the pilots for the same. I now call upon Augusti Tai, head, sorry, head of business development of APAC Eve to come up on stage. The term sheet encompasses purchase of Eve's hybrid electric crafts. Additionally, the partnership with Eve will explore software solutions and services for air mobility ecosystem. Eve and Blade have already carried out market research relevant to the operations in Bangalore. And now the time we've been waiting for, for our very dynamic minister, Sri Jyotir Aditya Sindhyaji, Minister for Civil Aviation and Steel, Government of India. Seated on the dais with me this morning, Mr. Kamal Bali, head of Volvo and CII Southern Region. Our guest to India and someone who has been uh, studying this space, if you will, from the ground and from the sky. Mr. Darrell Swanson, 
Salil Gupte of Boeing India, a company that has built a significant presence in what I believe will be the largest market for aviation in the world in the days to come. A first mover in many ways, soft and humble in his demeanor, but unparalleled in his resolve. My friend Amit Datta, seated on this dais, the lady who has been commandering this session and has done so for me many times in the past, Amita Sarkarji, and most importantly, ladies and gentlemen present here at this most important conference on air, advanced air mobility in Bangalore. So at the outset, after hearing uh, all of these uh, wonderful uh, expositions on the versatility, the immutable reality, of this advanced air mobility or EVTOL as we call it technology. Let me thank you at the outset for inviting me at this path breaking conference to be held in India, in Bangalore. What I certainly have noticed in this auditorium is a palpable level of enthusiasm. That palpable level of enthusiasm coupled with grit, coupled with a resolve. And it's important to understand Because whilst we sit on the stage today, whilst all of you sit in this hall today, we are sitting on the cusp of a new revolution. A revolution called technology. And if we go back into the history of mankind, technology has always had a role, but that role has always been that of an enabler to make human lives better. But today it is for the first time in the last two decades, that technology has jumped forward and has become the most important protagonist, if you will, in the future of mankind's progress and development in the next decade or so. I certainly believe that we are sitting here today admits a fourth revolution. Technology has played its role in three revolutions in mankind's existence. But we are sitting on the cusp of a fourth revolution. A fourth revolution in which already robots have become cobots. Artificial intelligence 
has made a star entry into our lives with new vehicles like chat gpt and at the same time our physical worlds and our digital worlds our physical and our digital worlds are becoming intertwined with the internet of things and in this time period in this cusp of this new change is also a time where earlier automatic and automotive vehicles which were earlier unimaginable are now here and the concept about flying cars that we would only see in movies has now become a reality and a part of this revolution which is going to be unlike any other revolution that humankind has ever experienced before and in that period of change in that period of a dynamic flux in our existence the civil aviation sector in india is also making unimaginable strides as never seen before we are today the world's third largest domestic market with 144 million travelers combined domestic and international we are the world's seventh largest market at 200 million travelers but mind you if you look at the penetration rates on a population of 1.3 billion we are still talking about penetration rates of only 4 to 5% and so look at the unimaginable potential that there is in india in 65 years of india's existence we had built 74 airports in the last 9 years under the stewardship of prime minister narendra modi we have built an additional 74 airports waterdromes and heliports doubling our number from 74 to 148 but let me assure you today that under his leadership under his command this is only the beginning of the journey ye keval safar ki shuruaat manzil abhi kafi dur hai our ultimate goal is still far away in the next 4 to 5 years we will take this number of 148 to close to 200 to 220 airports waterdromes and heliports we've experienced a v-shaped recovery post covid pre covid our high was 410000 travelers per day we are now coming off the high season october till january is the high season we are off the high season but being off the high season we have broken that record of pre covid in 2019 to attain a new high of 4 lakh 55000 people traveling a day a 10% increase over pre covid high season october november 2019 455000 people traveling a day and sequentially every day it's not a blip sequentially every day we have between 400 to 430000 people traveling a day our airlines are experiencing new highs of seat load factors 80% pre covid today 90 to 
the problem has turned the other way earlier we had aircraft but no passengers today we have a bevy of passengers but a shortage of aircraft and selil one of the largest air manufacturers from boeing is here on the stage we need more aircraft and we need it more quickly because india has an insatiable desire to travel by air today that revolution has come i remember when i was a child my father used to be the minister of railways i'm talking about 1984 1985 40 years ago and there used to be many lawmakers that would be coming to meet with him for new railway stations new stoppages of trains because that was the key mode of travel in india today india has become an aspirational country today every citizen wants an airport and an airplane to travel in and let me explain you the statistic if you look at the railways the railways transport by by train on a comp basis a competitive basis which means only air conditioned train coaches because uh, aircraft by its very nature is air conditioned in first class and second class 185 million people per year civil aviation trans transports 144 million but the cagr the compounded annual growth rate for railways is 5.6% the cagr for civil aviation is 10.3% double that of railways so in the next 4 to 5 years civil aviation is going to become the bulwark of transportation in india and the reason i tell you this is because advanced air mobility must have its foundation on the basis of a very strong civil aviation infrastructure network and india today has that capability and i guarantee you today in our lifetimes india will become the largest market for aviation in the world within the next decade ladies and gentlemen and that's why you are at the right place at the right time this is a seminal point in world aviation history an inflection point where change is coming transformation is coming and in that environment under our prime minister's leadership india is forging ahead in areas that are just seedlings on the world aviation map because of our engineering talent our engineering capability our human resource capability a large market an advanced air mobility forms a fundamental part of that i certainly believe it's an idea whose time has come advanced and short haul air mobility and i'd like all of you to not call it advanced and short haul air mobility or advanced air mobility call it by its acronym asha because asha in hindi asha in hindi means hope asha in hindi means aspiration asha in hindi means that which we want to grasp and if that becomes our mission our joint mission today because as i was talking to kamal ji 
The environment in India has fundamentally changed. I was listening to Daryl. I was listening to Salil. Under the leadership of the Prime Minister, there's a fundamental change in the way government works. Government in India is no longer a regulator. Our job in government, our job as a minister, is to be that of a facilitator. Our job is to partner with you. Not on a square table. Partner with you, not on a rectangular table. But to partner with you on a round table. And what do I mean by that example? Government must not necessarily head a table. Government must sit on a round table along with you, if only as an equal stakeholder in the success of that project as partners along with you. Because in your success, lies government success and in our joint success lies India's success and in India's success ladies and gentlemen lies global success and so Asha today the dreams earlier of electric power taxis flying planes personal air vehicles. Today they've become a reality with the push on sustainability, with the push of transporting people and goods in the most efficient manner. When we think of aircraft today, we no longer think of aeroplanes that can fly us from Mumbai to San Francisco. But we think of short-haul aircraft that can transport us from short destinations, between short destinations, like an air taxi. And that dream, that vision with Asha will become a reality in the world today. And so therefore, there are opportunities in this sector. And we are grasping those opportunities as an equal facilitator and stakeholder across the spectrum of civil aviation. The first area that we're looking at is regional mo mobility. Because civil aviation is not about large airports in Delhi, Mumbai, and Mangalore, Bangalore. It's not about large 787s, 777s, or Airbus 350s. But it's also about regional connectivity. And through the government's program of Ude Desh Ka Am Nagrik, Udan, making the ability of a common man fly through a subsidized viability gap funding network. In the last six years, this program was started in 2016. We have built 74 new airports, water drones and heliports, transported 11 and a half million people who could never ever dream to fly before. 220,000 flights, 11 airlines part of the scheme, birth of three new regional air transport companies have all become a reality through the Udan Yojana. Establishment of airports at places that we could have never dreamt of. Jarsu Guda in Orissa on the eastern coast, Kishangarh in Rajasthan, Tezpur. Shillong, Leelabadi, Holongi, Pasighat are advanced landing grounds of the Air Force converted into passenger terminals with Donier 228s. That's the transformation that is happening at the regional level. The second area that we've concentrated on is the area of helicopters. It's astonishing that a country the size of India 
has a fleet of only 280 helicopters. Countries like Brazil and the United States of America have 4,000 helicopters. And therefore, we have put a special emphasis on promoting helicopter travel. Under Uran, we have given many routes to hilly states with a viability gap funding mechanism. We have made sure that intercity swift proximate travel between Mumbai and Pune. Amit here is running a helicopter services between Bangalore City and Kempegowda International Airport. That today has been made possible. Along with that, we have made sure we've come out with a new helicopter policy that promotes helicopter usage across the length and breadth of India. A heli seva portal for navigational permissions so that the red tapism of paperwork is done away with. A heli disha guidance network that we've circulated to 600 collectors in each district in India on what requirements are there for a helipad along with safety measures, fire engine capacities so that state governments can develop helipads. And along with that, looking at HEMS, Helicopter Emergency Medical Services, along with Mr. Nitin Gadkari, who's the Minister of Road Transport and Highways, we have started with the first HEMS program with the AIMS All India Medical Institute in Rishikesh, along the National Highway. We have a commitment from the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways that all expressways in the future will have helipads built along the way which can also serve as vertiports for Asha in the days to come. And along with that opportunity, we've also developed helicopter corridors to make sure, like in the telecom sector, that air spectrum space is devoted directly and only to helicopters between Mumbai and Pune, Begum Pet and Shamshabad, and Ahmedabad and Gandhinagar. Many more helicopter corridors will be developed in the future. Along with the Air Force, and I'd like to thank the Air Force and the Ministry of Defense seated here today. 128 flexible use of airspace routes, CDRs, have been developed so as to provide direct access to aircraft from point A to point B, as opposed to the zigzag method that was earlier prevalent. So today, many arms of government are working together. And you have seen that exposition in this conference with members of my armed forces, my valiant armed forces, the Air Force and the Navy present here today. This was earlier unimaginable for the private sector, defense, government to work so cohesively together with one mission in mind, to take India forward. The other sector which has been developing tremendously is the drone sector. And that is very analogous to ASHA. Within months, with the Prime Minister's prerogative to make India the world global drone hub by 2030, we have recasted the drone rules completely with the one mission in mind in terms of ease of doing business. Earlier, we had to take 72 permissions to be able to set up a drone company and fly drones. That has been reduced to a paltry five permission. I had committed that within one month, we will release the airspace map. And even beyond the United States of America and Europe, 90% of India has been declared a green zone for drone flying. That airspace map was released within that time frame of a month. We put together a productivity-linked incentive scheme for an industry that is just seeding. A 120 crore PLI scheme through which this industry has multiplied over the last 12 months. In 2020, this industry was a 3,000 crore industry. In the next five years, we look at this industry increasing to close to a 77,000 crore industry. And by 2030, this becoming a 3 lakh crore industry, providing employment to almost 3 to 4 lakh people in our country. That is the potential of the drone sector in the years to come. 
The fifth sector, which is extremely important, is eVTOLs. Exactly, Asha. The future in the world, ladies and gentlemen, has to be and will be electric. And this is the right time to herald that new future with Asha in the days to come. Markets are moving intelligently. Consumers are making intelligent choices. And that movement has started in India with Embraer's eve Air Mobility having a strategic partnership in India with Flyblade. I'd like to encourage all other manufacturers present here across the world, from the US, from Europe, whether it is Jaunt, Archer, Meta, to come to India and set up their facilities. Never before have you seen one of the largest manufacturers of aircraft set up a full facility in India. Boeing has a tremendous footprint in India, exports goods worth a billion dollars. Airbus exports goods worth $650 million. Collins Airspace is present in India. Raytheon is present in India. Pratt & Whitney is present in India. Safran is setting up a $150 million facility for its engine manufacturing and services, going to service almost 1,000 engines in India. And most importantly, Airbus has tied up with the Tata Group to manufacture the C295 aircraft in India for the Indian defense industry. 40 aircraft will be manufactured in India. So India is proving itself today to be a manufacturing base and therefore for Asha to be able to transform that Asha into reality. I would invite all our manufacturers across the world that supplant your footprint in India in early days. <coughs> this is a seed that will grow into a very, very strong and tall tree that will service not only India, but the world in the days to come. So therefore, even though we are talking about an industry in its nascency, and I'm sure Daryl will agree with me, that any industry in its infancy follows an S-shaped curve, a very flat growth rate to start with in its nascency and its infancy. Then a very steep growth curve through its growth phase. And then flattening out at the top again as the industry approaches maturity. Asha today is at its infancy stage. Come and be part of the largest market in the world. Come and be part of India. Come and be part of the world's Asha. And in that journey of being the world's Asha, there are many steps that we need to take. Those steps have been defined in terms of a market study that has been done by McKinsey, where close to 31 to 49% of Indians today would like to travel by advanced air mobility in terms of short services to be able to save time. So 31 to 49% of Indians imagine the market. You're talking about 650 million people. Two times the popula total population of the United States of America. 1.3 times the population of combined Europe. That is the market that is ready today in India to adopt ASHA as part of their daily activities. Infrastructure needs to be built out. We need to make sure that vertiports are built. Short landing and takeoff facilities are provided. We can use our existing heliports. We can use our existing regional airports, but we need to be in talks with public policy managing bodies. We need to be in talks with urban city planners in every state to make vertiports a fundamental part of the infrastructure that is set up in each state. Along with setting up of vertiports in each state, 
we also need to put in place charging vehicle systems for evitols very much like the electric car market which is burgeoning in india evitols must grow symbiotically with the electric car market in india and those charging ports should be dual use for cars as well as for evitols and that infrastructure needs to be set up let me commit on this stage on the behalf of the ministry of civil aviation and let me go further and commit on the behalf of government of india that we are willing to be equal stakeholders with you partner in this progress of setting up what will be the seed of a new revolution of transport in the world starting with india and therefore the concept of flying cars that we used to see in blade runner the concept of flying cars that we used to see in star wars while we are growing up is today a reality come be part of india be part of that new story and touch new highs in the skies thank you very much for having me thank you honorable minister sir we would like to believe that asha our collective dream has already taken a flight today and sky is the limit under your very strong futuristic and technology savvy leadership thank you very much that brings us to the close of this session ladies and gentlemen uh, again a big round of applause and may i request panelists on the dais for a photograph may i request all panelists on the sessions yesterday and today to just come forward in the uh, in front of the stage we'll have a photograph with the minister yeah please come request everyone to please remain seated request all our participants to please remain seated Can I request everyone to please remain all seated stalls. and all the stall holders to be present at your stalls?
Can I request those of you who have stalls here to be present at your stalls? We will have the Honorable Minister visiting your stalls. So can I please request everyone who has a stall here to be present at your stall?
we'll now have a 10 minute tea break and we will uh, resume by 1230. So uh, I request everyone to please be back at their seats by 1230.
Ford rotor compound technology was pioneered by Carter Aviation Technologies. At high speeds, the wings support the aircraft, allowing the rotor to be unloaded, and its spinning slowed down, which dramatically reduces drag. Because the rotor supports the aircraft for takeoff and landing, the wings can be much smaller than regular airplane wings. It's this combination of small wings and slow rotor that allows slowed rotor compound aircraft to fly so fast and efficiently. Carter's most successful prototype was the personal air vehicle, or PAV. Jump takeoffs are routine in the PAV, using stored energy in the rotor. In over 100 hours of flight testing, the PAV achieved a top speed over 200 miles per hour, and a peak lift to drag of 11, more than three times better than the peak lift to drag of helicopters. To ensure we keep time, can I request everyone to please come back to your seats so we can start the next session for the afternoon? When the rotor slows to around 100 RPM, you can actually see the rotor turning. The rotor drag practically disappears, and the rotor becomes very quiet. In 2019, Jaunt Air Mobility acquired all intellectual property pertaining to slowed rotor technology. Their reduced rotor operating speed aircraft, or ROSA, offers the highest efficiency and lowest operating cost for urban air mobility passenger and package transportation. Jaunt was selected as an Uber Elevate partner, and is now developing an electric air taxi for Uber. The wing-mounted propellers counter rotor torque for hover, while Rosa technology enables efficient 175 mile per hour crews. The slowly turning rotor and propellers are much quieter than conventional helicopters to meet Uber's stringent noise requirements. People in the city will barely hear the aircraft. The high inertia rotor almost always in auto rotation acts like a built-in parachute but better since it works at any altitude or airspeed and is controllable. Slowed rotor Rosa technology is changing the way we fly. Hello, everybody. And welcome to we have two short sessions and then we break for lunch. So can I request everybody to please come back to your seats?
Can I request everyone to please be seated so we can start our next session? Participants who are outside the room, can I request you to please come back and be seated? Participants in the back, we will have enough time during the lunch break to visit the stalls again. Can I request everyone to please be seated? Participants request you to please be seated so we can start. Participants in the back of the hall, can you please come forward? Before we break for lunch, we will have two presentations. We, we will start with Mr. Bruno Mombrini, Chief Executive Officer and Founder at MetroHop, who will join us virtually. Bruno is no stranger to electric flight and aviation and is committed to innovation in the transportation sector. His years of experience in the field of electric aviation have led him to develop an aircraft suited to the urban air mobility mission. Welcome, Bruno. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, can you see my screen here? Bruno, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Welcome, and okay. we look forward to your address. Okay, can you see my uh, the uh, my screen here? Yes, we can. Okay, good. All right. Uh, good afternoon. It's uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, 
it's really great to be here. And although it would have been even better to be there with you um, next year. I'm Bruno. I'm always eager to talk about our unique MetroHop uh, aircraft and today making the case for using it in the Indian market. My first experience with unique aircraft was my freshman year at MIT when I was part of the team that built the Chrysalis human powered airplane. Uh, we were the second human powered aircraft to fly. Our claim to fame was that anyone could fly it. I got to fly it. It was a total thrill. And over 300 uh, people got to fly the Chrysalis that summer. I'm going to start by, uh, by showing you a short video, MetroHop in action. And let's see if this works. MetroHop will transform the way we move within metropolitan areas. MetroHop is an all electric short takeoff and landing aircraft. It uses well-established aviation technology that provides a clear path to certification. The planes operate out of busy skyport stations that easily integrate into cityscapes around the globe. This trillion dollar industry can operate on fares as low as $39, making it an accessible and inclusive method of travel for millions of people. The Metro Hop plane is fast, flying at 250 miles per hour. In the San Francisco Bay Area, for example, it would take just under 10 minutes to travel from Embarcadero Center in San Francisco to San Jose International Airport in Santa Clara. The International Patent Pending Landing Gear System allows the plane to take off and land in 60 meters. Powered wheels drive the plane to take off speed. Takeoff is fast and nearly silent. The plane is as quiet as an electric car, which means that it can fly subtly and peacefully overhead, day or night. The landing gear system allows the plane to land accurately and smoothly. As the plane flies over the landing marks, the motorized landing gear legs drive down to the ground. This is how MetroHop is able to land gently and reliably in most weather conditions. Using modern sensors, the MetroHop plane is aware of its environment and can react to an event before it becomes an incident. This is to ensure an unprecedented level of safety and comfort for all passengers. High passenger volume and efficiency within the Skyport stations, such as robotic battery swapping, keep fares low and profit margins high. A single station can handle 1,000 passengers per hour. In an urban area with 50 stations, this translates into 200 million passengers a year and $10 billion in revenue. This is not a tool for the elite, but a method to transform the way we all move within metropolitan areas. This future is within reach. Come join us on our journey to develop a practical and achievable path to urban air mobility. Okay, um, so one thing up front, uh, I'd like to make the point that all these projects above all else, safety is the top issue. Um, I started this project as an economic study to answer, is there a cost-effective place for aviation in urban settings? The answer is yes, very much so. And more than that, when it happens, it will change the way we live. Uh, imagine in a busy urban setting, the same time, effort and motivation required to go a few blocks now gives you access to the surrounding 100 kilometers. One thing to be clear, and I don't mean to pour cold water on the meeting here, but aviation is not a solution to gridlock or to commuting to work in busy urban settings. It doesn't compete with mass transit. It's an on-demand point-to-point transportation tool. Of course, this is most valuable in growing and congested urban areas. We know of many cities in India, such as Mumbai, Bangalore, Pune, where thousands of people an hour could benefit. For urban aviation to work, it must be safe. We always come back to that. But we also believe it must be accessible financially and integrate into existing cityscapes. The key to amortizing the fixed cost is high volume. Starting with high throughput, the faster the aircraft come in and leave, the quicker they, the, they clear the airspace, the more people can come and go. Second, a key to community integration is minimizing the impact and footprint of Metrodox. This requires fast turnaround times. 
The faster the turnaround time, the less space is needed for aircraft in the process of unloading and loading. Finally, the speed of the aircraft. The, the number of aircraft needed is nearly inversely proportional to the speed of the aircraft. Double the speed and just about half the number of aircraft to do the same work. To summarize, the key to a useful, popular and inclusive system is speed. Now let's look at the right aircraft. If we take the parameters we just identified and push them to their limits, we find that the required footprint is about 99 meters by 99 meters. Ideally, we need a conventional airplane that can operate out of that space. We chose a conventional all electric airplane because we know that they are safe, fast, quiet, efficient, have a known path to certification. And most of all, designing anything beyond a conventional air airplane is well beyond my pay grade. The issue boils down to, can we comfortably accelerate an airplane to takeoff speed in that space? Comfortably means without whiplashing the eyeballs out of your, your head. The answer is yes, it did require rethinking the landing gear. I talk about the team. I could spend all day talking about our team. I'm just going to say that Carl Kaiser and the group in Germany engineered, built, and flew the e-genius for the 2011 NASA Green Flight Challenge. The $1.65 million prize is the biggest in aviation history. The year before, XPRIZE had a $10 million competition for the most efficient car. It achieved a remarkable 2.5 liters per 100 kilometers at 90 kilometers an hour. The e-genius plane has double the mileage efficiency at double that speed. Our team has been involved in, many, in most every electric airplane project in the past 12 years. From Solar Impulse to Eviation, from Boeing, Airbus, and many, many others. We are truly an international company. I work regularly with colleagues in Germany and in India. I have to say, sometimes the hours aren't so great. MetroHop makes a great use case for air taxi service within and around cities in India. Helicopter services can only go so far. Rise, rides are exorbitantly expensive and people react strongly against the noise to the unconscionable point that here in San Francisco, even medevac helicopters are banned from flying to hospitals. Let's consider the case for Bangalore Airport to the industrial district in Hoshur. This is what I'm talking about. Half a day in traffic versus seven minutes of joy. Believe me, the view from the plane is spectacular. And again, appointments, meetings, events can be scheduled without adding contingency or constantly running late. By the way, I compare the fare for taking a car taxi, it's the same, you pick. More about the plane. All electric with existing battery technology. This is important because although the price of batteries has come down significantly in the past 10 years, the level of performance has barely improved. As you saw in the video, we hot swap the batteries because it's so much faster than the so-called fast charging. The other tremendous benefit of swapping batteries is that we do not recharge our batteries during peak periods. We take advantage of times when there is surplus capacity, which is common with solar and wind energy. Also, I'm sure you noticed in the video that there is no pilot. Well, we do have pilots, co-pilots, flight engineers, software specialists, medics, and a whole mission control if something goes wrong. The, fl the plane flies autonomously because it is safer and would not be economically viable with a pilot on board. Passengers see and talk with the people in mission control. Mission control can take over control of the airplane if necessary. The plane also carries a ballistic parachute and flotations as means of last resort. In informal studies we conducted, we found that the vast majority of young people prefer having a robot flying the plane over a stranger. We believe autonomous flying is a ways off and we hope the young people of today stay young for as long as possible so they can become our customers in the future. We have flown a full-scale aircraft in a simulator using NASA-based MADCAST software, which provides true-to-life physics-based data. 
As expected, the aircraft had well-behaved flying characteristics and the result helped us make aerodynamic improvements to increase range and capacity. Metrohop planes can operate out of existing airfields to some degree, but the lowest cost and most efficient infrastructure are dedicated metro docks. A metro dock is a two-story structure on top of new construction. It is important that the elevators are integrated with the building and the metro dock. New elevator technology will allow multiple elevator cabs to operate independently in one-way shafts. This technology has many benefits, including increasing elevator capacity fourfold. We believe build, building developers will be eager to add a metro dock where possible because of the significant increase in value of having an airport on the roof. Currently, we are in the process of building a quarter scale demonstration model and focusing our efforts on cargo operations. Thank you for your attention. I hope we have time now to answer a few questions. Right. Hello, you can hear me. Hello. Hi, Bruno, it's uh, Daryl here. Hi. So I, I've, I've got a question um, uh, about your certification pathway. Um, what, what conversations have you had with various different regulators on, on how you're gonna get uh, Get, get to certification? Um, so yes, we've had a few conversations and basically it's an airplane with retractable landing gear. Um, so, so, and and uh, we just had um, Pipistrel certify an electric airplane uh, in the last year now, I think. And George Bai, I believe, is also very close if he hasn't gotten his certification. So the electric airplane part now has gone through ESA and uh, FAA. Um, so uh, that is that sets good precedent to be able to have another electric plane come through the process. Right. So uh, I, I was curious about the... Um... The, the function of the landing gear absorbing the energy and helping with takeoff. Uh, it's, it's certainly a novel approach. Uh, so the landing to, gear itself, yeah, all we're doing to, to with the landing gear is just driving the, the rear wheel that mm -hmm. drives it to takeoff speed. Right. And because of the way the, 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 now the aircraft has to be, uh, the, the center of gravity is balanced between the front axle and the rear axle. So we can't aerodynamically rotate. Mm -hmm. So that's what the front legs are doing. They're, they're mechanically rotating the aircraft. Right. Okay. Uh, the, the other question that I have, um, you, you mentioned you had a, a ballistic parachute uh, system as a, as a last resort. Now, obviously, we've seen uh, examples where those ballistic systems have been used successfully uh, in the uh, uh, civilian markets uh, across the U.S. and around the world. Um, right. Again, the, the question is around the certification requirements, uh, either through FAA or EASA, uh, and their view on the use of uh, uh, ballistic parachute systems. I don't have any formal knowledge of, of any uh, conversations there, but in conversations with, um, I forget his name, but with uh, the people who make the ballistic parachute. Right. Um, you know, all every serious airplane now has one. Uh, there, uh, I don't. I have not heard any negatives about having these parachutes mm -hmm. in on board. Um, they and they seem to have been very successful. I think there's over there's been over 350 saves so far. Right. Okay. So I'm going to turn it over to the floor. Is there any uh, questions from the audience uh, for Bruno on uh, the Metro Hop system? Uh, we have one over here, please. Uh, hi. Am I audible? Hello. Uh, so my question is twofold. So the first question is you had mentioned that you only need an area of about 99 meters cross 99 meters. So, but coming from the previous conversation, they had spoken that for a word report, just looking at FAA or EASA's word report requirement uh, for a 10 meter aircraft, you're going to probably need about 30, 35 meters of FATO. So how does that compare when it comes to the regulatory aspects for the uh, Metro hub? Because the nine, with, you need a 60 meter landing spot and with all reserves. So isn't 100 meters cutting it too close? 
No, we're fine. We, we can land very, very accurately. So for takeoff, it's obviously not an issue, but uh, for landing, that's where you would be concerned about it. And because the landing gear reaches for the ground right when it comes over the landing marks, we're able to, to hit the landing marks within uh, plus or minus five meter or plus or minus one tenth of a second. Um, so we, and then stopping, um, this is with a gentle stop afterwards. Uh, if we need to, we can really push this plane to stop even much faster. So, um, and we've looked at this in rainy weather, you know, with, with wet surfaces. And um, so we're, we're fine that way. The, the main advantage that we have is that we can throughput a lot more people through that space mm -hmm. uh, because the plane clears the runway and, and then 20 seconds la la later, we have two more planes doing two, two planes in, two planes out every 20 seconds. So the volume of aircraft that can come through is much higher uh, than any other system. Yeah, that, that's certainly going to be, be helpful. I've got uh, time for one more question. Sir, good afternoon. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, I, would, I have two questions to ask you. Sir, you mentioned about air connectivity from Bangalore International Airport to Hosur Industrial Area. Yes. What are your plans for other cities in India? And uh, what kind of uh, facilitation and support do we expect from the governments here? So, in the beginning, okay, so. Like I said at the very end uh, that we're actually focused on um, on cargo at this point because with cargo we can use a pilot. You got to remember with with um, a passenger service, you're looking at two fares. With cargo, we're looking at 300 fares. They're cheaper fares, but there's still there's 300 of them. Um, and there's a vast market for for cargo for uh, same hour delivery, for example. Um, and so we kind of is, want to establish a foothold with the cargo service. Now, if we start with existing airports, ex existing airfields, there are a lot of existing airfields that are underutilized. We can start there with the, the service. And, you know, once you start seeing the utility and how quickly these planes move things around, people are going to be eager to get in there themselves. And I think that's I think that's the process that it has to become useful at some level that you have to see it working for the community to integrate it with the rest of of their transportation needs. It, I don't think that overnight we're going to have um, skyports and airplanes flying, and you know, in the day before there was nothing. Um, and I think that the, the we think that the cargo route is the way to go because it's it again it's an affordable um we can have you know we can do same hour delivery for half the price of overnight um it's really really uh efficient and and um useful and it and it's on time it so all these things that that really make it uh, not only economical but very useful that's brilliant. Your, Thank you very much your for your question? time. Uh, I'm afraid that was the last question we, okay. we have time for. We've, we've had a bit of delay, um, so we're just trying to recover from that. So, uh, again, Thank you very much for that. Um, anybody who has any other questions for Bruno, uh, his uh, email address there is on the screen. Uh, and if you need to, just reach out to the CI and we'll be, be sure to put you in touch. So thank you very much, Bruno. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you Excellent for joining conference. us, Bruno. All right. Have a good, good afternoon. I now take this opportunity to invite Patrick Buckles, Chief Revenue Officer at Beta Technologies, a Vermont-based aerospace company developing electric aircraft with a focus on both passenger and cargo logistics missions. The company has already secured firm orders and commitments and partnered with leading operators across logistics, medical, defense, and passenger sectors. Beta's aircraft and integrated charging infrastructure will ultimately create an electric aviation solution to move people and cargo around the world safely, cost-effectively, and with minimal environmental impact, 
Welcome, Patrick, and thank you for being with us. All right, good afternoon, everybody. the presentation. I apologize, there's a small technical glitch. We'll be ready in a minute. Like I said, <laughs> Thank you, Patrick, and we're ready. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, here today, I wanna to give you a quick overview of beta and what we're doing. Um, start with kind of a high level overview and then talk a little bit specifically about India. So to set the stage on a little bit of what we're trying to solve, um, the logistics industry worldwide has been challenged for years and 
very frankly, I think COVID really magnified the impacts of what's going on in logistics, that with the booms of e-commerce, it was already driving a high demand. And then with COVID, as everyone was at home and demanding more for shipping, it really put stress on the markets that was unprecedented. It was really driving a new focus on how we move things from point A to point B. In the passenger market, and I, I apologize here that some of these stats are for the US, but I, I think they're very applicable um, worldwide, certainly in India, as we've heard over the past day and a half. But there's a huge chunk of the market that all filters through a very small amount of airports. And we look at the connect connectivity of moving people, there just is not good access today for those populations, especially here in India. And how we, can we look at ways to make transportation more available to people all over the world uh, in ways that aviation today is not allowed? And we're really, I think, at a, a tipping point in how we look at investment in aviation, and especially investment in clean technologies. There's a massive uh, group of companies, you know, over 90% of companies are making some sort of net zero commitment moving forward. So there's interest on that side. There's been unprecedented amounts of capital made available and over $130 trillion that's moving into green initiatives and moving towards sustainability. There's been billions of dollars of investment in new types of energy technology and how do we make the grid more sustainable? So there's a massive influx of investment there that's ripe for taking to help move this more toward more sustainable transportation. The challenge we have though, is that very few areas are on track to actually meet those sustainability goals. So if you look at the gray targets are where different industries have set their goal to be net zero. The problem here is the darker color dots where we're many times decades behind progress to actually meeting these goals. So there's unprecedented amounts of capital. There's a desire to do it. The problem is we're just not, in, not getting the adoption that we need and at a pace that we need to actually make these goals happen. And so it leads us to beta and really the, the foundation of why we were founded of starting to make a difference in how transportation is done and truly being a contributor to these net zero goals. So we're focused on three main pillars. First is our electric aircraft, which we'll talk about in detail, as well as the infrastructure that supports it. We're deeply invested in building out charging capability that's multimodal, and I'll share more of that as well. And just as much, as much as we bring these new technologies to market, there's also going to be a need in training and how we train the next generation of pilots and the next generation of maintenance technicians. These are innovative new technologies, but we need the workforce that's gonna help support this transformation along with the aircraft. And so I'd like you to meet our two aircraft. Uh, we're very excited last week, um, we announced that we've expanded our portfolio from our, our vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, the Alia 250, and now we're including the fixed wing CX-300 to really capitalize on all the areas that electric aviation can bring these lower operating costs, zero emission transportation solutions to the market. And from our side, we're really focused on the enabling technologies. We feel this is what sets us apart in an industry of new players. So the top ones highlighted in green are really the three driving technologies that if you just step back and think about what it takes to make an electric airplane, it's high power battery, energy, energy dense batteries, the high power electronics to help move that throughout the airplane and electric motors that are highly efficient and very reliable. So in those three categories, we're very proud that we have our own patented designs in battery technology and high power controls and electric motors. These are based on years of, you know, our founders were some of the original patent holders on inventions like the Tesla Powerwall. So we've got the technical know-how in each of these categories and it also gives us a speed to market by being able to develop, quickly innovate, and improve these products in motors, batteries, and high power electronics. Throughout the rest of the aircraft, we're partnered with some of the best in the industry. Our model is that if we have the intellectual property, we're going to be the driving force there. Nobody has you know, more demand and, and more emphasis on our mission than ourselves. So we're partnered with other companies, such as Garmin on the avionics side, and other industry leaders throughout the aircraft. And we really envision that these, these technologies help us develop this electric future. We're looking at the charging of how we can make this truly a multi-mode transportation solution and how it fits into the overall picture. And we think that we've offered this elegant solution to not only solve for the aircraft, but the charging as well. This is a picture uh, from our ramp in, in Vermont of our charging cube that we have today. 
And right now, you know, by the end of this year, we look at 55 sites that'll be operational in the US where we'll have on airport charging accessible operational. We have 10 of those facilities that are, are operational today that have been used. Um, we used them last year as we did a flight, you know, halfway across the United States with our aircraft. So charging and this capability is not something that's years out. This is something that's happening right now. And these systems, as I mentioned, are multimodal. So at these locations where we have airport charging, there's a charging dispenser that's on the airport ramp for aircraft use. There's also the same type of charging dispenser outside the fence that's powering electric vehicles, ground vehicles, transportation trucks. These are all happening right now. This is not something that's years out. These are capabilities that can be done in the th types of things that are gonna be needed to really build out this infrastructure and make ele electric aviation a reality. The other key item here that we're very focused on, and you've heard it through some of the panels and certainly at the government level, is we've worked with a, a partners all across the industry in electric aircraft. These systems also work on right now on about 90% of the electric aircraft being developed. So this is not a proprietary solution. We're designing this so that we can truly serve you know, beta aircraft, the entire electric aircraft ecosystem, and ground vehicles that are, that are there today, so that this is something that could be invested in, and you know that it's capable of working across the entire infrastructure and in the entire ecosystem that's gonna be created. Again, this just gives graphically of what we're doing in the US, but I think really the point here is that we've, we've got this proven capability, we've got the experience today in starting to deploy charging networks that help enable our customers to make electric aviation happen. And the same things can be done right here in India. As we look at the goals you know, of electrifying vehicles and continue to expand the Golden Highway, these are things that could be done right now and start to build this network for electric aviation to become a reality. And training is the other aspect, you know, really that third pillar of our company that we're focused on. We have partnered with industry leader CAE and helping develop some of the coursework, but we've also developed a lot of these simulators in-house ourselves. We understand that training today in aviation is not the most efficient and certainly doesn't scale well if you look at the volumes of aircraft and the types of demands that there's gonna be for pilots in the future based on what we've heard the, over the past day or so. So we're really focused on building this simulation capability and working with our operators to develop training that matches the needs of this industry and how we deploy this more locally, how we start to make use of virtual learning, of augmented reality, virtual reality. We're trying to break that mold and really help make sure that training has the same type of genesis that we're seeing in aviation technology. And from the economic side, how does this all fit into meeting those goals, you know, in the three to five dollars per passenger mile and making something, something that's truly viable for all? So with electric aviation, you're looking at electricity that your so-called fuel is now 40 times cheaper than we see in jet fuel today. When we did our flight across the US, you know, just as a good statistic, um, we had our Cessna Caravan, which is obviously a very widely used general aviation platform, was flying as a chase airplane alongside our Alia. So on one leg of that trip, um, as we refueled the Caravan for that flight, it was about $700. Um, as we recharged the airplane, it was $17. So when we talk about total transformation of how you look at operating costs, these are real world things that were, that were done. We had a direct comparison of that. So we take this fuel cost and, and frankly, almost render the fuel um, as a negl negligible part of the operating cost. From a maintenance side, you're looking at, you know, a 33% reduction in maintenance cost. You're 70% fewer parts in the aircraft. So as you look at something that's available, reliable, and an operating cost that matters, this is what electric aviation can do to that market. So the economics behind it are really powerful in helping bring this to the, to the entire market and truly solving that for all piece of advanced air mobility. And from a beta view, we really look at this as a, a value creation platform. Um, our design is a little bit unique in that the batteries are replaceable in the aircraft. And if, if we've seen this happen over the past decade in automotive, Batteries get on the rough magnitude seven to eight percent better per year. And so as you think about that, as the batteries get replaced in the aircraft, in our ALEA aircraft, as you replace those batteries, you actually get the better technology. So it's a complete inverse from what aviation has led us before that 
you know, when you take delivery of your aircraft, that's the best performance you get out of it. And it continues to degrade over time. With electric aviation and how we've designed our system, as you replace those batteries, you're, you continue to gain range. You may be able to do the same mission on one less battery pack, giving you more, more payload. So we're really trying to build this as something that actually improves over time. And as we see that scale, you're gonna see additional technologies come in. Um, we certainly think there's aspects where we can, you know, once we demonstrate a very efficient, safe, reliable electric propulsion system, you can start to add hydrogen packs um, or hybrid capability, whatever that may be, to help extend that range. Certainly autonomy has been talked about a few times. That the aircraft is designed from day one to already accommodate autonomous flight packages. So we're building it from the start, anticipating what really the future can bring and how we can make this a platform that doesn't require you to buy new aircraft every time. How can we continue to make these aircraft better? And we think that lowers the barrier of entry and the risk of entry by having a platform that can continuously be upgraded uh, and not require this large capital investment every time. And so just quickly on each of the aircraft, this is our CX-300, the fixed wing variant. Um, you know, it's a fly-by-wire aircraft, so all the flight controls are fly-by-wire, uh, fully electric power plant in the back. And then with the certification side, you know, really part of our path with the fixed wing is, you know, we have customers that want to realize the aspects of electric aviation, those cost savings I talked about earlier. They want to recognize that today, but there's already a lot of existing infrastructure, especially in cargo, um, that's in use, that's there today at airports. And they want to keep using that. Um, you know, there's a lot to do in new capital investment to build vertiports. So how could we do the technology and make this something that can plug into the models exactly today? So this aircraft does that. And from a regulatory side, um, I think it does streamline the process here and that these are existing Part 23 rules that are written today. You know, we're, we're going through rulemaking right now on the VTOL aircraft, uh, as we've seen with Joby and Archer and their publishing. And you'll see ours here in the, in the near future. Um, but from a regulatory side, we don't even need new custom rules to do this fixed wing variant. The rules are there today, and this is something we can execute that also gives confidence to the regulators that we can now get batteries, we can get electric motors, we can get fly-by-wire and Part 23 aircraft, which are all first. We can get those on the record certified, demonstrated, and in the market and start building data. You know, that's how we're going to drive this push continuously, continuously for safety. Uh, and this we feel is a way to really help meet the needs of our customer and a way in a regulatory framework that exists today. And again, about this is really filling in that airport to airport mission and how do we bring those lower operating costs and look at where new routes can now be done. You know, the economics of a, a turbine aircraft sometimes just have not allowed new networks to grow. Um, but as Daryl showed in you know, his analysis, you look at just the pure movements of people and where there's underserved markets, untapped capability, this is an aircraft that can tap into that right away. And our vertical, vertical aircraft, um, this is our, our second of our pre-production aircraft that we have. Uh, it's a lift plus cruise design, which uses the propellers on top to go vertical um, for a very short transition period. It's about a one minute transition. From vertical, as you engage the motor in the back, it continues transfers to wingborne flight. Uh, we've been doing hover testing on this aircraft now for coming up on a year, building capability and understanding all the aspects of vertical flight to move this through the certification process as well. But it's also based on simplicity. You know, the lift plus cruise, there's no articulating propellers, there's not variable pitch controllers. So we're really trying to drive simplicity throughout the systems that bring, you know, an innovative way, new, an innovative new way to move from A to B but drive the simplicity that it needs to actually be an effective operating tool. And for us, it's really about enabling this point to point delivery. Um, the general scheme, some of you may recognize who, uh, which operator this paint scheme belongs to, but this is just a, a sample set of what the mission can look like in the future. That if you look how cargo moves today, you know, it, it spends its life on a ground vehicle, usually moves into some sort of regional movement on an airplane, then a long haul aircraft, and then back inverse of the process before it gets to the end delivery. If we look at the operating economics here, we really start to enable this point to point mesh capability instead of the large hub and spoke networks that have been set up today. And you look at cutting people out, you transfer this process now from what takes 13 hours in today's system, now can be done in an hour and a half. 
and you're looking at over a thousand kilograms of, car of carbon emissions that you're able to take out of the system per package. So you're talking about incredible changes and in how things can move, all while meeting this goal of making more sustainable transportation of cargo and people. And focusing on the common design. So this is an overlay of, of the two aircraft. When we looked at building, you know, making the fixed wing aircraft a certified product, it was how do we focus on simplicity and keep those systems common? So the, the fixed wing aircraft is really just the vertical aircraft without the lift motors on top. The airframe is the same, the battery is the same, the engine in the back is the same. So we keep that certification commonality. We build a broader data set of proven real, real world data. Uh, and it lets us bring this to market again in a fast, efficient way that can scale with production. And so we see these integrations, you know, really is, is what we call a, a crawl, walk, run process of we can use the networks that are there today. We don't have, you know, we don't have to handle the immediate cost of infrastructure and in building vertiports. But as that's happening, we can get electric aircraft into a reality, you know, demonstrating the business case, showing that this can happen. Then we bring in the innovative technology in vertical lift. And then as we see that going forward, we really see an entire transformation of how both of these aircraft can fit into truly a, a multi-mode uh, integration of transportation between road, rail, uh, maritime, and aviation can all live in kind of a symbiotic nature. And lever leveraging that charging aspect, you know, as we look in India, the carbon challenges, you know, India has made the goal to go net zero by 2070. Uh, at COP26 was their commitment. As we do that, aviation alone is not going to solve that problem. You know, we have to be looking at this as a holistic way and how do we transform um, traditional carbon-based systems to electric. And by doing this, as I mentioned earlier, with, with multi-mode charging, you know, we really see this as an integrated deal. If we can now enable electric aviation, we can enable electric vehicles by using the same infrastructure. And again, these are things that are ready now. We can help make that transition. And it's perfect in a market like India, if you look at the concentrations um, of where people are moving, there's some areas that you, know, you look at just in this, you know, really this quadrilateral here between the four cities. And there's an incredible impact in worldwide carbon that can be done right in this area. It's actionable. And we know that this can be done today. And here we've talked about this case, so I won't stay on this one much, but you know, definitely cutting down that time of transportation and using this to its capability just in that airport to city transfer alone can save thousands of hours you know, throughout the population a year and really give that back to productivity in people and how they generate you know, overall value for the economy. And our focus at Beta has really been on, on demonstrating things that can actually happen. Um, you know, we, we've listed out several accolades here. You know, we're, we're very, very fortunate to have some incredible partners in the U.S. military uh, with the U.S. Air Force, U.S. Army have both now had their pilots fly our aircraft. Uh, recently, we had the FAA fly our aircraft, which has been the first OEM to have the regulator actually doing flight tests, getting on board, putting their test pilots in these aircraft. We've now done two trips halfway across the U.S. and really demonstrating this, and it's, there's going to be no shortage of people who say this can't be done, that it, it's not practical, it's not a reality. By doing these real world things, it becomes very tough to debate that point when the aircraft just flew over your head. So this is what our focus is, is bringing this to reality. And it's what we wanna do here in India as well. We'd love to bring you know, our aircraft here. We've um, you know, have an incredible partner in Blade India. And this is really what our goal is here. Let's bring the aircraft to country. And how do we start showing that this can be done and start using some of these pilot cases to show whether you look at how we move people, cargo, the opportunities for the military and how they better perform you know, from the border surveillance uh, or just moving product themselves. There's a variety of applications here that can be completely transformative and this can be done in the very near future. So just a couple of pictures here. This was uh, from our aircraft on our trip halfway across the US flying down to Arkansas. Uh, this was a big moment for us, and as we're, just as we saw today with the minister's support, you know, we're trying to build that same in the U.S. This is the U.S. Secretary of Transportation, uh, Pete Buttigieg. We had the opportunity at UPS um, with just a couple days' notice. They asked, us, asked if we could fly our aircraft down to meet with him and really give him a firsthand look of what's happening in the U.S. So just in the same way, 
there's a big role that government can play here to be partners at that round table and bringing solutions like this to reality. And I mentioned our partnership with Blade in India. We have the partnership with Blade in the US as well. You know, building that social acceptance, um, as some of you may be aware, you know, in New York City, there's a lot of regulation going on right now about the noise from helicopters. And they've been looking at some areas of even looking at trying to ban these technologies, which we think is very misinformed. Um, but again, the way we do this is by showing. So partnering with Blade, we did one of the first demonstrations with our aircraft of taking this through New York City and doing flybys with, with media, with legislators, showing that the noise level of these aircraft is a completely different environment than they're used to today. So not only are we able to help solve the carbon emissions problem, but we're really able to show this technology can be a solution to noise pollution equally as much. And I mentioned the evaluation flights. You know, as, as we get the US military, uh, continue to work our programs with them and the, US, and the FAA as well. This is all about how do we help inform with real world, real world data to regulators that you know, we, there's always this balance and it's a well-respected balance between the regulators and the OEMs. The way that we help do that, it, let's make our tools available to the regulators. We wanna share data, share that information and help build this pool of data that we can together to demonstrate that safety can happen and let's use that data to help prove that. And doing flights like these is, we think, a very valuable tool in informing regulation and help demonstrating that, act, that activity. And doing even compliance testing. You know, as we talk about some of these new technologies and batteries and electric motors, at the end of last year, we partnered with the FAA to do an industry first uh, 15 meter drop test of a full scale battery. So this test is done today. It's part of the standard rules for how you certify a fuel tank on a helicopter. And some have gone to market, you know, they're asking the FAA to relax these rules for VTOL aircraft. We, we feel that there's a path here that we can actually use this to help educate regulators. How do we show what can be done? And so we said, that's fine. We'll, we're gonna go meet that rule. And how do we partner together with you at the FAA to go do this test, let's share the data, build these analytical models that can really set you know, an overall standard for the industry on how we certify these new and novel technologies like batteries. So we see this again as, as really a partnership with regulators um, using that unique position of, of having real world test assets and building this as a consensus together as a whole industry. And this has really led us to get some, some very committed customers across a whole variety of use cases. I mentioned earlier our partners in the US Air Force and the US Army as they look to completely transform their logistics networks. In the cargo space, we've been very, very fortunate to have UPS, one of the largest cargo companies in the world, placed a large order with Beta for this aircraft. Also with LCI and Bristow in the helicopter space, United Therapeutics is looking to use this aircraft to build an entire network of how organs get moved to patients that desperately need them in the medical space. And then with Blade, you know, Blade has been really a pioneer in building out how people move in the vertical space. We're very excited not only with, with Blade US, but with our announcement today with Blade India and how we make this truly a transformative way in how we move passengers. And all about coming to reality. So this picture is, is now actually a few months even dated. We're right now under construction of our final production facility in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, we believe we're the first one really to be at this phase of actually having a full scale manufacturing facility for EV toll aircraft. So this facility will start moving in here in the next couple of months. Um, this will be the largest net zero building in roughly the Eastern half of the United States. So even in our, our goals for state sustainability in our aircraft, this building as well, between powered by solar, using geothermal wells, um, and really bringing this to a scale that this is here today and something that can again be replicated all around the world. So my last slide here is just really a, a why beta. And for us, we're focusing on being innovative in new technology, but doing it in a way that's simple. We have to make this a viable tool that's safe, reliable, and can be used in the operations at the scale that we've seen. Our holistic approach we feel is gonna help enable this in a sooner fashion by focusing not only on the aircraft, but on the charging infrastructure and the training that's required to build out this entire ecosystem. The versatile mission set we think gives us a lot of paths to market in cargo and passenger and medical. We see a lot of ways this can be deployed in various types of missions, and it can really build out these use cases and enlarge the data set. 
And following up on our final point of zero emissions, our goal here is really to be you know, a contributor to these goals that not only India has set, but companies around the world. And by doing this in an, an all electric net zero way, we think that focus is really gonna help be a contributor to that and fill in part of the overall ecosystem about how we meet these goals and close that gap of when this can become a reality. So thank you all again, it's been a fantastic time here with you all and uh, certainly can take any questions. Thank you, Patrick. Congratulations to Beta on your completion of the piloted eVitol flight over New York last month, and it's wonderful to watch your road to certification. Right. We will now have a lunch break till 2.15, so I request everyone to please be back as we're running short of time and we want to make sure we complete our sessions on time today. So request everyone to please be back by 2.15. Thank you.
One, two, three, four.
Hi, Corbin. Rob, good to see you. How's it going? How are you? Yeah, good, good. I was just doing another call, so which was running over by 20 minutes. So I was a bit glad that this this one hadn't started. So, um, but I think yeah. I just I logged on about um, on the hour, 22 minutes ago, and they were just mm -hmm. wrapping up there and saying, "Can we come back in 45 minutes?" And, um, and my colleague that's there said, "Yeah, they're, they're planning to start at 45 minutes past the hour." So, um, yeah. Um, okay. But, um, I'm just going to go and uh, pop and grab some quick dinner, actually, um, and right. uh, um, and uh, we'll be better. If somebody comes, I'll have this with me, and um, if, if somebody comes back in, I'll come back online then. Excellent. Well, I, I'm going to grab some coffee, too, and I'll see you in 20 or 25 then, yeah? 20, okay. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Robin. Enjoy dinner. Cheers. See you. Ich bin mir nicht sicher, ob ich das richtig verstehe.
The wing-mounted propellers counter rotor torque for hover, while ROSA technology enables efficient 175 mile per hour cruise. The slowly turning rotor and propellers are much quieter than conventional helicopters to meet Uber's stringent noise requirements. People in the city will barely hear the aircraft. The high inertia rotor almost always in auto rotation acts like a built-in parachute, but better since it works at any altitude or airspeed and is controllable. Slowed rotor Rosa technology is changing the way we fly. Hello everybody, and welcome to the Gyrocopter Flying Club. In the 1950s with the development of the helicopter into civilian applications, it didn't take long before there were grand schemes that made much of a soon to be realized city center to city center air taxi service. Sabina ran such an air taxi service for a while, and Westland, frustrated by the lack of government commitment, even built the London heliport at Battersea, with the intention of serving the main London airports of the time, being Southend, Gatwick, and London Airport itself. There was even a more ambitious scheme to service international city centre destinations, with the ferry Rotodyne. 70 years later, we know that none of those ambitions were fully realized, if they were realized at all. One might be wondering just why the world seems to be becoming giddy again with what is known as urban air mobility and a new industry in electrically powered vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, or as they're known, eVTOL. The marketing now speaks of visions of so-called vertiports, co-located with rail, metro and bus stations, and a solution to traffic congestion via the exploitation of the airspace above the congested spaces. Today, we have a multitude of startup companies pitching their eVTOL machines with suggestions of skies filled with air taxis. Let us turn, therefore, to global taxi name, Uber. Uber predicts an airborne air traffic management environment using a network of one-way sky lanes flown by pilots operating first under visual flight rules or VFR, but eventually automating traffic management and separation anti-collision permitting freer routing choices. Uber have partnered Jaunt Air Mobility who have created this eVTOL craft called ROSA, or Reduced Rotor Operating Speed Aircraft. The ROSA handles VTOL duties using that large, slow, powered top rotor. It needs no tail rotor to balance the main rotor torque, since there are four large electric props along the wing. 
These keep the aircraft from going into a tailspin while it's hovering and then provide forward thrust to bring it up to cruise speed. Once it's got some speed, the top rotor comes completely unloaded for low drag, high efficient flight as the wing take over lift generation. It's a development on the Carter Copter design that was first covered in 2004. Jaunt has acquired all rights to the Carter Aviation Slow Rotor Compound, the Carter's four-seat personal air vehicle demonstrator, which has completed over a thousand takeoffs and landings and a hundred hours of flight testing, reaching speeds of up to 214 miles an hour and at a max altitude of 18,000 feet, limited mainly by the visual flight conditions or visual flight rules that it had to fly under. I'll leave you with their own film. But for now, whilst new developments are exciting and of course interesting technically, one can't help but feel we've been here before. And just as it was 70 years ago, it isn't the aeronautical technology that ultimately fails, it's the fact that the infrastructure and commercial reality lags far behind. I love going up and having the freedom of flying. We have this beautiful Z dimension of the space above us. We're independent of the roads, the bridges, the tolls, the people. There are no limitations. You just go. From 2000 to 2004, I pitched everybody that would listen about Beta Air. And then only about three and a half years ago, I met Martine Rothblatt. She stopped me in a presentation. She goes, who are you and why are you here? United Therapeutics is a company that I started to save the life of my youngest daughter. We develop medicines for rare and neglected diseases. And we are now working to create an unlimited supply of transplantable organs. It's important to me to deliver our organs with a zero carbon footprint. Kyle and I talked about this for 12 straight hours. As I left, she said, why don't you write down how you would go about eliciting critical thinking in aviation? So I went home and I painted a watercolor. I wrote all over it in pen and I sent it to her at like 4 a.m. And at nine o'clock the next morning, I'm out working on a motorcycle in the garage. And my wife comes out and she goes, you might want to check your text. And she gives me my cell phone and it just says, you're on.
you think you understand what the problems with electric aviation are going to be, you're probably wrong. No paper projects ever go anywhere. Build the real thing and fly it. Beta did countless tests, countless simulations, and Aliyah had its first flight within a year after I met Kyle. The product vision is it picks up off the ground like a helicopter and the rear rotor turns on and it accelerates forward almost on a runway in the sky. 30, 40 seconds later, top rotors are off and you're flying like an airplane. This aircraft takes away, I would say, the three most annoying things the fuel, airport, and the noise. And this is the difference between making a new airplane and making a new aircraft ecosystem. When we think about the call to action for our generation in electric aviation, does it help us to get to tomorrow's flight test or help us to get to that other customer, that other revenue? It's to turn the corner on climate change. If you put your blinders on and just look at the finish line of what you thought the world was gonna look like, you're probably going to fail at that. You don't have a grand plan. You have an idea and a philosophy. And that's what we've been pursuing. When you define that to a bunch of smart people and then just get the fuck out of the way, then you get good stuff. Electric aviation is sustainable. The costs are lower. The operational flexibility is higher. It is the inevitable future. And I think if we are focused in the way that we're focused on simplicity and pragmatism here at Beta, we'll make it happen sooner than a lot of people might believe. Slowed rotor compound technology was pioneered by Carter Aviation Technologies. At high speeds, the wings support the aircraft, allowing the rotor to be unloaded, and its spinning slowed down, which dramatically reduces drag. Because the rotor supports the aircraft for takeoff and landing, the wings can be much smaller than regular airplane wings. It's this combination of small wings and slow rotor that allows slowed rotor compound aircraft to fly so fast and efficiently. Carter's most successful prototype was the personal air vehicle, or PAV. Jump takeoffs are routine in the PAV, using stored energy in the rotor. In over 100 hours of flight testing, the PAV achieved a top speed over 200 miles per hour, and a peak lift to drag of 11, more than three times better than the peak lift to drag of helicopters. A high lift to drag leads directly to enhanced fuel economy, climb performance, and glide ratio. When the rotor slows to around 100 RPM, you can actually see the rotor turning. The rotor drag practically disappears, and the rotor becomes very quiet. In 2019, John Air Mobility acquired all intellectual property pertaining to slowed rotor technology. Their reduced rotor operating speed aircraft, or ROSA, offers the highest efficiency and lowest operating cost for urban air mobility passenger and package transportation. Jaunt was selected as an Uber Elevate partner, and is now developing an electric air taxi for Uber. The wing-mounted propellers counter rotor torque for hover, while ROSA technology enables efficient 175 mile per hour crews. The slowly turning rotor and propellers are much quieter than conventional helicopters to meet Uber's stringent noise requirements. 
People in the city will barely hear the aircraft. The high inertia rotor almost always in auto rotation acts like a built-in parachute but better since it works at any altitude or airspeed and is controllable. Slowed rotor Rosa technology is changing the way we fly. Hello everybody and welcome to the gyrocopter flying club. In the 1950s with the development of the helicopter into civilian application, it didn't take long before there were grand schemes that made much of a soon to be realized city center to city center air taxi service. Sabina ran such an air taxi service for a while and Westland, frustrated by the lack of government commitment, even built the London heliport at Battersea with the intention of serving the main London airports of the time, being Southend, Gatwick, and London Airport itself. There was even a more ambitious scheme to service international city centre destinations with the ferry Rotterdam. 70 years later, we know that none of those ambitions were fully realised, if they were realised at all. One might be wondering just why the world seems to be becoming giddy again with what is known as urban air mobility and a new industry in electrically powered vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, or as they're known, EV type. The marketing now speaks of visions of so-called vertiports co-located with rail, metro and bus stations we will be starting the next session, so can I request everyone to please be seated? The airspace above the congested spaces. Requesting all participants to please be seated so we can start the next session. of naval ports together. I request all participants to be seated so we can commence the next session on urban air traffic management, communication and navigation systems. UATM is a system that will use strategically designed airspace structures and procedures to ensure urban flights remain safe and efficient while minimizing the impact on ATM. These structures and procedures will be enabled by technologies that include, but are not exclusive, to CNS autonomy, AI, and information exchange networks. As technology evolves, it will drive change in the possibilities for urban air traffic management. 
We are sure the technological capabilities in the future will be impressive, but their role will be to enable new airspace designs and procedures so that UATM remains, remains agile, responsive, and harmonized. Each UATM implementation will need to be tailored to the needs of the urban areas it serves. Community engagement will be particularly critical as concerns about noise and privacy can have significant impact on the, on the acceptability of UATM operations. I now invite moderator, Mr. Daryl Swanson, co-founder EA Mavin and former advisor NASA and our panelists, Mr. Rob Weaver, lead business development Eve Air Mobility, who will join us virtually, Mr. Corvin Herber, Chief Executive Officer Skyroads, who will join us virtually, Mr. Ajit Mate, Lead System Engineer, ATM Boeing Research and Technology, Mr. Mohan Raju, Vice President, Reliance Geo, and Air Marshal VK Bhatia, India, India Advisor, Hunch Urban Mobility. Welcome to the panel. Testing, one, two. Right, can you hear me at the back? Brilliant, okay. Uh, welcome back uh, from lunch, everybody. Um, we're, we're into an interesting uh, part of the day. We've, we've all had a big lunch. Uh, it's been a, a long conference. Um, and for me, the, the temptation was to go back to my room and have a little kip, uh, but no, we, we powered through that. Um, we had a bit of delay uh, with the minister, uh, but it was really uh, amazing to hear uh, some of the commitments that he was making in terms of uh, sitting at that round table with industry uh, for advanced air mobility. So we're moving into this section here specifically where we're going to be looking at the UTM system, um, which is the, the, the way in which we're going to be managing airspace. And I'm going to start with a, a point of view that the way that we're currently managing airspace for the volume of air traffic is, is going to be absolutely fine. Uh, for the short term. However, as we get to volume of operations, we need these systems to, to be put in place and they have to be secure, uh, they have to be consistent, they, they have to be uh, failure proof uh, in order to provide that, that constant set of information which is going to be re uh, required for the advanced air mobility system. So uh, as we have before, uh, I'm going to ask our speakers uh, to, uh, to introduce themselves, the company that they're working for, uh, and uh, a little bit about their idea of uh, the UTM system. So we'll start with uh, Rob uh, and Corbel. Hi, Darren. Yeah. Can you hear me oh. okay? Can we turn the monitor up here, the speaker monitor uh, for the stage? Right. Okay, so we'll, we'll first start with Rob. Um, Rob, would you please give us a, a brief introduction to yourself and, and what you're doing within uh, EVA in this space? Yeah, thanks, Daryl. So uh, nice to be joining you from uh, Australia today. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Um, so I lead the global business development for our urban air traffic management uh, solutions. Um, so EVE Mobility, as you know, is building an EV toll. Um, but what you might not know is we're also working on the technology solutions to support the air traffic management um, for the future UAM industry. And in fact, Embraer and now EVE have worked on this for over five years, knowing that um, it's difficult to actually deliver on the value proposition of this future EV toll operation without having a, a new approach to air traffic management. And that comes from our work with ATEC, the other Embraer company who provide the ATM system in Brazil and a number of other countries, and the fact that Sao Paulo is the world's largest air taxi market. And so for a very long time, we've known that we need a new approach to how we manage air traffic. And in fact, um, uh, we know that the, the approaches that are used for drones, UTM or UAS traffic management, won't actually work for piloted passenger carrying aircraft. And so um, I'm happy to expand a, a bit more on that, but I'll maybe hand over to Corvin to introduce himself and looking forward to the panel discussion. That's great, thank you. Cor Corvin, good to see you again. Hello, good to see all of you and thanks for having me at this conference. Um, is the audio okay? Yep, you're good. Excellent. Well, again, my name is Corvin Huber. I'm the original founder and CEO of Skyroads. Um, 
Skyroads is active in an area similar to what Rob just described, is we're trying to um, suggest a system architecture for future um, air traffic management for advanced air mobility. Um, we are convinced that um, there will be, in order to make this industry fly, there will be a requirement for um, frequencies and, um, and accuracy of navigation that cannot be duplicated with today's system. So as Rob just mentioned, a new approach will be required. Um, we believe in a concept of um, a central command, which means that routing needs to be vetted through a central deconfliction agency uh, that makes sure that there is a, a continuous um, safe traffic plan for everything that wants to fly. And to that end, we're building a demonstrator at a commercial airfield in the Munich, Germany region um, that encompasses a communication system and um, avionics on board a variety of different um, eVTOLs that partners are supplying to us um, to test management strategies for aircraft. Um, we believe that this, is, this testing approach is, is, is vital for development speed. And uh, we'd be happy to talk to anyone who feels that this approach could benefit his um, area or region. And we'd be happy to share the experiences we've made so far. That's great, thank you very much. We'll start down at the end uh, with our friend from Boeing. Uh, thank you, Darren. And thank you, CII and uh, Blade India for making me a part of this panel today. Uh, I am uh, Ajit Mate. I have uh, retired from the Air Force 10 years back as a wing commander in the transport fleet, about 3,000 hours in the cockpit. And I've been with Boeing both on the defense side of the business as well as on the commercial side. Um, for the last couple of years, I have been working with the Airports Authority of India. I was part of the uh, Boeing team of subject matter experts, uh, which prepared the uh, communication, navigation, surveillance, and air traffic management roadmap for India for the next 10 years. And as such, I have an in-depth understanding of uh, the existing ATM system in the country and also especially uh, the lacunas or the gaps that exist in the existing uh, ATM system and how I have views about how to avoid those gaps when we switch over to the unmanned air traffic management system. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Yep, go ahead, Mr. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, all. I know difficult uh, to, to kind of get in after a you know, good lunch out there. My name is uh, Mohan Raju and uh, I represent uh, Geo. Uh, I, I, my role in Geo is uh, the business head for smart mobility. And when we say smart mobility, everything around mobility going digital and aerial mobility is uh, definitely an, an sub vertical that we look into and nascent, but uh, a very promising vertical. Uh, for India. I think uh, just like electric vehicles, uh, we are shining out there globally. Uh, India has its own story. I think this is an area where India can script its own story, right? From uh, making everything in India, right? From the technology designs to manufacturing in India. So we are looking forward for working in this uh, space. Uh, that's a little bit about me. Um, thanks to the organizers, Amit and everyone for, for organizing this nice conference. Looking forward to interacting with all of you. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Air Marshal Bhatia, uh, retired, of course. Uh, fighter pilot by choice, uh, but also have flown uh, fixed wing transport aircraft, uh, as well as helicopters in all kinds of terrain, starting from desert to sea and to the high altitudes of uh, uh, Leh and Ladakh. Uh, a very fulfilling uh, career in the Indian Air Force for 40 years. And now I'm very happy and proud to be uh, involved with uh, Hunch Ventures as also this very concept of uh, the urban air mobility, as they've called it. Uh, in between, I was also involved with uh, alternate sources of energy. And I see that there's a congruence here uh, when we talk about electric uh, vehicles, especially in the air, as also on the ground, as to how these two can be combined together to get the best uh, benefit 
for Mad Guy. Thank you. Thank you. So we got some real hardcore experience of air navigation and communications and the importance of uh, of those in, in uh, operating in high, in, in high speed aircraft uh, and operations there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch to the video. Uh, so we have a video from um, Altitude Angel, uh, and they're outlining a, a program that they're doing in the UK. So they're building what they're calling a drone superhighway across UK is a, is a, a way of drawing out um, the technology and the systems and processes uh, that need to be put in place to enable that. And this is BB loss. So beyond visual light uh, of sight for if you've not come across that. So they're going to talk about, it's about a minute and a half long, but what I would love to be able to do is if, if with the panel members that we have here, if we could start to pick apart what they're doing and apply what your knowledge of the system is on, on how we would enable that and then how that transitions in to advance air mobility and, and the air traffic control system. So that's what I'm hoping will happen, but equally I'm looking for a good conversation uh, amongst the panel. So do you have that video uh, available? We're having some technical challenges. Right, here we go. In the 1800s, the rail network expansion fueled significant industrial growth. Connecting towns and naval ports together brought revolutionary efficiencies to the movement of goods and people, spawning entirely new industries and businesses. Today, we begin the next industrial and commercial revolution, automated flight. The Skyway system establishes a network of super highways up to 10 kilometers wide, with the first main route spanning 265 kilometers between Reading and Coventry. Soon, time-sensitive transportation of medical items and organs fire, medical, and police scenarios, as well as the delivery of high-value, low-volume goods, can start to be moved by automated drone, unlocking the vast potential of drones to transform lives and revolutionize business. Skyway has safety and privacy at its core. Powerful sensors on the ground looking up detect crude and uncrewed aviation traffic and create a real-time moving map of the sky above which is relayed to the Skyway controller in the cloud, where it is used to provide automated air traffic control for drones flying on the superhighway, preventing collisions. Drones can enter or exit the Skyway anywhere along the route, bringing access to millions of businesses and citizens. Automated flight, anywhere and for everyone. Just imagine. Right. So I, I think that's a, a good start in, in terms of what they're doing, um, building these 10 kilometer wide roads uh, for these types of operations going on. They're, they're talking about drone operations, but then also accounting for um, uncontrolled aircraft uh, that have not uh, given their intent uh, and managing the systems around there. So there's a whole lot of systems and processes that, that have to uh, go on uh, to be able to make that uh, happen. I'm hopeful that in time, uh, as the technology evolves, we won't have to have these specific roads because that actually um, slows down the process and, and can actually lead to inefficiencies. But it's a great demonstrator of, of what we can do. So uh, I'm going to first start um, with uh, Rob, uh, having a look at that video and, and, and the uh, technology that you've been developing with, within EVE. What, what, what are the good points? What are the bad points? Uh, do you think it's the, the right way forward? Uh, and then we'll we'll uh, just open it up to, to the rest of the panel. So, Rob, Yeah, please. thanks, Daryl. That's a, a really exciting vision of the future. And I think longer term, we will start to look at how those kind of solutions might support passenger and carrying aircraft. But <clears throat> my background is as I used to work for Air Service Australia. I was head of safety for Australian Air Traffic Control. And having worked both for the UK ANSP and the Australian ANSP, I know that we evolve ATM gradually over time. I think back to how we implemented ADSB in, in Australia, and, and certainly there wasn't a quick overnight change to these kind of things. We will, we will see a great evolution in air traffic management over the next 10 to 15 years. And what we know is the first urban air mobility operations will be piloted. Um, and um, piloted passenger carrying operations probably need different air traffic management services to drones and UAS traffic management. Um, and, and I'm comfortable with drone traffic management below 500 foot. But when we start to look at the integration of all airspace users and the challenges of UAM, so 
Um, an aircraft operating 10 or 15 flights a day, many aircraft from different operators operating into the same vertical, the impact of delay of one aircraft on other people coming into that vertical, of other trips of that aircraft later in the day. Actually, the challenges for urban air mobility are, are quite different to the challenges that you see for drones. And so what we've um, uh, what we've progressed and what we've worked on for the last five years with the Australian Air Navigation Service Provider, the regulator in the NSP in the UK and, and the Japanese uh, regulator is actually a concept around urban air traffic management that is actually about integrating EV tolls, integrating all airspace users in the urban environment and actually the flow of traffic, which is quite different to uh, drone or UAS traffic management. And I think next decade, we'll see both coming together. Next decade, we'll see that integration of autonomous EV tolls, drones, and also piloted EV tolls, because we will still continue to have those. But at the moment, we're very focused on enabling initial EV tol operations and the challenges associated with them and building technology to support that. Brilliant, thank you. Mr. Raju, I'm, I'm interested in the, um, the technology that's needed to enable that, that type of a system because you work on the communications side. Can, is that something that you can talk about uh, just looking at that video? Uh, or how would you approach um, looking at the communication side uh, to make sure that that happens and that there's interoperability uh, between the various different systems? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, there are lessons in manned aviation uh, which can be brought to the table when we uh, sit down to plan uh, the unmanned traffic management system. Uh, at least in India, what, what we have observed is uh, most of the systems were procured at different uh, times over the decades. The procurement policies of the government generally went for the lowest bidders. And a lot of time, uh, the digital systems on uh, adjacent flight information regions across the country were unable to talk to each other digitally. Even today, this uh, problem exists. Uh, this naturally increases the workload for pilots in the cockpit, as well as more time is spent by the controllers and air traffic managers, while especially the aircraft are switching over from one FIR to another FIR. Uh, this particular problem uh, in the manned aviation side is now, they are looking for a digital integration platform, which will uh, integrate uh, information coming from all stakeholders on a single platform in real time, and this information will be uh, will enable faster uh, digital handover of aircraft between uh, control spaces. Now, if you see uh, the organic development which has been taking place in the unmanned sector in India, uh, it is phenomenal. Uh, within the last four or five years, the numbers are uh, touching the sky. And uh, very correctly, the Ministry of Civil Aviation reacted with the drone rules and uh, the UTM framework. And if you go through the UTM framework, it clearly envisages a role for uh, private third-party UTM service providers. These people are most probably uh, going to procure equipment which is best for them or which best suits their business interests. And a similar digital platform is likely to be required uh, in order to ensure that their systems, the drones are interoperable. They're able to pass from one area of operation to another area of operation mm -hmm. without any major change of uh, plans, flight plans required. And they're able to stick to the initial plans that they are uh, providing. Another uh, critical area is going to be tactical conflict uh, deconfliction, especially in uh, joint use airspace, that is airspace which is around the existing airports. We are expecting that the current uh, number of less than 800 civil air aircraft in India will increase to over 2,500 by another by the end of this decade. And by 2035, we are expecting this number to cross 4,000. That means we are going to have an equivalent organic uh, growth in both manned as well as the unmanned sector. And uh, in order to avoid future conflict, uh, the possibility of these two systems also interacting with each other or the new uh, unmanned system seamlessly integrating with the existing air traffic management system mm -hmm. is also going to be critical. Great, okay. So I'm, I'm interested in, in the air marshal's perspective of this from, from operating fast jets um, in airspace, typically without recourse of, of this is what I'm doing because I'm fast and military and, and we have a strong representation here uh, from, from the military. I'm, I'm curious about your perspective on this type of a system and how we uh, integrate those operations with military operations, which are still going to need to, to happen. Uh, 
So, uh, does your mic work? Yeah, so it, it's just really about fat, fast jet uh, operations uh, within the civil airspace that we're going to have to uh, accommodate in the very near future. Uh, well, you know, I mean, can anybody, everybody? Yeah, we, we're having trouble with the mic here. Sorry. Try that one. Am I also? Yep. Yep. Right. So, yeah, you know, I'm very happy to talk with the and the and the Russian and the Russian and the Russian and the Yeah. 
That, that's that's certainly the the, the long term objective. Thank, yeah, th th thank you very much. That very comprehensive. Um, I'm going to go to Corvin. Um, he's been patiently waiting. Uh, Corvin, I'm I'm kind of curious um, your take in terms of the the services that that you're offering uh, versus what was uh, compared to the um, the Altitude Angel product. Is, is is there any comparisons between the two of them? Do you do you see um, commonalities with the work that you're doing and 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 the the pathway that they've set out? Um, I, I do see commonalities, and I'd like to start off by saying that I find this an extremely exciting and a very um, potentially extremely fruitful venture. Um, I think everything that um, practices um, advanced air mobility or, or air mobility in, in, in real life is worthwhile. Um, and I, I wholly commend um, Altitude Angel for putting this together. I think also, they are onto something very valuable, and that is the entire topic of conspicuity, which means that yep. vehicles that operate in a common airspace need to be visible to each other, and they are putting a ground system in place, uh, which is supposed to provide that service. I find that already um, an extremely exciting and, and, again, for the future, um, very valuable exercise. Um, the the qu big question will be how this conspicuity will be maintained. Will there be worldwide standards? Will there be local standards? What can, how will this come about? Um, an element that I find again, wholly commendable here is the fact that they are putting a ground-based system in place for the very simple reason that ground-based systems have the potential of being commercially commercially very viable, um, because you have one system that um, provides um, detection and and positioning for uh, all kinds of vehicles and broadcast this back to the vehicles. So I find that conceptually, I find that quite exciting. Um, we are looking at similar solutions. Um, we also believe that multilateration from the ground may be a path to the future, which again um, requires vehicles to be conspicuous by broadcasting a, a designator that can then be measured and, and um, uh, entered into kind of a, a, a real-time database. Um, at the same time, we believe that there needs to be a back channel where um, deconfliction is communicated to the aircraft and the aircraft can react on kind of deconfliction commands. Um, for that end, we believe there needs to be um, reasonably high computing power on board the vehicles to provide what we call residual intelligence on board the vehicles. 
which is why we are creating a, a fairly powerful onboard, very small, very light onboard computer that will then provide the um, algorithms for conflict management or uh, rather for contingency management in the air. In other words, what if something goes wrong? How do vehicles behave? Will they behave in a consistent manner? Does every vehicle make its own decisions? Will, will there be kind of local rules for grounding, uh, for um, emergency landing, all of these? We, we believe that there needs to be consistency within a given airspace. And that is most likely um, achievable uh, through a, a common, um, algorithmic base on board all participating vehicles. This may be either through dedicated uh, hardware such as we are developing or maybe co-located in flight control computers. Um, so we are, we're um, quite open to the final solution, but we believe that there needs to be powerful edge computing in the mobile assets in the vehicles in order to provide for a safe system long-term. But um, back to the um, Altitude Angel exercise, I wish there were more of these exercises worldwide. I, I wholly commend the 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 approach. Um, I would I would strongly recommend for the Indian government to look at very similar um, um, approaches, uh, creating kind of test areas and test beds that allow for um, technology agnostic investigation. L let me add one last point um, uh, to what we've heard so far. Um, as long as vehicles will be um, crewed by live pilots, we will be using similar navigation technology to what we have today. It will be GPS-based navigation. There will be some kind of um, voice communication. But we need to realize that if anything needs to come along in the next, um, we just heard next decade, but let you know, within the next six to 12 years, this will have to grow in parallel to what we're doing. In other words, if we have standard aviation suites in our eVTOLs, we need to be flying um, in parallel um, the next generation systems in order to prove their viability. We have the standard problem of new technology that new technology needs to um, comply to the same safety requirements that 60 year old technology has achieved. Yeah. Yeah. And that that is, to me, one of the big, big issues that we have here. How can we test new technology in parallel to phasing out the old technology? And, and I think that's exactly what the uh, Altitude Angel is about. So that actually quite nice because it brings us to the technology expert that we have, Mr. Raju. Um, and, and I'm curious to understand what you think about the evolution of communications uh, technology uh, and specifically 5G. And, and I bring up 5G with a bit of a, a grin because I was part of a group of residents on my street which opposed a 5G mass uh, at the end of our street. And I know how critical that communications equipment, so I'm a bit of a hypocrite in, in that. So, sir, can, can you tell us from your perspective uh, about the evolution of, of uh, communications technology and what needs to happen to enable uh, advanced air mobility and UTM systems? Here's your mic right there. Is that uh, for me? Yeah, that, that's good. That, that, yeah, they're just turning it on. Can, am I audible? Yeah, okay. Okay, sure, uh, Daryl. Thanks for the question. So, uh, you know, uh, I'll answer it in two parts. Yep. Uh, so from a communication systems perspective, uh, obviously there are multiple layers, right? Uh, we all understand it. Uh, and I would agree to what uh, Corwin just said on the panel. Uh, as long as it's uh, manned vehicles that we fly, uh, it's difficult to change. We'll probably follow the same systems, right? So we will live with, uh, you know, ground to ground communications, ground to air, air to ground, and air to air communications that we have been practicing for all these uh, decades. Uh, obviously, from a communications technologies point of view, we'll continue to rely on both wired and wireless technologies, both. Uh, whatever we have been using as terrestrial networks for communications will continue to be in place. Wireless, obviously, we've been relying heavily on uh, VSAT technology, KU, KA. Uh, and now, obviously, with 5G coming in worldwide, a uh, lot of transmission we'll see, right? Uh, because 5G is the uh, start point for, for true real-time mobility to happen on a wireless network. Otherwise, with the latencies, we'll have communication gaps, uh, which could be very fatal. So with the onset of 5G, 
uh, is the first step towards uh, you know integrating wireless communication seriously with mobility systems however uh, while we roll out 5g uh, 5g is not yet tested for aerial mobility mobility generally aerial mobility not at all right as on date however that's the opportunity to start with testing 5g for aerial mobility right and fundamentally how do these networks get tuned uh, to to support aerial mobility requirements today as we all know 5g systems are beamed towards uh, the ground uh, like meaning you know you want coverage within this room and and so on but when we talk of aerial mobility the you know signals have to be beamed upwards and to what extent so all these are new paradigms or new challenges that we have traditionally never thought about while the technology is promising how do we deploy it is is the opportunity in front of all of us to collaborate co-create and standardize so that this uh, you know 5g onwards 5g 6g and beyond can be a serious wireless technology for uh, you know aerial mobility now while i say this the second part uh, again plays a very influential uh, role in how uh, 5g or uh, the wireless broadband technologies uh, will support uh, aerial mobility uh, see the aerial mobility itself is changing sooner than we all realize uh, all of us sitting here uh, aerial mobility will become completely autonomous, right? I think, uh, as Corbin mentioned, uh, very soon, sooner than later, all will be unmanned vehicles. Uh, everything is autonomous. Now, in such a scenario, the amount of data that gets transacted, either through the aircraft or through the ground systems or, or through the uh, people traveling in that, will increase manifold. Now, how do we take care of these paradigms? What are these paradigms? Today, we, we don't know. So, unless we test aggressively through various test beds. Uh, we will not come to know how, how these technologies are going to behave. Once we test rigorously, we'll have our learnings, then, then we need to standardize, right? There are various communication systems, communication systems on the ground, communication systems within the aircraft and, and many other components. All need to interoperate very seamlessly. Today, we are in a world where aircraft communications are very proprietary to the supplier or the brand. We, we cannot proceed forward in that way. And, and the proliferation of air mobility will be greater than what, what we have today as civil aviation. More and more will people will use uh, air transportation because on the other side, we are electrifying. So the cost to fly a helicopter probably from Bangalore airport to Kormangla will no longer be 5,000. It will probably drop to one-tenth. Now, how many of us in this room would love to take a 800 rupee helicopter ride from Bangalore airport to Kormangla? Just raising hands. Right? Look at the hands. It's cheaper than the road Uber. Now we are looking at that kind of an era. It needs a different mindset. And, and yes, uh, that's the opportunity that we all will have. And, and we all need to acknowledge we are living in an era where we have technologies more than what we can use. We have 6G, we have uh, you know 7G. What do we do with 5G? We don't know today. But, but that's a good problem to have. Similar is the challenge with aerial mobility communication systems. Yes, with that, I think I would like to encourage all of us in this uh, domain to, to collectively collaborate because this is not a one stakeholder yeah. game. Yeah. How do we collaborate together to know the problems and, and uh, apply the technology, know the problems and standardize so that we can use it universally as a country, as a, as yeah. a, as a globe or, or you know, one world together. Yeah? Okay. That's a little bit of a view, Darren. Great. Th thank you very much. I'm suffering a bit of time dilation. We're running a bit late, so I'm, I'm not going to uh, go to the audience for a question, but I am going to set out a scenario uh, for each of you. And I'm, I'm looking for either a yes, no, or plus or minus a year uh, in this scenario. So in this scenario, um, India steps up to the plate, gets the manufacturing of, uh, of vehicles and systems, and we're really able to get to volume of air traffic um, in the sky for EV tolls and the drone industry. Uh, explodes. If this were to happen uh, in, say, 2031 or 2032, do you think that we will have the UTM systems in place to handle that kind of volume of traffic? And, and we'll start with Rob. So kind of a, a high, high growth rate scenario, 2031, 2032. Do you think uh, with the system that you're playing, we'll, we'll have uh, UTM systems in place? Yes, no, plus or minus two or three years. So I think we actually need new ATM approaches from day one of piloted EV toll operations. And they will allow us to build towards this really exciting future of autonomy and high density. And, and while the aircraft can fly, 
actually to have a scalable business and a business case, I think we'll be doing it from 2026. Um, and uh, and then we'll work towards autonomy and we'll work towards. But actually, we, we need actually to look at ATM to support initial operations first and then get on to autonomy and then get on to scale. Great, thanks. Uh, Corvin. I wholly agree with what Rob said. And I'd like to add that this 26 to 32 timeframe that he mentioned, I believe is in part dependent on national governments um, enabling sandboxes in which different technologies can be actually tested. So um, I would say that the, the, the winner of the race towards air mobility will be those regions that provide viable sandboxes for technology de development and demonstration. Yeah, absolutely. Sandbox is definitely what we need. Uh, our friend from Boeing, please. Yeah, I, I agree with both Rob and uh, Corwin. Um, I, I believe that uh, a, a system of system solutions, which will be drone type agnostic and use case agnostic, yeah. is something that we, we should all be aiming for together. Uh, no one can find a solution like uh, Mohan mentioned. No one can find a solution on their own. We have to have more sandbox uh, experiments, trials, yeah. people working together, all the stakeholders sitting together and uh, bringing out solutions. Because uh, a, a drone, uh, last mile delivery, small drone, which is delivering Amazon or Flipkart packets, is going to have a different communication technology from a drone taxi, which will fly for four passengers. Yeah. Uh, a drone ambulance will have a different uh, navigation or surveillance technology as compared to a small medical delivery drone, which delivers some med medical test kits. So. Uh, the solution essentially has to be drone type and use case agnostic. And this can only be done together. That's great. So my phone is vibrating in my pocket and I'm getting uh, stares to say that we need to wrap this session up. So we're, we're going to close it with that and say thank you very much, gentlemen, for, for your assistance in this. And uh, if we could thank the panel uh, in the usual way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Darryl. while uh, while uh, while Daryl hands over the goodie bags to the panelists here, uh, my special thanks to Rob. We look forward to your India visit, and just to uh, apprise the audience about the commitment that we have in this AM space, and especially for the Asha conference. Corwin is joining live from uh, Germany. He has just gone through a heart bypass surgery five days back, and that's the level of commitment that he has for the cause and for the conference here. So, Corwin, wishing you good health from all of us here, and we hope to see you in India soon. Thank you very much. Looking forward to it. Yeah, thank, thank you to you, the Robert. panel. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Corwin. Thank you, Daryl and our panelists. We now have the next session on applications of advanced air mobility, user experience, and perspectives. Air taxi applications have dominated people's imaginations while discussing advanced air mobility. There are numerous applications that eVTOL aircrafts can provide, from cargo to transport, tourism, emergency services, medical organ transport calamities, agriculture, vaccine distribution, real estate feasibility studies, surveys, and tracking services for infrastructure projects. This session will provide user perspective and benefits that are delivered from the application of AAM vehicles across different industries. I now invite the moderator for our panel, Mr. Arun Manath, Associate Director, Aerospace and Defense, Frost and Sullivan, and our panelists, Mr. Ankit Kumar, founder and CEO, Sky Air Mobility. Mr. Anshu Abhishek, COO and co-founder, Tech Eagle Innovators. Dr. Suresh Munuswamy, Deputy Director, Health Informatics and Technology Innovations at PHFI. And Mr. Raghav Belavadi, Chief Executive Officer, Hype Luxury Mobility and partner at today's event. Welcome to the panel.
Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I know you were back after a heavy lunch. Uh, we had two long days of sessions on the brick and mortar and the concrete required for the building. And this half hour session is actually to look at what use cases uh, are going to be possible, are relevant, and from both the demand and the supply side. And I think this is something that you probably be most interested in because all of the discussion that have happened over the last two days is about getting this right. What use cases, what people want, what problems are we solving, what value are we creating, and uh, what is it that people are willing to pay, which is most important because if business is not profitable, that's not going to work either. So welcome to the session. We have a fantastic uh, panel here. Uh, I am a uh, I am Arun Manan. Uh, I am a former Navy fighter pilot. Uh, I was flying the sea area from aircraft carriers uh, for many years. I've also been on the operation side of the uh, aircraft carrier where I was responsible for flight operations, uh, responsible for uh, controlling and making sure safe flight operations happen on the carrier. So I have uh, full visibility on what exactly we install requires and uh, what the challenges would be. And uh, when I think of the fact that we did it out at sea, where there were no obstacles and obstructions and nothing else, you could do an impact. And I now look at urban air mobility, where you're going to be doing it in, in the middle of a building, cities, and people. The challenge is uh, really big, but one which is not uh, unsurmountable uh, with collaboration and partnership. So, uh, having done 22 years of flying and being a watch captain, sail around the globe, I went on to the London Business School, I done my master's, and uh, after which I was the founder of a health tech startup in the UK and now a management consultant of Cross. What brings me here to the table is uh, the fact that we have done global studies as well as recently, which just finished this month, uh, market research based on primary and uh, customer research in India, as well as globally based on 6,000 surveys and conversations with C-suite executives from 60 different aviation firms. So I would bring out the demand side of uh, what you're interested in seeing as to what's the business case, what are the use cases that people want to take up, what's the possible price points, et cetera. While we have uh, a fantastic panel, as I mentioned, we're on the supply side and uh, have been providing electric uh, vertical aircraft solutions in uh, India. So just to give a perspective before I uh, come to my panelists and request them to introduce themselves, in India, we looked at use cases on the B2C and B2B uh, side. And on the B2C side, we asked uh, uh, about uh, 1,200 customers across 12 cities in India. A lot of uh, A plus cities, so B, C, and D based on population. That's how the categorization happens in India. And uh, what comes out is amongst 70% of the working community in, in India, we're willing to and actually looking forward to these services and urban air mobility solutions coming uh, sooner than later for reasons of decongestion, for reasons of saving time, for reasons of sustainability, all of those reasons are relevant. And that's about 70%. On the personal front, our research tells us that customers want to, at least 50% of the customers would want to take up these services, especially for healthcare and uh, air ambulances and medical requirements, etc. They would also take up these services for such aspects as going to dropping children to school, etc. And those are also aspects that we tested. The third use case we looked at is for pleasure with on the BTC side, and that's where Raghav was also here. That when it came to travel and tourism and uh, some amount of uh, uh, you know uh, holiday trips, etc. Close to 40% of those we surveyed said that they would want to take up these uh, services. So, travel and tourism is another area of uh, interest. Of the likes and the reasons why they would take up all of these uh, uh, use cases, what, was, uh, what came out to us from our research is that congestion is the number one factor, faster travel, of course, and the, uh, uh, the fact that the price to time ratio advantage was a big benefit that people were willing to pay for. We have a sizable market in all of these uh, in uh, across 10 vertical test people and uh, close to, uh, uh, you know, even varying from one to uh, three uh, trips a month. And when you look at the size of uh, population size in India, the city of Mumbai is 32 and a half million is the population. 
And so you uh, just multiply it by any one of them, maybe two trips a month, that's straight away up to 45 million uh, trips a month. So that's the large volumes of expectations and demand uh, are being required. On the B2B uh, uh, side, we found uh, that the greatest uptake was going to be in healthcare. We found it to be the greatest uh, uptake to be in travel and tourism, airport shuttle. And uh, we also found that the, uh, the customers were going to be willing to pay to a lesser extent. But uh, in intercity travel, we also check regional uh, connectivity. In intercity travel, they would be willing to pay for, uh, I mean, for cargo. And logistic and e-commerce e uh, uh, requirements is also uh, about the demand the sector will be high. So with that as a background, I come to our panelists. We have uh, uh, the panelists today with us, Mother and the CEO of uh, Sky Air Mobility. Incidentally, he was one of the people on the round table with Ministry of Civil Aviation who have developed uh, the drone rules of 2021. So he is an expert in the area and his company works in that uh, uh, area too. We have Anshu Abhishek, who is the uh, two and the co founders of Techie Tool Innovation. We have Dr. Suresh uh, Mumuswamy, the Deputy Director of Health Informatics and Technology Innovation at the Public Health Foundation of India. And we have uh, Mr. Raghav uh, Belavadi, who is on the other niche sector uh, and not on the mass sector, as the chief executive officer of high luxury mobility. May I uh, first thank you for joining the panel and uh, invite you to the session. May I request each of you to kindly introduce yourself and your organization and uh, inform our uh, uh, you know, audience about uh, what problems you're solving and what are the opportunities and challenges in the areas you're in. And uh, before we come to uh, subsequent uh, requirements, thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Dr. Suresh, as I was introduced. Our focus is on universal healthcare, and I represent Public Health Foundation of India, which is one of the largest organizations involved in public health in this country. And the idea of universal primary healthcare is actually also reflected by the requirements of all state governments where we would want to provide primary health care at the doorstep of each and every individual in this country. And we think it is only possible if there are drones. Otherwise, India is a large country with a huge population. It's impossible to provide primary health care universally to each and every person. And that's what we are actually working on. Thank you. Thank you, Arun, for the warm introduction. Good afternoon to all of you. My name is Ankit Kumar. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO at Sky Air. Uh, we are primarily a drone delivery company. We have been active in 10 cities in India, doing over 40 flights a day today. We also introduced the Sky UTM, which is one of its kind UTM platform, which has been deployed in multiple states and we have been utilizing on a daily basis. I come from an industry which is not a future, I would say, but it's become a reality in present. And that's how things are moving up. Our Honorable Minister in the morning session have spoken a lot about the prospects and the opportunity that exists in this massive sector, which is growing on a daily basis. And drone delivery as a sector has come a long way towards that. We all are here and an ecosystem is growing. I remember pre the new drone rules that came out in 2021, the number of startups in the drone community was merely 40, 50. Today, that number has gone up to 600, 700 odd startups. So there's this level of innovation, this level of things which are happening towards indigenization, towards Atmanir Bhar Bharat, and the AAM is going to play a very important role towards, towards that. Thank you very much. Uh Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anshu Abhishek. I'm the co-founder of Technical Innovations. Uh, we are currently building on-demand drone logistics airline, where we are building end-to-end -end, uh, drone technology stack, which is 75% indigenous. And last year only, we have enabled uh, drone delivery hub, Asia's first drone delivery hub in Meghalaya, where we are providing uh, critical medicines from one place to another in the remote areas of Meghalaya within the range of 50 kilometers the, with the help of drones. Our, uh, our vision is to revolution, revolutionize the last, last mile and mid mile of the supply chain by providing the universal access all, of all kinds of cargoes, be it healthcare or uh, day-to-day -day parcels. Thank you.
गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन और गुड आफ्टरनून माय नेम इज राघव बेलवाड़ी आई एम द फाउंडर एंड सीईओ ऑफ हाइप लग्जरी इट्स बीन सिक्स इयर्स एट हाइप व्हाट वी आर ट्राइंग टू अचीव इज फॉर प्रीमियम कस्टमर्स एज ही ऑलरेडी मेंशन दिस दिस द एरिया वेयर वी आर ऑपरेटिंग इज सो नीच इट्स ओनली फॉर एट द मोमेंट ओनली फॉर द प्रीमियम कस्टमर्स uh where we are trying to solve the it's not a problem because luxury cannot be a, a problem for people but it's always a, a choice um making it convenient on land air water and outer space uh, in terms of providing luxury cars uh, private jets yachts and also in outer space uh, why i added uh, outer space uh, is um, we call this as laws of hype l a w s and i myself i'm scheduled to fly to the outer space through virgin galactic in 2026 so i'm sure that you know hundreds and thousands of other uh, fellow indians would love to jump in and i'm also participating in some of the advisory roles to outer space missions from india so when i look more and more into the outer space missions and you know the private jets and we talks like this uh, the smaller the yachts and cars look like as an attempt to solve the problem so i'm very happy to be here thanks to cii and uh, happy to participate with my other colleagues thank you uh, thank you so we will see some are to uh, last of the week and we are going to uh, take a look at that so what is the mass sector uh, uh, until the new life comes from light on what you see we've been able to grow with the gas which is the service is providing uh, with the mobile we can be better and what is the need of price and what is the necessity to ask the people about the deal really the sector is scale the purpose uh, of the guard of the deal will be for the people why i say that is the people can come to me we are working on not the great thing is for the people we have thousand people thousand people uh, what is the great uh, for you spread out about not the kind of particular thing but And that is so crazy. But now look at the earlier uh, uh, mobility issues where you're allowed on the phone feed as the phone moves faster. You're supposed to fly in the different phone feed. In phone feed, how do you know, the provide the millions of what you're building with how to get the aircraft flying with the high solvent requirement of safety? Given the fact that you really have to put numbers there, you need to have very Limited to small thousand feet or just a bit to be allowed. You certainly can't afford to have hundred feet or four hundred feet in the aircraft. And then this becomes really autonomous. You then have to uh, be scaling in some areas. And pilot assistance, uh, having been on the carrier and having operated in big sized uh, aircraft, just the scaling options. Uh, really, there is a finite number that uh, manual and the human control can achieve. And so scaling and autonomous is the way forward. Uh, if this is really to flourish, and what we see globally at the moment is that from 2030, maybe the earliest autonomous will be in place, and subsequently uh, they are by 2040 uh, more majority. So, what's the kind of system you think we would need in place? What is the one stakeholder you would like to see on the table, and uh, how do you think these systems can be in place in India? Sure. See, uh, there are there are two sides of the UTM. One is the regulatory side of it, which you have heard in the last session, where people are working towards integrating the whole of airspace, and it has to be a unified airspace where you have the civil aviation, the defense, and the recreational activities which are being taken into different other uh, forums, as well as the drone ecosystem which exists in the low altitude airspace that people are talking about. Now that's the regulatory side of stuff, which has to be unified, which has to provide everything to a single platform where we are moving towards. So digital sky framework, which has been created, which essentially is the FIMS, the flight information management system, which the government of India is creating in the back end is going to be a data repository where everything is going to be registered. And then there's going to be UTM service providers like us who come in and who provide an interface to the pilots to drone fleet operators, et cetera, to have an access to the larger unified airspace and go and take permissions. Now today that permission cycle to fly a drone into a red zone or a geo zone or a yellow zone 
is a time taking effort it takes it takes us around 15 days do levels of coordinations do everything manually and then go and fly and we face that on a regular basis that's one side of things which we are making it automated which we are doing on a regular basis we have already installed in seven adcs in the country we are doing regular real time uh, traffic management and doing real time coordination with adcs in bangalore we have flights which are happening closer to the airport to electronic city in bangalore where where we are flying medical samples where we are doing things and we are coordinating with three adcs the bangalore international airport hal and yelahanka which is a indian air force base and the coordination used to be manual and used to be super time taking and you have to have slots that's where the regulatory dashboard comes which we provide to different adcs which we install there we regularize that and that stuff not just for us to fly drones but to enable a larger ecosystem to start utilizing the whole of utm piece and go and fly drones in different territories that's what we are doing in bengaluru we have done that in uh, hinden we have done that in multiple other air spaces and the idea is that we have to look at this as a unified air space and we have to integrate and bring together a lot of uh, a lot of stakeholders to come into this so i would say that you know the, the ministry of defense indian air force dgca ai and multiple other stakeholders have to come together to realize and create a unified air space on a on a utm channel that's one side the second side you know there is a drone rules which is existing today uh, which has allowed a lot of things to happen but for whom you have drone pilots you have drone fleet operators you have uh, farmers who are now utilizing drones to spray chemicals you have people who are going in the field and doing aerial filming with different categories of drones they are not aware about where to fly how to fly where we cannot fly which are prohibited areas which are not prohibited areas it's super challenging for them to realize whether they are compliant or non compliant now that's where the consumer side of interface which comes in which we have deployed today where we have got around 120 users who are utilizing that's within a specified period of last one month that we got which was inaugurated by shrinitin gadkari ji and uh, which has been widely accepted not just by manufacturers but by individual pilots as well who are utilizing the platform to know whether they are compliant or non compliant to know where to fly to know how to fly to file a flight plan the flight plan goes in the back end to airport authority of india as well and we try to synchronize and maintain a data maintain a log for them which helps them out to deploy at a massive scale to a larger scale so if we as a country wants a wider adoption to happen across sectors not just delivery not just air taxis but inspection surveillance agri and multiple other sectors we need to ensure that people move from being non compliant to compliant and there's a lot of data in the back end which is pulled on and where authorities are aware about where the drone flights are happening they should not chase the user to find out whether this is a compliant drone or a non compliant drone and accordingly act on it that's the two side of things that we enable today thanks thanks for that uh, How much do you think you need to be plugged in sooner into the drone system that the OEMs have installed for the ready to bring the aircraft flight in India? How important do you think that conversation early on in the development of the platform itself would be important for plugging into the system? Or can it be just plugging into the system that they have? So, see, it's a plug and play system today as well. There are multiple facets of it that we are also providing today. So, we have something called as WhatsApp UTM. So, in case Uh, the whole idea is that we want to make people be more compliant towards whatever they are doing we are not here to tell them that you can't fly and we are not the authorities to decide that what we are here to do that is make systems more simple so that they are compliant enough so we have something called as whatsapp utm if you don't have a dashboard you don't have an app uh, you are in a area where the connectivity is a trouble uh, and which which happens in major major locations where we currently fly as well you can go with the whatsapp it's a, it's a, it's a three uh, three step process that we deploy and you can apply for the entire flight plan everything is uploaded in the same format into the system we have something which we call as pop up utm so in areas where you see you are not doing a recurring flight uh, you want a on go solution so you keep on moving this this majorly also applies for defense applications where people keep on moving from places to places you need to deploy a utm for that particular zone itself 
we have a pop-up UDM system that we deploy and we, we get people on board and you don't need to do anything. You just need to have this in the flight controlling system. Would you like to share uh, how you see uh, grant availability supporting uh, maybe an air ambulance or uh, 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 medical, medicare or, or medevac uh, uh, kind of solution? Uh, uh, and what is it that you'd like to see happen? Well, uh, thanks, Arun. Well, if you talk about universal healthcare, it is as mass as mass can actually get. You're talking about a population of 1.4 billion people. And you are planning to serve each and every one of them. If you can go to the next slide, please. But if you'd want to reach them, it's usually this is the kind of situation that you'll be facing. These are photographs that we have taken or some of our partners have actually shared. And these are probably rural and remote areas, but realistically, if it rains in most of the cities, you would actually see similar environment. And that's how our country is actually. So if you would actually want to build a drone that is required for universal healthcare, the next slide, please. Uh, there are certain parameters we actually think it should actually satisfy. And as a small snippet, my lab is the first in the country to actually use or strap a box of medicine to a drone and fly. And that was in 2015. If anybody wants to contest it and say, I did it before, I'm happy to retract no issues. Uh, but we also came out with a specification that was actually, again, published in one of the national newspapers, which is the drone has to carry about 50 to 100 kgs, fly 200 to 300 kilometers, has to take off and land vertically, and hopefully should fly at a speed of around 120 kilometers minimum per hour. And the way the, we, we actually worked it out was, the next slide, please. We actually went to a district and took around uh, 50,000 photographs. A lot of them GPS tagged. We identified all the villages, all the number of people living in them. We went to all the primary healthcare centers, took the registers, photos of all the people who walked in, all the diseases they were suffering from, and all the government hospitals where they were actually admitted and all the case sheets. So we had an idea on what diseases they are suffering from, what treatment they were actually given, what is the weights, volumes of all these medications. We had to factor in the uh, people who are going for private facilities and also the scaling up needs. So we calculated all these things and then figured out this so-called specification, which means if I would want to serve this entire district, I need to have a drone that carries so and so 50 kgs, 100 kg, uh, 100 kgs, 200 to 300 kilometers, because our population is huge and our districts are actually very large. If you can go to the next slide, please. So here, what you see is the states that we have. If you have a drone that can fly 200 to 300 kilometers and carry the payload that I'm actually requesting for, you don't need to put up a facility in each and every district because that's how current healthcare system actually works. The home state that I am from Telangana has around 30 districts. So you have 30 warehouses, 30 teams of people trying to supply the primary healthcare center. So if you have a drone that can fly 200, 300 kilometers, I don't need 30 facilities. All I need is optimally located four or five nodes wherein I can actually do two things. One, I can provide universal service. Second is I'll be able to handle a lot of existing inefficiencies in the system and optimize, which itself will actually pay for the facilities or the new technologies that I'm going to roll out. But all these things work only at a high level. Currently, we are still kind of pushing through one kgs, five kgs for all outlier situations. So we need to make drones mainstream. And that's where you will actually see use cases propping up and you will see financial viability and sustainability into the system. So if you look at even a small state like Meghalaya, you can supply the entire state with simply two nodes. And that is absolutely necessary because again, if you see a small, uh, uh, small uh, image in the bottom, you see the state of Orissa with about 30 to 40 blood banks. And what you see in the slide next to it is there is actually no blood in a lot of these blood banks. So each of these blood bank actually costs 10 to 15 crores to set up two to three crores per year to run. It actually makes no sense when you can actually put up two or three blood banks in appropriate location where blood is actually donated and shifted using drones. So these are all fairly straightforward use cases, but that apply only at a certain level. 
not at a level where you can transport a kg or perhaps five kg and look for financial viability or sustainability. The next slide, please. There are a few more requirements for healthcare. Number one is multiple payloads, modular payloads, because if you keep sending one product at a time, you'll have to send it multiple times, defeats the whole purpose of sending a drone itself. So in one kind of trip, I allow to send maybe vaccines that have to be preserved, and then there is insulin, and then there are other products. Each of them have to maintain at different temperatures. So I need to look at temperature sensitivity. I also need to look at fragility control because a lot of these medical products are actually very fragile. If you want to transport organs, then you need to have a complete relook at the way these products are actually transported, the packaging it should actually be. And that's what we came out with as a concept. So our drone basically is again a conceptual drone. It carries multiple boxes in multiple temperatures, multiple products can actually be transported at the same time. But this is actually part of a larger uh, concept that we are working on, which is what is universal healthcare. The next slide, please. Where we want to push primary healthcare to the person's doorstep. Now, this is where we have come out with softwares that are language neutral. India, again, has a very unique uh, situation. We are the only country in the world with 30 official languages. Whatever you do has to be translated 30 times. Huge resource consuming in itself. So we came out with a software that is language neutral. No language in it. It has icons. Put a plus or minus button. We will be able to identify the diseases at the person's home. But what happens after you identify the diseases? I need to have a super efficient logistic system on the back end, which is not yet there. And only drones can actually provide it. So that I can shift the medicines to the person's home. But that's only a one way requirement. The second way is I need to collect the blood samples, bring them back, and then shift them to the laboratory. So, drones are the only way I can provide universal healthcare, provided all these boxes are ticked. It's still a long way, but we think we'll probably reach here. And then there is also another requirement if I shift all this primary healthcare home, then a lot of these things can be done at home. And in future, maybe five years, 10 years, 15 years from now, you will only see two places where realistic healthcare is actually being delivered, homes and the healthcare facilities. So I need to bring these people back to the facility to perform surgeries, maybe for conditions that require hospital admissions. So this is where I would actually require air ambulances on one side to bring patients to the healthcare facilities, and then this cargo drones to push medicines and diagnostics to the other side of the person's home. And all these things are possible only with drones, but only with the specifications that we are actually looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. We believe uh, our teachers also say that air ambulances are something that we are able to uh, say more. They said to me on the city and we think that they could be implemented. So, what Doctor said is absolutely relevant. But, like I said, these are the drone masks for the community. This is a very important idea for all. Advanced uh, the mobility, like the afternoon last night, it's uh, advanced, it's also, uh, you know, for all, it's important and that all marks come from mass mobility. One of my colleagues today also mentioned that uh, mass solutions can prevent mass addiction. And uh, that is a great interest to those in government, that is the interest of the public, and if they produce it for the mass. Uh, you are likely to have less people complaining about noise, less people complaining about uh, you know, privacy, less people uh, getting concerned, and you will probably be able to reach closer into city centers uh, than would otherwise be possible. But that having been said about the uh, mass solution, uh, let's look at a niche solution that uh, Raghav provides uh, luxury that serves for cars and yachts and private jets as to how easy. Advanced air mobility and the urban air mobility systems that we've heard in the last two days changing or augmenting what you're already doing now? Uh, th that's, a, that's a very interesting question because uh, in, in the niche space, um, uh, we're talking about people who are, who are wealthy, um, probably less risk taking. Um, so, unmanned vehicles or um, short haul. Uh, is definitely in demand as long as um, uh, as long as it kind of caters to their needs in terms of being being very exclusive, uh, meant for them as, as a as a custom travel and not exactly uh, to be part of um, a larger gathering. So just to give you an idea, uh, ninety percent of our um, uh, customers in private jet space are uh, for business, and about ten percent for other. I wouldn't really say. On a personal uh, or a private affairs. Um, same is for our luxury cars, and 100% of the yachts are obviously for um, 
uh, you know, for their leisurely vacations and other occasions. So um, when we are looking at the the short uh, distance mobility, uh, let's say from Bangalore to Uti or or Bangalore to uh, Kur kind of destinations, uh, definitely we cater them a lot, and we also give them options in terms of more uh, economical or cheaper options or or in high tech probably in future. But we have seen them increasingly. They are a little bit. Um, um, uh, I would say they don't show interest, but their excitement is to stay away from the um, from the mass and to be more exclusive, more uh, customized, more experiential for them or for their uh, for their families. So um, this advanced technology is definitely probably uh, uh, reading the pulses of our our customer base or our target audience. Uh, I think it's it's good for um, what we have realized in in several discussions with them is. Probably it's it, the go-to factor for them is more for a cargo because it helps and saves lives. But for them, it, it would still um, it would still be like they would rather prefer a, a single or twin um, jet uh, helicopter from here to Uti instead of going and sharing the seats with the six other people. Uh, they don't mind by paying the price for that. And so it's been very difficult conversation for us. Um, uh, to sell them anything which is mass oriented and and the metric supports us so we are also a little bit reluctant towards offering them what it is not there but we realize the the technology has a potential but the the target audience is completely different they, they, they are they're like a cult you know, they are they're a very small circle you know the top of the pyramid uh, and their choices their taste and their um uh, and, and and the way they think towards uh, these aspects are completely different uh, from how the rest of the mass um, products or services are available in the market. But it's very interesting. Out of 10,000 units, even if you do about two units, uh, from an eco economy point of view, it's, it's pretty profitable. Uh, but pushing technology into them, uh, it's, it's a little bit harder. Just the time, but finally, I'm waiting for say that this urban air solutions like that you can have. Uh, Multi-core solutions that go out to for multiple levels. You can have different solutions that go a little further towards the city on the board. Now, with those kind of solutions and the payload capacity, the work group of core PV, etc. What additional services in areas like Meghalaya, Nagaland, Himachal, and Telangana, where you're operating, do you see would be a possibility? And what new uh, use cases would you be able to serve with that kind of coverage? Sure. So, as we are currently operating in Meghalaya, where we have uh, enable the drone delivery hub where we are uh, currently uh, uh, providing services within the radius of 50 kilometers uh, in the radius of 50 kilometers where we are uh, 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 serving for health healthcare essentials but apart from healthcare essentials what we can do is we can also provide uh, provide drone delivery services to uh, to the existing nodes for the e-commerce or day-to-day -day parcels delivery which will be as as fast as our healthcare delivery where uh, because in the hilly region uh, to cover a distance of uh, 30 to 40 kilometers it takes around uh, 3 to 4 hours to cover that distance but with the help of drones uh, we are cutting it down to 30 minutes or 40 minutes so that's the kind of impact that we are creating and the same same model can be repl replicated for i think e-commerce and your day to day parcel delivery as well just to wrap up finally, uh, I'd like to say that there are various solutions and applications being looked at uh, uh, globally. There's uh, uh, Joby looking at the Alliance, there's the Delta Alliance, there's, uh, you know, we've got Arthur looking at the Alliance with the United Airlines, Saudi with the Canadian, we've got tourism uh, with Volocopter happening in Singapore, we've got Ehang on Iron Hop in China. So, multiple cases, but really what can be important is Indeed, natural supply and demand, but more importantly, the aspects that we've discussed so far, which is safety, efficiency of operation. Most importantly, on a mass scale, would be affordability. And yet another aspect which may be something that we can consider is the flexibility. A vision capability of a mass platform will also be important if you have to very uh the kind of uh, business in case you could want to you want to travel, you want to do care, you want to do ambulance, you want to do the and therefore the flexibility of the craft, the flexibility of the entire system 
for the second video and what we have to see the business is the one of the one of the first one of the one of the one of the first 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 of the one I request all the panelists to pose for a group photo with Mr. Manat. I also request Mr. Manat to hand over a token of our appreciation to the panelists. And now we move on to the next session on skilling, simulation techniques, and training for advanced air mobility for emerging technologies in AAM. As India targets to leapfrog and emerge as a big player across the value chain in the AAM space, the country needs to specialize in modeling simulation and training for emerging aviation technologies. This session, We'll look at how prepared India is from the perspective of skilling in the AAM space. It may present an important perspective of workforce as MRO workforce are likely to be accommodated in the AAM industry and create potential jobs. I now invite the moderator, Mr. Darrell Swanson, co-founder EA Maven and former advisor NASA, and our panelists, Mr. Henry Roth, Senior Lecturer, Cranfield University, Wing Commander, Rachit Bhatnagar, Chief Executive Officer, Aerospace and Aviation Sector Skill Council, Mr. Manpreet Bhatia, Chief Executive Officer, Four Institute of Drone Technology, Mr. Krupalu Mehta, Chief Executive Officer, Parallax Labs. Welcome to the panel. That's why we didn't have a chance to speak sooner. Checking, one, two, there we go. So we're, we're in an interesting uh, session uh, right now where we're going to be talking about the, the uh, some of the skill sets uh, that are needed to deliver an advanced air mobility system. Um, yes, I, I made a bit of a mistake uh, yesterday in that I had... Uh, I had them play Henrik Roth's um, video. Uh, I don't intend on actually going uh, through the video again. He's not actually here with us uh, virtually. Uh, the, the time zone difference for him were uh, a little bit difficult. And also he's lecturing uh, as well. Um, but just uh, what I will do is take a, a minute to summarize uh, some of his uh, statements and then just tell a little bit of a story um, uh, about my involvement with the academic institutions uh, within India. So Cranfield University I've worked with um, for a number of years on various different projects. They, they, um, they, they teach about uh, airport planning and design and operation. Uh, I've been working with them on a future flight uh, project. Uh, we did some work to, together on the NEOM uh, project and we have another project in the Middle East that we're working with them. From his video yesterday, one of the key things that I picked up on was that uh, the universities have to be about two or three years in advance of what the industry is trying to do. And that's because they can concentrate on the academic research but then it's how you turn that academic research into uh, deliverable um, services and or products or insights that industry can, can actually use. Um, the other side of the story uh, is in terms of the relationship that I've been having with uh, the universities within India. So I'm an officer of the Vertical Flight Society uh, out of the uh, US and uh, the UK. And if anybody's familiar with the Vertical Flight Society, it's a great asset uh, that has a lot of information about vertical flight uh, and eVTOL. They're, they're certainly one of the best learned institutions um, in that space. Um, the, uh, the activity that we had there was last year, we, they did a design competition um, for university students looking at designing an eVTOL, uh, which is uh, more user-friendly for passengers with reduced mobility, so reduced and hidden mobility. And it's a subject that's not really talked a lot 
uh, about in uh, in the industry, and it's something that I've been trying to champion. Uh, and I, I managed to browbeat uh, the VFS into doing this design competition, which was uh, sponsored by Bell. Uh, in the end, in the end, we had about six different universities uh, putting uh, competition uh, applications in into the uh, into that competition. There's some really innovative uh, ways of looking at uh, managing passengers with reduced mobility and making it more inclusive uh, design. So enough about that. Uh, so uh, in, in the usual fashion uh, of what we've done before uh, and to help us uh, manage time, we're going to start down at the end. Uh, we've, we've got a, a bit of a mixed bag here in terms of, of, of companies doing simulation, and we have people talking about the, the skill sector and, and that. And we want to try and hit on all of that, and then we'll go to a few Q&A sessions uh, at the end. So at the end, please. Thanks a lot, uh, Daryl. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Kripalu Mehta. I'm the founder and uh, CEO of Parallax Labs. We are a Mumbai-based uh, company, very much uh, Indian uh, in nature. However, we've had uh, spread our arms last year into the United Kingdom, as well as uh, the, the, the South Korean region for developing and deploying uh, defense simulators primarily. So we are doing uh, aircraft simulators, which are um, very low cost, low maintenance, having very less footprint. Uh, we have started, uh, you know, uh, uh, jumping into this, looking at the whole, uh, you know, uh, cycle that every technology goes under. You know, we have, we've, we've seen how, uh, you know, uh, how shot up metaverse has been in the past, uh, you know, year or so, just post COVID. Uh, talking about metaverse and immersive technologies, virtual reality, augmented reality, simulation is the is the space that will massively change its face uh, with the incoming of uh, these technologies and 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 we really feel that uh, innovation in this space will add to the scalability part of it uh, and when we talk about defense and uh, like our honorable minister just said in the morning we are uh, expecting an inundation of uh, you know uh, growth in the civil aviation as well as you know defense aviation in the next decade for india how do we train people you know, uh, this this whole discussion is about training people. How do we train so many people? Um, it is surprising that, you know, in armed forces, uh, especially in the army, we are having very few simulators. There's one in Bangalore uh, known as Hats Off. That's a physical simulator, takes up the entire room, uh, has, has, a, has a big space. Uh, we cannot have many of them. So we are designing solutions where you can have, uh, where instead of, 25 army units sharing one simulator will be having every unit having 25 simulators. So that is possible through, you know, scalability, innovation, tech, uh, you know, in technology. So that's where our uh, goal is uh, both in civil and defense and uh, uh, training with immersive technologies, I think is the next big thing. Great. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, first of all, uh, CIO, for giving us an opportunity to share our views on this very, very important topic. And thank you, Daryl, for moderating this for us. Yeah, so uh, I am the Chief Executive Officer for the uh, Four Institute of Drone Technology and Research. So Four is from basically a Four family who is pioneer into the education field, and uh, they are running a prestigious uh, business school in Delhi. Uh, we have a few other schools in Gurgaon. And uh, uh, we have coming up with an agricultural setup in Manisar. So if you look at our institute, uh, in the name itself, there are two parts. One is the uh, drone training and research and development. So drone training, we are the uh, DGCA approved, uh, government approved, uh, authorized training, uh, pilot training organization, where we give the training to the uh, pilots for the small category VLOS uh, drones uh, with the payloads, multiple payloads, how, how to handle the multiple payloads and all. And uh, our main focus is now on the second part, second vertical, which we are, uh, which we are nurturing, uh, is the research and development, where we are trying to create uh, uh, use cases, we are trying to create a solutions library, solution library as a concept. And because we are training across the sector, our training cut across multiple sectors, it's not confined to one sector, as the applications are increasing. So, uh, so we are trying to kind of uh, uh, understand those use cases and try to replicate, try to create the awareness in the market and penetrate uh, into the industry. That's it. Thank you. Wink Ben. Hello. Yeah. Good evening, <clears throat> everybody. And uh, thanks, uh, CI again, uh, for you know getting me here uh, to speak to you all. 
Uh, so uh, I represent uh, an organization called Aerospace and Aviation Sector Skill Council, abbreviated as AASSC. And uh, this is a, a kind of awarding body and a certification body who, whose basic job is to develop the qualifications around the complete aerospace aviation, all the uh, subsectors. Namely, there would be in you know, airport operations, airline operations, the aviation maintenance, repair, and overall aerospace manufacturing assembly, aerospace design development, and also now the latest addition being the drones. And of course, the addition would be the new addition of e -Bitols. So here, what we do is, you know, developing the qualifications or what we call in the industry terms as the job roles. So we are an industry-led body where we do a lot of industry stakeholder meetings and come out with the uh, where the where the uh, skill gap is existing, mm -hmm. and so uh, through the various skill gap studies, we come out with the you know the qualification names, and this is what is really required. And especially we try to focus on the entry level job roles where there's a maximum demand. So in this space, uh, we have been uh, we have been working under a, a regulatory body called NCVT, uh, National Council of Vocational Education Training. And our line ministry is Ministry of Civil Aviation. So this is an initial introduction, and I think I'll come out for the next question round. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, some interesting aspects there. Um, in the United Kingdom, uh, there, there was a pre or during the COVID period uh, within the industry, because the aviation industry slowed down significantly, what we found was that a lot of our young engineers gravitated away uh, from aviation and they went into other sectors. Uh, I'm just kind of wondering, have, have we seen that kind of uh, impact uh, because of COVID uh, for where young engineers who may have been aerospace engineers or in the simulation space, um, have they been bleeding away to other sectors? And, and if so, how do we get them back? Anybody? I think uh, COVID has generally affected the entire world in terms of training because earlier, uh, you know, not only EBITOLs or, um, uh, you know, fixed wing aircrafts or rotoring specifically, uh, but in general, the simulators have been very, uh, very physical in nature. So they have been huge, physical, bulky. Um, how, we do understand that, you know, things like full flight simulators have uh, a huge impact and they're the most sophisticated uh, piece of technology that you know we have been able to build in terms of training um but um, uh, post covid things have really changed post covid people have understood that there is a space there is a possibility of having virtual trainings and that's the reason people can actually you know be hooked on to a very uh, you know fluid mode of uh, training methods so when we, when we say fluid mode of training methods it could be you know portability can you carry your simulators yourself so let's say not only aviation you know let's say for example uh, training uh, police for you know investigation purposes they have built small backpacks where you know they can just go anywhere pull out the headset from the backpack hook onto the headset and just start training anywhere um, and uh, anywhere and everywhere is is the new word and new buzz, uh, and that's where we feel there's a massive uh, adoption uh, in in the UK currently. Because as we see in the UK through our UK arm, every second day we are getting a new tender with respect to virtual reality based training. So uh, it, it, call it a, a side effect of metaverse hype, or call it post COVID effect, or call it anything, but it's happening. Uh, and I think that's the big change uh, that we are uh, seeing post-COVID, uh, not only in UK, but as well, other countries as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Wing Commander? Okay. So I think, uh, rightly said, that the post-COVID, we are seeing a, a V-shaped recovery in, across all the sectors, not only to aviation, but across the economy is booming back. And uh, not only simulators, but I would like to just uh, 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 go one step ahead that the overall training or overall the ecosystem of the skill as a training is very, very important in today's industry. As we are talking since yesterday, I was listening to a lot of speakers that 
we are opening up our, opening our skies for ev tolls or uh, 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 drones or uavs i think it's very important that the pilot at the back or the person who is managing the, the back of the entire operation needs to be rightfully skilled so uh, according to us the skill has two definition one is according to the regulatory frameworks you need to have a harmonization certifications everything in place that is there which everybody tries to do that but apart from that according to us that uh, skill has to be rightfully placed as per the industry requirements because every use case has a different applications for and different requirements for example uh, uh, now in uh, fidtr we call it fidtr we have trained so many pilots across if i if i try to cut across the use cases there are, there are so many use cases for example we have trained across agri uh, surveying gis mapping people who are working in the coal mines people who are doing for heritage buildings people uh, who are uh, doing the swarming of the drones all that we have trained the pilots every corporate every every industry has a different requirement different applications for example agri i would say that the pilot has to kind of do a spraying at 30 degree angle and very precise spraying at this much quantity of the spray has to go in the plant so that kind of a skills is required in the air right so that kind of training is required that's what we are trying to integrate our training ecosystem uh, backward also we are working in partnership with the industries and also the lot of academic institutes because there the uh, there the starting point is starts when when we try to go with the academic institutes prestigious institutes like iits or topmost country institutes and try to create the drone awareness programs and about the training part that inside that inside the interest of the students and uh, budding engineers or technocrats into this technology another step is about the forward integration that since now how can we bring this technology closer to the common man while we are discussing in this uh, in this hall in this conference all all good things but as a common man how we are trying to solve their problem with technology so that's what we trying to go and uh, do the forward integrations uh, for example agri drone again i'm coming to that point the agri drone is a very very well established use case why can't we go directly to the farmers and showcase them that how drones can help them to do a right spraying with all the standards everything in place for example one acre of the farm can be sprayed in 5 6 minutes so he'll save lot of manpower cost our cost and uh, other cost into that so i'm talking of a next step as an uberization of the services how can a common man use want to use a drone how can he use that drone with the help of technology so that is the next step we are building and we are trying to create a platform of the right stakeholders into that and taking the technology to the next level to the common man's door thank you please <clears throat> so i, I would uh, take this question as you know uh, put it this way uh firstly talking about the post pandemic of course uh, the skilling ecosystem has changed drastically and that's how it was education and skilling has gone into a completely blended format and uh, so just in a good way of course but in certain ways while the skilling is concerned it has to be more of hands on and so we have tried ourselves to make it you know uh, a blended format so that at least 70 to 80% uh, of the uh, skilling happens hands on With the OGT component added to it, and so uh, these are some changes which is happening uh, post pandemic. But to take it forward, uh, the next step is you know we already have a framework ready. So talking about the uh, question about you know uh, are we ready futuristically ready for the AV tolls and this new uh, futuristic uh, emerging technology? So uh, uh, see anything which flies on the air, the aviation things comes into picture, and we have the basic. all the aerospace and aviation the uh, qualification what we have developed are somehow we can just fine tune them to the e vitol ecosystem so uh, there's a complete a small you know mapping or a, a fine tuning is required with the concerned stakeholders we can do we can uh, also kind of you know uh, set up certain you know uh, center of excellences where we can you know work together in the synergy to take it forward yeah right right thank you um i want to come back to uh what the honorable minister was saying earlier today uh, about india's aggressive growth plans uh, for aviation he was talking about a cagr uh, constant annual growth rates of 10% which is absolutely huge and if the existing aviation system is growing to grow at, at 10% uh, per um 
at, at that kind of rate, and then advanced air mobility becomes a reality, and we have more regional flights, I'm kind of wondering, within your respective industries, are you geared up for that kind of growth? Are you going to be able to deliver the, the, the flight simulations or, or the training programs or the, the drone pilots? Uh, are you ready for that kind of growth? And, and if not, what, what do you need to do to get ready for that growth? So we'll start this end and, and go backwards. Uh, I think we are gearing up, maybe not at that pace right now, but uh, with the ecosystem coming in place, <clears throat> funding happening, uh, the, the, the manufacturers coming in, uh, we are on that path. As for the drone, uh, drone themselves, the, the platform is concerned, we have that type certification happening in a very good space. We have the sponsor here, QCI. Uh, they are doing testing. They have, have an independent lab set up where the drones are getting type certified, maybe uh, two per week. Uh, there's a kind of platform coming up and in the all categories, maybe small, medium, large, all category of drones. Uh, similarly, I think for the e VTOL platforms also, uh, the certification process is already underway. This is as far as the platform is concerned. Uh, similarly, talking about the operation side, the pilots are also, I think, from the same ecosystem, the drone operators, the drone, drone analytics, data analytics, and the all uh, the background, the MRO uh, guys can very smoothly and very, uh, you know, seamlessly, they can work on this platform. So uh, we are gearing up and that way, and I think we have heard in the morning uh, with Honorable Minister of Civil Aviation, uh, he is giving a free hand to the industry to develop the ecosystem. And similarly, we are there to support the ecosystem in the, in the, in the type of skilling what we want. Uh, I would request at this uh, stage, uh, like Ministry of Civil Aviation can launch uh, immediately a kind of skill gap study. This is what is required, the basic premises where we would know what's the kind of you know, skill are required at each level, progressively going forward. So that's what is required right now. So I think uh, this is a very uh, right question. So uh, according to uh, me, basically, it's all about the infrastructure planning and uh, mapping of the infrastructure. If you look at in today's country scenario, there are close to 50 uh, such institutes who are offering the drone pilot trainings. But what are the estimates which uh, Honorable Minister has said in the morning and uh, India is destined to become a drone hub and uh, around 1 lakh drone pilots requirement in coming years. So it's not possible for these 50 institutes to cater to that kind of a requirement. I think it's the requirement, the time, the need of the R is basically to pull the infrastructure together. For example, uh, uh, typically as a compliance point of view, if I want to open a drone pilot training uh, uh, institute, I need to have eight to 10 acres of a flying land where I need to give a dedicated flying experience to the candidates with all the amenities like night flying, uh, landing stations, dedicated landing stations. Now, for a common man, it's not possible or, or an entrepreneur, it's not possible to find out those kind of setups and do that. So I think uh, we need to have a right partnerships in place, both with academic institutes and other interfaces of the industry. And it has to be a convergence. You can't isolate everything. For example, Vertiports, eVTOL, drone pilot training, all that has to come under a convergence under a one umbrella. Then you will have a common pool of infrastructure where then you can drive a scale and a growth with the size of the country which we have. Otherwise, to replicate this, Obviously, we will try because there are mandated number of flying hours per candidate. DGC has specified number of hours every candidate has to go through a training, both in the classroom, simulation, and all. So as per the flying hours, for example, two drones can cater to five to six candidates if you go by the flying hours norms. So I think it's a time that we all have to kind of converge all these resources together and talk in one uniformity. It can't be isolated because it's an overall infrastructure planning and infrastructure ramp up under ASHA. So it has to be for all, A for all, what Mr. Mm -hmm. Bhatt and everybody told him yesterday. It has to be A for all. And convergence is the theme according to, uh, according to me. Yeah. yeah, no, that, that, that's right. I definitely agree for all. Uh, we, we haven't really touched on uh, the social inclusion uh, side in this in this conference, we haven't been able to really touch on the sustainability equation, uh, but there's certainly something that we'll, we'll be addressing hopefully in, in the next conference. One point, just I missed yep. one point, one point. 
Can I make one point? Yeah, go, yeah. go ahead, please. Uh, for example, we are also uh, running our projects in the country under the smart city. Okay, now this, I think the uh, advanced mobility, uh, air mobility, which has to come under the smart city integration. So this has to come under, all the grids have to come together so that we should speak a one language as a city, as a country. Urban air mobility has to come under a smart city projects and it has to be integrated into that. It's not that a smart city will work in isolation. I will work in isolation. Tomorrow I say I need a vertiports. I can't again dig the road and go back to the roof and then tell me, give me the vertiports while they have developed the smart city. So it has to go to the planning phase. It, all the components have to be integrated in a right, right full way so that we should come up with a right design at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I absolutely agree. All right, 10% growth. Yeah, so I think uh, what if we take cues from Honorable Minister's speech in the morning, uh, we are going to see an unprecedented growth. It's it's something that we've never seen. So like we saw a lot of unprecedented things post-COVID, during COVID. Um, I feel because of that, traditional approaches for uh, training, simulation, maintenance training are not going to work, are simply not going to work. Now, if 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 we mandate people to have hands-on training, do we have enough aircrafts to train so many people? Like, uh, is there any uh, is there any way we can ensure that there is the aircraft available when the person wants to get trained on it? Um, even when we want to build simulations, we don't get access to data. So there is clearly, you know, uh, you know, obviously it's not so very uh, scalable. You can't, uh, you know, think that, you know, I'm going to bring an aircraft in the hangar. I'm going to put in 25 people in it and I'm going to train people. It's not going to work that way. It has to change. Um, so, and EVITOLs, of course, are themselves by nature revolutionary. So the way we need to train people on it needs to go in, in a scalable model. Of course, like Sir said, we need to partner with academic institutes, empower them with technology such that they have access to, if not real aircrafts, virtual aircrafts. And that's, in, if not in reality, in metaverse. So that's what probably we, we should do. And uh, imagine the time it takes for certifications. Mm -hmm. Today, if I build a virtual reality maintenance simulation uh, solution, it's going to take years for me to certify it under DGCA. It's not being uh, critical of it, but that's how it is. That's the reality. And of course, I need to meet the global standards. So uh, it is not prudent if I start now, it's probably late. So we need to start right now to, you know, meet the demands of the CAGR 10%, like the minister mm -hmm. said. A lot, of, a lot of investment required. So uh, I think that's interesting because the next, uh, next panel session that we have is actually going to be about the financing side uh, for the advanced air mobility industry. Uh, I'm just going to throw uh, some questions to the floor. Is there anybody who has any specific questions? Uh, for our panelists. Oh, we got uh, one at the back here, please. They'll they'll turn the mic on. There you go. Yeah, I, I can speak about the subject matter because I'm in the learning space and I know all the speakers. In fact, I work with uh, Wing Commander Bhatnagar on Arctic remote pilot training. Uh, all the points are right. In fact. Uh, uh, the panelists have very nicely articulated the concerns. For example, the simulator. The fellow uh, um, armored forces officers will tell me that a simulator is more expensive than the real aircraft, if you really want to make a simulator. But the uh, all the drone training organizations, whatever they do, I don't want to mention the simulator names here, they do some kind of a video game and it's not really the one which will prepare you to fly a drone. It will just excite your uh, childish uh, uh, happiness. Like you have to unlearn it when you have to go to field because I, I, I bear this flying uh, label with me. So you have to slow down and then go to the machine and talk the language it needs. And so the simulator is not the answer actually unless you put a lot of efforts to build really the simulator that every type of machine that is approved by DGCA specific to each machine, you have to make a simulator. And uh, sir, you mentioned, Vinkman uh, Bhatnagar mentioned about skill gap analysis. I think it's quite known 
there is a lot of skill gap uh, compared to a lot of projected figures and all uh, we are talking about lakhs and millions whereas uh, the number of approved machines are in less than 100 and then the number of pilots also less than a few thousands if you will and then say 50 training institutions is not sufficient to cater to the requirements of 2030 vision of global leadership there's a lot of work need to be done and every district level there should be government initiative uh, to build this ecosystem and put some efforts in addition to the pli and other things that it is already doing thank you okay okay there, there is a lot there to digest uh, and, and we only have nine minutes to to, to do it Anybody want to address some of the, I, I think there's questions about skill gaps uh, in there, questions about um, the simulation environment, where, where does simulation end, and then where does the real world uh, training uh, get? So I'll, I'll leave it to you, to you gentlemen. Uh, I'll just, you know, uh, take on that uh, skill gap thing, uh, Kishore. Uh, you mentioned that. See, skill gap is something we know on the whole that, uh, you know, there is a million of, millions of, you know, hundreds of pilots or, you know, hundreds of the operators or, you know, in the background, uh, the technicians, or you know, the data analytics people, you know, they are wanted. But we, there's a very absurd number of what I meant was a skill gap is, you know, very detailed procedure. Uh, when a person jots down with each company going forward every year wise, uh, what is the detailed, you know, geographically and the entry level qualification, what is the required, what is the required, you know, and what's the What's the, you know, what's the kind of, you know, uh, growth which is required? So then, you know, uh, because there has to be a kind of letter of intent or kind of intention by a company which specifically jotted down. Then only, you see, any business model will work by any training entity only when they have a certain specified numbers. It is not that we just tell them, you know, you produce so many, you know, operators or so many, you know, technicians or so many, you know, um, the uh, kind of, you know, manufacturing uh, ability. It has to be very, very uh, detailed, specified with the detail analysis. So that's what is required to be put down on the paper and then telling the industry that this is the requirement or the training entity to you produce uh, the skill, you know, the workforce in that manner. So that's what I meant, uh, meant you know, about the skill gap required. And maybe you can take on the simulator, the simulator part of if there is any query. <laughs> yeah, the mic should be on. I think those are just a, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they'll they'll turn it they'll turn it off for you. Yeah, I think about the simulator. It's uh, I feel uh, it's a partnership. It's it's something that you know we're still not seeing a lot of e vitals out in the open. Is because there's still it's a technology. It's a it's a piece of thing that's going to come in reality and it's not yet there. Uh, but when we start, you know, when when we um, uh, progress as you know, uh, as as a whole bunch of mankind, uh, earlier we didn't have enough technology to build simulators along with the aircrafts because digital technology wasn't there. There was no concept of digital twins as such. Yeah. But can we do something like uh, build the digital twin in parallel with the, you know, with the aircraft itself? In fact, you can actually build the digital twin first and then the real aircraft to see simulation is not only for training. Simulation is to see whether how, how your aircraft is faring in the world of uh, virtual physics. So we have something called as virtual physics. You can put it under various conditions and see how it's faring across and how it is flying and with all the relevant GPS information, uh, maps, uh, you know, everything technically. So we can do that and then later on import it into a way where it can be flown virtually by a, by a real pilot. So I think that way, that could be the approach right from day one. And I'm very much uh, happy, you know, to, uh, for example, just giving an example, to work with Jaunt or Beta to, uh, you know, uh, not only me, all the simulation companies should actually go and offer that, you know, hey, why, why not have this done together as a partnership uh, uh, for pilots, for MRO, as well as for uh, your aircraft itself. I just want to add on the quality of training point which uh, the gentleman raised. So I think the onus lies on us because we are the responsible, we are carrying the responsibility of training the drone pilots. So the quality of certification, the quality of training is more of a, uh, though there are DGCS standards and the conformities which we need to adhere to, but more than that, it's the responsibility of the organization how, how, how best they can impart that training. 
as of now, there's no accreditation to the institutes, but I think going forward as the numbers will mushroom, there would be some ranking sub accreditations to the institute basis, their infrastructure, their quality and everything. That's brilliant. No, no, that's, so one point here. I think that's, that's not great. So one point here. Oh, well, last question. Yes. All right. Thank you. Please. Sir, we have been discussing about the exponential growth uh, that is going to take place in ASHA. Uh, uh, the panelists are experts in the field of skilling. Uh, kindly suggest an action plan to the Ministry of Civil Aviation to meet the emerging uh, manpower requirements. Thank you. So what, what actions do you think that the ministry needs to take uh, to make sure that we have the, the skilled people in the industry uh, to deliver ASHA? No, I think uh, we are at a nascent stage, you know, right now to have a national plan on that. We have a national skill de development plan, you know, for a action plan, action plan. Yeah, action, action plan. plan. Action plan on skilling per se. Yeah. yeah. So let me take it up. So if you, yeah. yeah. So I think the government is doing very right initiatives. They have already started. Uh, uh, with the digital sky platform in place, they are trying to kind of uh, give a digital interface for all these trainings and uh, whatever DGCA has all the tools available, they are trying to digitize in the form of a digital sky. As Minister has also said that in next one month, they will try to open more green zones. So 90% would be more green zones where you can go and do uh, flying and have a normal flying experience for that. So I think it's the time when the demand side, the demand is very robust. I agree with you. The supply side will definitely grow according to that. As of now also, there are around 40 to 45 institutes which are catering to the demand. But again, I come back to the point which I made in my panel discussion of the convergence. Single, only 40 to 45 institutes can't cater to the demand of the country. Everybody has to come together. Uh, so I was glad to see that, like for example, just giving an example and quoting the IIT Kanpur name here. IIT Kanpur, a very premier institute, they have just started a two-year integrated a master's in technology program only in drone technology. So that's one of the best and the uh, very USP in the country. That they're only in drone technology. Now, IIT Kanpur, they have a huge land parcel. For example, if we, if the government allows us that you can go and uh, do a flying in IIT Kanpur campus, then it's a, it's a ready state for us that we can give the drone pilot trainings there and then only at the doorstep of the, uh, or the, of the students. So I think that will open up gradually once we build the industry will grow and the demand side will stretch. The supply yeah. side will also stretch. But let me tell you outright, the question is, you know, the national plan on skill development on this EVTOL. So right now, let me tell you outrightly, it has not come yet. It's not on the table yet because the industry is still evolving. So we don't have any fixed number. How many companies going to, how many startups going to come in into the industry? What is the demand going to be? We're still discussing the ATM, the UTM and all the parts, right? The components are coming together as a piece. When the industry is completely met, getting into maturing form, we are going to produce, we have a you know, strategic corridors coming in from where to where we are going to have last mile, first mile connectivity to start with. Let the first e fly. Then only we'll know that what's the, what's the common plan, you know, to which all, uh, uh, the you know, the major city is going to get connected the first mile, last mile, and where the thing's going to come up. We still don't have right now the BV loss drones trials getting over yet. So this is a still a far cry right now. And so that's why I'm asking, when the industry is coming together, they have to tell us, or maybe the government has to pitch in there and hold a handhold, you know, uh, the industry and come out with a, you know, round table discussion that what is a, our major plan is. When the key plan is in place, then only we can talk about the, the pipeline of skill. So right now it is not there. Thank you. Last word. Yeah, go ahead. They'll, they'll turn the mic on. I know it's frustrating. It should be on. Oh, try another one. No problem. Thanks. So just to add to it, if you really see, uh, you know, the national education policy, uh, the recently launched policy that we have in place in the government, it's, it is so much hand in hand with the skill development or the skilling plan. Uh, if you really look at the, and I'm only going to talk about the MRO and maintenance aspect of it. Uh, you have so many vocational courses that have recently started, uh, maybe painting, welding, uh, you know, so talk about aircraft MRO, you know, skilling. Now, as a plan, as an action plan, identifying certain aerospace institutes where at an ITI level, we can train people. We have a demographic of 65% population under the age of 35. Uh, 
35. So if you look at that, that level of people, you know, ITI level people who can actually, you know, get trained in those aerospace institutes, empowered with cutting edge technologies, uh, that could be the first step, identifying them, empowering with them. Second step would be empowering with uh, them with the technology. And third step would be to see how they can actually, you know, fit into the industry. So making them ready for the industry. Now, when we talk about vocational courses, the national education policy tells us that there has to be a 60% industry component into it. When you talk about 60% industry component, you're almost into the industry while you're still studying. Now with these three pointers, this can become your baby action plan to actually start imagining and doing it right away after we leave the hall. Uh, that's that's great. Thank you very much. I'm just noticing our screen down here. It's actually saying time's up. It's the first time I've seen it come up all conferences, uh, despite us running over. So uh, with the the, the the last closing remark I have in terms of your question, uh, I, I think we all heard that the minister made this uh, commitment to sitting at a round table with everybody. And I think that probably goes direct to your question uh, that the, the minister is recognizing this change that the whole industry needs to get together. Uh, and this is why my summary slides earlier were talking about this collaboration across ministries um, to be able to en enable ASHA uh, within the Indian context. Uh, and with that, I'm going to say thank you very much to our panel and we'll thank them in the usual way. Thank you, Daryl. I now request all our panelists to pose for a group photograph and Daryl to hand over a token of our appreciation to our panelists. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the last session for today and for ASHA 2023 on financing models and investment in the advanced air mobility landscape. Financing innovation, scaling up of proven technologies, manufacturing and delivery of these services will require new investment models and unique products. With more and more companies and large corporations entering the AAM industry, competition has increased significantly. This session will cover how startups attract billions of dollars of investment and how to safeguard investment into this innovative ecosystem by delivering results and bringing meaningful changes in the industry. The session will also discuss marketing and leasing models for eVTOLs and the role of airlines and leasing companies. I now invite the moderator, Mr. Daryl Swanson, and our panelists, Mr. Anshuman Tripathi, member, National Security Advisory Board, Government of India, Mr. Mahesh Gandhi, Senior Managing Partner, AFII Capital, Mr. Govind Nair, CEO, Thambi Aviation, Mr. Kunal Sangani, Finance Head at Hunch Urban Mobility, who will join us virtually. Mr. Asa Kwesenberry, Chief Executive Officer, Skyscape. And Kristen bartok To, who will join us virtually. Welcome to our panel. Uh, I'm, I'm going to stand over here my usual way because really this 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 panel session is about you gentlemen uh, and uh, our other online speakers. Sorry, I'm just trying to find my. Right. So as as we've seen, um, literally billions have been going into the uh, advanced air mobility field, and and we've we've seen. Companies like Joby and Archer um, and Vertical Aerospace raised literally billions of dollars through SPACs, uh, and it was interesting watching the whole the whole SPAC space uh, explode at one time and, and valuations going up and then going down and all this speculation. That and it's almost like uh, the the SPAC space has kind of exploded and has gone away in in the U.S. market. And I think that the uh, the, the securities 
uh, commission is starting to clamp down a little bit more. So I'm just kind of curious about where the rest of the funding is actually going. Um, so in, in our usual fashion, what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll start online. Uh, if you could just give us a, your, your name, uh, the, the company you're with, the, 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 the work that you're doing in this space, uh, and then we'll come down the line and then we'll start into our, our panel discussion. Oh, so we'll, we'll start online if, if that's all right. Kanal, can, can you hear us? Hi, yes. Good, good evening. All right, so good evening, distinguished guest. Uh, myself, Kunal Sangani, I'm with Blade India uh, as a finance head since inception of the company in India. So very much in thick and thin of the entire operations, the ecosystem that India is emerging into since the beginning of 2018 till date. Uh, it's very exciting field actually. And, and yes, the question of emerging uh, industry is very valid with this uh, 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 industry and uh, very excited to go ahead on this uh build up more on this aspects of evtols and urban advanced urban air mobility great thank you and we'll just start down the end here yep yeah hi uh my name is Gobind Naya. i'm the ceo of tumbi aviation and also the founder of heli taxi uh we were one of the early movers in the urban uh, air mobility space in india with uh, our operations commencing in bangalore so we tested the waters with heli taxi coming in 2018 uh, connecting Bangalore Airport to the city. Uh, we've learned a lot over the last uh, five, seven years uh, with respect to how uh, the space has been growing. Um, though we've made mistakes in the beginning, helicopters are probably a very exp expensive machine to really uh, be deployed in urban air mobility. Uh, but then with EBTOLs coming in, uh, we're sure that we're building enough infrastructure and groundwork uh, and the regulatory framework is also developing in a, in a, in a very progressive way uh, to support the operations when they commence. So looking forward to this space, and I hand over the mic to the next gentleman, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Asa Questenberry, founder and president of Skyscape Corporation, a vertiport development and management company based out of Japan, operating primarily here in APAC. Um, so my my space, and I guess in the finance conversation as a founder who has raised capital um, in traditionally a very conservative capital market, uh, how that's been utilized to actually grow the business and kind of our unique position with the capital we've raised and how that can be applied to other markets that are looking to develop air mobility and what type of capital structures might be necessary. And again, thank you for having me here. Cheers, Lisa. Good evening. Thanks, uh, CII, for this opportunity. And thanks, Dale, for uh, setting this up. My sincere apologies for those to endure us now as the last session after two full days of full-blown air mobility, advanced mobility. I'm sure many of the seniors have gone and left the youngsters to still sit here and endure our last panel. Uh, Del, I had a few slides. Is this a good yeah, time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you organize for the slides. Kunal, can you put them up? So my name is Anshuman Tripathi. I'm member National Security Advisory Board. I report to the National Security Advisor, Shri Ajit Doval. Uh, many of you might know him. But in my previous life, before I came to India a few years back, I was deeply entrenched in the urban mobility space in uh, the Bay Area, California. And um, so I'm going to share some of the things that I observed back then and what I'm observing today being here. And uh, Next slide. So uh, 2017 uh, Paris Air Show, that was a car which was shown. Most of you know which car that is, it's Aeromobile 3.0. My previous job, I invested in that uh, car, in that company in Slovakia. And uh, you know, I thought I'll put my photograph because last time when I gave this presentation, some of people looked at me and said, you know, they didn't look convinced. So I put my photograph in there. That's me in the car right there back in 2017. 2016, before that, uh, we held the first panel in the Bay Area on urban mobility. That's the car called Terra Fugia, which was bought by a Chinese company back then. And that time, the fixed wing was the main area and uh, distributed electric propulsion was still coming up. And uh, jetpacks were still in absolute infancy. I, I mean, everybody here has probably gone through. 
So this is where we were back then. And seven years down the road, when I come here today, I'm thrilled to see what all's gone ahead. But I'm also a little challenged. And I was just talking to uh, uh, Mr. Gandhi here before we were coming in, that we are still, some of the pain points are still kind of stuck. And we need a lot of youngsters to come in and uh, take the bull by the horn, so to say. And we still need a lot to go forward. Next slide, please. So jetpacks back then in 2016 were unknown. This month, Indian Army bought 48 packs. I have unified uh, uniformed officers back there. I mean, Army, Navy, Air Force, I can see some white and blue. I'm sure there's some green also, which I can't see from here. So over the period of seven years, we have actually gone so advanced that we have actually got people, uh, you know, uh, countries buying jetpacks. But for the, uh, you know, the, the EV tall space as we envisage it to be, we still have some pieces to put together to make it mainstream. So from a financing perspective, where we were back then in the Bay Area, I would still look at what are we funding? What are we investing in? Are we looking at all the pain points? Which pain point are we looking at? I'm sure when I was looking at it back then, I wasn't looking at jetpacks as the main area which should be funded today. But had I known this, hindsight 2020, I would have probably invested in this back then more than I invested in other things in that space. So is there an enabling technology? Is there an application specific which I need to look at? And even if those things are all checked, does that actually fit into the economics? This is where I'm kind of um, still uh, vacillating over which is the next place where I put in my next dollar or my next rupee. And I'm sure Daryl also has the same kind of questions. And that's why we're having this panel. And I'm so excited that we are all here. But I do apologize if I'm taking a contrarian view, but to keep you all awake after two days of intense this thing, I need to take a contrarian view. Next slide. So if you were an investor and you were sitting in Bangalore, would you invest in a new mode of transport to go from Bangalore to Coimbatore? Or would you look at something which was intra-city and go from one end of MG road to the other end of MG road in five minutes. And what's the premium you'd like to pay? You think it over. Is that something which is uh, a pain point? And how much of it is a pain point? Like oh, I was talking to my esteemed colleague Greg before this, and uh, they have a helicopter service. We have helicopters which are doing this. But if we have six helicopters flying over Bangalore, Bangalore would be a war zone. It would look like Ukraine. So that's not the eventual solution. What is the solution? I don't know. Yeah, I'm sorry, Daryl. I mean, you sit down, you know, like uh, it's, but I do have- <laughs> You got to take slides. it all in. Yeah. So next, as I talked about in my previous slide is economics. Am I paying the same amount for that five minute ride to go from my house to the airport as I'm paying to go from Bangalore to Coimbatore? Or am I paying the same price which I pay to go from Bangalore to New Delhi or even further? Am I looking at a 5X or a 10X over the Uber? And I'm sure back in the day when Uber Elevate was working and in my conference at the time when Uber Elevate was just launched, they were looking at it saying, no, 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 the price points would be similar. But we are still seven years down the road, still talking about a lot of this and over the, and uh, my esteemed colleague was there on another panel and we talked about this point that the financial models yet need to be crystallized. We need to be able to see where's the money. I'm happy to put in my rupee or my dollar and I'm sure I would love to invest along with Daryl and my esteemed colleagues here. Where? So I don't know if this is the right view of urban mobility and advanced mobility. Or is it going to have a, some different view? I'm sure there will be a view, uh, an, an application space. Is this the right one that we have been looking at? Or like jetpacks, there'll be another something coming from the blind spot. And as an investor, I have not invested into it. And then I 
I'll be looking at my limited partners and they will be saying, well, we, we were in this together. How come you're the GP and you didn't know this? And that's when we come to organizations like CII and this esteemed place and knowledge, um, you know, gurus like Daryl and everyone to say, help us out to understand. We'd love to put in the money. And I'm sure my colleagues will be ready to put in the money. And from a national security perspective, I want to know what's the next thing which I can advise my boss. If tomorrow Karnataka police has to chase a guy and he goes up in the air, he, the, the inspector can't stand there and wait for him to come down when his batteries and juices you know, dry up. So what is the space? Next, and that's my last slide, sir. So if you look at it, Agility, Prime, AF Works, and all are looking at going in a direction where they have big money going in. They're looking at the rewards because the armed force is needed. All the armed forces in the world have same requirements, same things. Right now, from everything that I understand, V-22 Osprey was in one specific space, which we are also looking at from our perspective to solve. And I also understand that Boeing and all have discontinued the further manufacture of V-22s. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we know that there's a space which has been created. The demand still exists. The funding would probably be going in there. But will it be ready tomorrow? Will it be ready five years down the road, 10 years down the road? Will it be a G2G between India and the United States when we buy those for our men in uniform, men and women in uniform? Will we be doing? I don't know. But that is gives me a little more confidence. And I believe that maybe that route will take us to the urban mobility and advanced mobility in the urban sector, which we are looking on the on the uh, you know the, the photo on the on the left. I don't know, but I do have this observation that in seven years, many of the challenges are still stuck, and I'm sure we'll discuss them out here. But I want it to be open that. We're not leaving something out and get blindsided to it. That's one idea. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I, I was resisting the urge to channel um, <laughs> Jerry Maguire, uh, Tom Cruise. Show me the money. Right. Uh, patiently waiting uh, here in the end. Yeah, they'll, they'll turn it off. I, I, okay. Yes. Yes. Great. Of course, Anshuman, I'm not sure. Pessimistic or optimistic? What kind of view you had? I'm sorry, before I introduce myself, I'd like to respond to a couple of things that he brought up. Uh, when we speak about uh, investment, there are different kinds of investment opportunities and different kinds of investors. There is speculative investor. That's one category who is uh, either a venture capitalist or he's an angel investor or it's a fund which is looking at or a hedge fund. Uh, that's one kind of investment. The second category is uh, where you speak specifically speak about equity. So once the speculative phase is over, then real equity investors start coming in. Simultaneously, we also have debt. Uh, the first category would be um, a mezzanine debt. The second would be a collateralized debt. Third would be project financing and equipment financing. When we speak about uh, this particular opportunity that we have right in front of us today, uh, whether it's going to happen now, whether it's going to happen later, will people invest, will people not invest? I, I would like to give you an example. Uh, 92, 93, uh, I was just starting my career, I would say. It was uh, probably my first advisory transaction, which I took up independently. We were advising uh, a company called, uh, it was a transport company called Amritsar Transport Company. And uh, they, they, they came to us and they said, we want to set up what is called a multiplex. Uh, a very different kind of, uh, you know, at that moment, we were watching movies in a cinema hall, paying 20 rupees for a ticket, and that's it. They came up to us and they said, we want to do this. And then we're going to be charging 70 rupees as the beginning the starting price. And then we'll go up to 150 rupees for a gold standard kind of thing. Uh, who would be the partners? They said, we want a good partner who has experience. We scouted around the world. We were able to identify a company called Village Roadshow. 
Uh, Amritsar Transport Company owned a cinema hall in Delhi, a very popular cinema hall. It was called Priya. So together with Priya, it became PVR. It became, became PVR of Priya Village Roadshow. And then you, what you see today is PVR Limited. Uh, I'm fortunate to be a part of the, I would say, legacy. We helped start it. But if we look at that time, no one would pay even 20 rupees or 30 rupees or 40 rupees to do to you know go into that cinema hall. Today, I'm sure even you are paying 1500 rupees to 2000 rupees to go into that same cinema hall. So it's time. People pay for convenience. People pay for uh, not just luxury. People pay for comfort. People pay for you know ability to do things differently and enjoy it more. So I'm sure what we have right in front of us today, people are going to pay for it. I, I, I'm absolutely sure people will pay for it. And when we speak about SPACs, Darren, that's where that's what we have speculative capital. Yeah. So that speculative capital was the first to come in. I'm sure we'll have mezzanine capital following. We will have collateralized debt for sure and project financing. So we will have all these so-called features of financing models coming in and playing a role in development of this particular market. Uh, and now a little bit about myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Mahesh Gandhi, of course, you see that. Uh, my full name is Mahesh Pal Singh Gandhi. He was joking about it, where's Pal and Singh gone? I said, these days, Pal Singh is not so popular, so I dropped it. So uh, here, here we are. And what, what we do is, uh, I live in Frankfurt in Germany, and uh, we invest in infrastructure on our own. We have our own small uh, family office uh, where we work together with some of our friends. Uh, I would not give a number right now, but of course, it's upwards of $5 billion. Uh, we invest in renewables and we invest in similar uh, products. Uh, but we also advise and we support infrastructure development projects. Mm -hmm. uh, what is attractive over here to me is, of course, aviation as a subject, because you need a lot of infrastructure development alongside whatever you're doing right now. As we saw uh, Patrick giving a presentation today, there is a lot of EV infrastructure required, EV charging infrastructure required. So that's one area in which we are investing already. We are partnering some companies from Germany. And uh, we look at this market over here for a few things. One, of course, is advising and supporting companies which are looking to you know, build this infrastructure, together with them investing in the same projects, and of course, uh, helping them structure it correctly so that they can go up the ladder and reach that exit level, which is required. Maybe it's going to happen three years from now, four years from now. That's what we do in brief. I've been doing this for now over 30 years, and uh, I dye my beard so you don't see it white. <laughs> young, young at heart, young at heart. Uh, that, that, that's really interesting. Uh, I, I'm an infrastructure person uh, at heart. I've spent a lot of time helping people buy airports around the world, so acquisition uh, due diligence, so completely understand that. Um, it, it actually brings me to a, a question that uh, I specifically asked for, for ASA to be brought up on, on the panel. Uh, we'd had a discussion uh, about the uh, the investment um, within the J Japanese market and the way that the Japanese market might be different structurally uh, to to enable the infrastructure investment to happen in those early years when it's not as viable as it would be uh, for other models. So so can you take us through that and then we'll then we'll go to Canal online and talk about Hanch Ventures uh, and and their view of what the market is uh, and then we'll come back to uh, uh, Thornby Aviation. Yeah, um, Joe, thank you. And um, again, yeah, air mobility seems to be uh, quite expensive to get started, yeah. right, as everyone has pointed out. Um, Japan's rather unique. So to step back for a second, I think you have to understand a lot of how large business happens in the Japanese market. Um, of course, you have your SMEs, you have, you know, a rapidly developing startup ecosystem, but you also have these trading houses and these are a lot of the the much larger global brands that are from japan that a lot of people are really familiar with your your mitsubis your mitsubishis you know these very very large corporations um, trading houses or shosha as we call them so what we have right now in air mobility with startups that are getting involved is you're, you're taking this startup mentality and you're trying to apply it to aviation <laughs> and they couldn't be more opposite and the financial and the structuring of the finances as well are, are very, very different. When you look at traditional VCs and the returns that we mentioned, you know, what's my two-year, what's my three-year ROI? At this early stage in the industry, they don't exist. Any, any startup telling you that they're going to give you an ROI within two years in this space is, is not being, you know, very, very honest with you. So in my, you know, very humble opinion, what I think has allowed Japan to rapidly move 
forward. And, you know, and if, if you're interested or if you looked at the market there, I mean, in two to three years, they went from not having a, a part 107 equivalent drone license to last December approving countrywide beef loss operations, you know, in, in a two or three year point to as well building out the air mobility industry. And a lot of that has come from the CBC and the corporate venture capital from these larger groups, because with these larger groups, they don't need a three-year ROI. Of course, they want their returns, but they're able to take a much more, I think, realistic approach with their companies, their portfolio companies that they invest in. They can grow alongside with them without having that massive kind of need to see that return in such a short period of time. So what this does is it allows the startup, you know, the air mobility group to make smart decisions as opposed to being rushed into riskier decisions that might not, you know, play out well over the long term, whether it be spending a bunch of money on a demonstration or trying to rush to market and get product market fit by having that corporate venture capital that's structured a little bit longer and the support of these, you know, not even just the finance side, but these groups also can provide human resources and R and D and alleviate some of that burden on for the actual startup itself. It allows a much more kind of organic growth of that company without, as I said, you know, forcing them into situations that might not work out in the long term. Um, so I think any group that's entered into the Japanese market that's you know raised significant amount of funds, they've been in talks with one or two of these groups, and it's really ironically Japan is a very very conservative capital market, right? It's very, very hard to raise capital there, especially if you don't have boots on the ground, a Japanese office, Japanese speaking staff. But with these kind of corporate venture capital groups and the CVCs that they offer, it's allowed things to happen, ironically, much faster than other markets, despite being traditionally much more conservative. So when we talked before about everything that's happening here in India and in everything with Asha in the future and how this plays out, we have to really drastically rethink how we approach the investment into this space, whether larger groups come in from the corporate side, whether the government gets involved. I don't think the traditional idea of you know, a venture capital alone will be enough to suffice for the, the capital demands that is necessary right now. Um, and I think we were talking a little bit before, you know, uh, I think Aaron had mentioned Frost Sullivan, you know, 50% of the, the air mobility markets will be here in APAC. Right. So that, that's the, the biggest opportunity in the world for air mobility to develop is right here. However, because of the way that finance is set up, it's one of the hardest markets to access the capital to then activate the huge opportunity that we have right now. So I think there's a lot that can be learned um, and kind of the symbiotic relationships that happen in Japan with some of these larger groups and how they're able to provide much more than financing, but also the resources that they need to allow groups to move forward at a realistic pace without forcing them into kind of um, difficult situations, I would say. Right, right. So uh, conservative, yet uh, 60 year foresight uh, in what they have. Uh, Kunal, can, can you give us a bit of, of your understanding of the, the market within India? And, and is there enough money available to, to fund the ASHA uh, dream that we have and that the minister was, was so uh, set on, on being a reality, uh, j just from Hancha's uh, point of view. Uh, right. Um, I echo the thought of uh, urban mobility, APAC going to be the one of the most interesting market across the globe because of the congestion we all know about it. Hancha urban mobility strongly believes in that. I give you a little data on this. We call it serviceable, obtainable market, even though India is a billion plus population, but still everybody doesn't fly. But when we talk about the serviceable, obtainable market, it's still by large is very good market. And we have seen those markets. We have taste, uh, I mean, run the, we have opened the routes and all. There has been a lot of trigger points, which gives us a lot of strength uh, and the confidence to go further deep into the market, but yes, uh, uh, another inside India not being in the spending capacity like US, China, Europe. So realignment is absolutely necessary. That's where the Asha gets the wings. Now, the most importantly, there has been the alignment in the ecosystem as well. Now, ecosystem is developing with the gift city coming on, exim banks, and many more financiers. Mr. Gandhi is there who are looking India in a very positive manner of all these things i believe so even if you don't want to you have to uh, keep india in your 
list of investments because next three, four, five years, it's going to be big. It's going to be disruptive in India. That's what we firmly believe. And that's why we are into the market and going strong with the concept. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Govind, can you tell us your financing, uh, the, the, the story of you getting the financing for your company? Um, does it mesh with what's been said here or do you have a, a different approach that you use or where are you in your in your uh, in your funding uh, circle? As a helicopter operator, I think it's important to know what your capacity is, right? Uh, just as Anshuman was uh, drawing a parallel here about uh, how Bangalore could look like a Ukraine with six helicopters flying in, the sad reality is that we don't have the manpower and the equipments to actually fly six helicopters in India in the current situation through the day. The maximum that any operator can fly if he's flying 365 days in India is about, say, three to four hours at the best with the manpower that we have currently. So do we have enough demand and enough business for those three to four hours in a day? The answer is yes. Right. How do we prioritize that? How much of that do we put in towards urban air mobility? And how much of that do we put in towards other revenue making, uh, you know, ventures like LIDAR surveys, like state government contracts, like political flying, like Kedarnath operations, these are all high volume operations. So as operators in India with the limited resources that we have, we need to, uh, we need to formalize where we invest, you know, our resources in. We need to have part of it in urban air mobility, like how we do the heli taxi operations in uh, Bangalore. Probably it's not, it's not breaking even at the moment, but you have other full revenue ventures that you really getting into, which are your bread earner. And the urban air mobility, uh, you know, prospective routes that you do is your little investment that you're doing to the society for the future. Somebody needs to do the groundwork. Somebody has to go through the grind. It, it doesn't matter that after five years, uh, EVTOLs are ready and everybody has the money to buy EVTOLs. Is the infrastructure in place? Is the regulatory framework in place? And these are important questions to address. And that will happen only by operators like us, like Blade, getting into it, doing the groundwork, sitting with the DGCA and framing uh, regulatory frameworks, which are important. Uh, it is not easy to certify a new machine. It requires a lot of hard work that goes in. So we need to, we need to pave the foundation with respect to, um, you know, what are the challenges for EV tolls or any new concept, which is coming in one is public acceptance. Does the public accept flying an EV toll regulatory frameworks, the challenges in it. And the third is infrastructure. And for these three to fall in place, some operators like us have to do the drill. And that's what we are doing over the last seven years. We've been building infrastructure. There are a lot of helipads that we have supported in terms of building, in terms of certifying, uh, and we have been flying them with our helicopters tomorrow. They are ready for EV tolls to fly in and fly out. So uh, we firmly believe that there is a tomorrow when uh, EV tolls are going to be the future where mass, mass transportation is going the skyway and the skyway will be the new highway. And that's bound to happen. So we're just doing our bits and pieces to put it together. So, so you're really bootstrapping yourself through through the, the the financing side, and then building all the data from the bottom up, uh, and then use that to support your investment case. Okay, I'm going to change tact uh, a little bit. My thing is saying time up, but I'm going to completely ignore that. Um, I, I want to come to Mr. Therapy and Gandhi uh, in in the guise of being controversial. Um, we've seen uh, the cryptocurrency world uh, grow and drop and explode and drop, and it's going up and down. I've been looking at uh, blockchain technology. Uh, so either smart contracts uh, is a very interesting way of, of trying to help help provide finance or, or, or that part. But I'm also interested in the, the whole idea of cryptocurrency within uh, aviation. And we have air airlines which are accepting payments uh, through through cryptocurrencies. I'm just wondering from your experience and background and understanding, is that something that, you, that you're actively looking at? Um, and how big is that uh, within the Indian market? Crypto is, of course, uh, I, I would say it's very different from the aviation market. I, I, I would not compare the two. Yeah. It's very dangerous to do that. Yeah. Uh, when we speak about crypto, it's uh, 
typically blockchain, but when we speak about aviation and EV tolls, and when we speak about what else is being done, it is a real manufacturing. It's a real product. It's a real infrastructure. Yeah. So I, I don't see there's a comparison between the two. I'm sorry, uh, but of course, SPACs are investing in both. Yeah. Uh, SPACs have invested big time in cryptos. And please appreciate that still remains even up to date, even after four, five, six, seven years of, you know, they being in the market. Uh, acceptability is there, but it still remains a speculative investment. Mm -hmm. It will never become a collateralized or a project finance story. So, so what, what, what about um, NFTs in terms of uh, potential ownership of assets uh, as a way of raising finance? Is, is that going to be something you, you, you think? Uh, potential ownership of assets, of course, you know, let's, let's look at uh, the way uh, things are happening right now. Uh, we can speak about different uh, EVTOL companies, different parts of the world who have already got received orders, you know, advance orders, and they're mm -hmm. receiving advance money from people, from companies who are going to be using those assets. So ownership of assets, uh, it's actually happening even before those assets have been developed. Yeah. That's the key difference here. Mm -hmm. And those people, of course, we can speak about LCI, we can speak about, there are, there are a few companies, of course, which have invested, which have already placed orders for these uh, assets, these machines. Of course, they are looking forward to development of infrastructure simultaneously. It's going to happen. So uh, it's, of course, uh, there was a stage and there's still a stage, some, some level of speculative, yes, but it's getting more and more real. It's getting more and more concrete now. So that's why I would, right. you know, so no. not compare the two. No is the answer, I think. Yeah. yeah. Crypto. Yep. Just curious. Um, as he rightly said, crypto and this is not as comparable. And but on the same point, I would say urban mobility is not comparable to movie theaters. <laughs> I have to start it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, coming back to the point. I, if I have to make a comparison with a technology which is still going through the ups and downs, I would not compare with crypto, but I would compare with the maglev technology, mass transit. And most of you might have uh, flown through Shanghai and uh, there's a maglev uh, system taken to the city. But many of the times where people take a cab instead of the maglev and, uh, you know, the economics plays out or whatever. I would look at that when I am looking at comparisons to do a case study to see which ones are, are, are to be successful. What areas will it be successful in? I am completely confident there is a future for urban mobility and advanced mobility. What is the shape and form and structure? I want to leave a little more space hedge my bets a little more. And maybe that's the training that I got when I was back in the day working with the SBIR program in the United States government. So I've been involved for more than 10 years. Agility Prime also comes out of the SBIR, SCTR program. And I'm just saying, we have a lot of people, even Gobind was talking about the fact that his uh, whole asset uh, is split across different uh, verticals. and they are also utilizing it to their best advantage. And we have opportunity space, which is still to be utilized as a wild west out there. How will that wild west get colonized? How will it actually play out from Japan to Amritsar, you said, to Bangalore is gonna be different. But of these, Bangalore is a prime example. And each one of us, next time we take an Uber or are running behind to catch a flight, has an opportunity to look and see which way will this whole thing pivot. That is where I'm going with it. I'm quite confident money will flow. The governments all over the world are funding it. Obviously, the government takes it seriously if you have so many people in uniform sitting out there. And uh, we are confident it's going to go. How? Is looking into the globe, into one of those uh, wishing wells, which way? Daryl can help, help us in this a lot more than I can 
because of the way the things are flowing. You know, we can all speculate at this stage. Thanks. Thank you. I think, and I just to touch really quickly, I think one of the the advantages or the advantage points that India as a market has right now is you have your your kind of first generation companies in the air mobility space, right? That raise funds that had these SPACs that launched that had their own you know amount of startups. And now you have the second wave countries that are popping up that in some ways are playing catch up. But that actually is a really good point to be in because you can look at the financial structures that didn't work, you know, that didn't that didn't play out properly. And you can learn directly from that to figure out what is okay, what is what is the proper approach and what works for our own market. So in that sense, I think it, India has a huge advantage with the size of the market, with the potential here, and with the previous experience garnered you know, the world over to come up with a more comprehensive approach to getting some of this funded and coming up with a clear idea of how this actually creates returns for the country. Right. So I've, I've been given a card. Uh, we have to close. So I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble. So most, most apologies uh, to that. Uh, what, what's even worse uh, is that uh, I had some videos lined up uh, from some friends of mine. Uh, so one, Kirsten Bartok Tao of uh, New Vista Capital, uh, based out of the West Coast. And we did a 15 minute uh, kind of interview between the two of us. And, and Kirsten just has this incredible experience. Uh, and I would say it's a, a technology, aviation technology finance 101. Uh, so unfortunately, we're not, we haven't got time to play that, but uh, I've been told that we can make that video available uh, to uh, everybody who's attended, we can we can mail out a link for that. But on top of that, uh, I also had Michael Diamond uh, from Nexa Capital uh, out of the U.S. give us uh, airport and uh, Verdi Port Financing 101 uh, in terms of what he does. And uh, so he has another company called UAM Geomatics. And, and the interesting thing that they've done is using uh, geospatial solutions, they've actually started mapping out cities around the world and where the demand is and predicting the volume of advanced air mobility. And I think it's possibly more credible than, than some of the, the big five have done because they've actually done some bottom-up analysis, very similar to, to, to what we do. Uh, and the other person I have to apologize to uh, is Sergio Chikata uh, of SMG Consulting. And if you're familiar with Sergio, uh, he's developed the AAM Reality Index. Uh, and I would definitely suggest that uh, you take a look at the AAM Reality Index because he goes in, uh, deep dives into the companies, looks at their financing, understands their technology, he talks with them, and then he basically index which uh, OEM uh, is at which space and, and how likely they are to get through uh, that. So you can read a lot of insights there. He's also doing it on the uh, infrastructure uh, side of the game as well, looking at uh, how ready they are, how their organizations are. So um, unfortunately, we're not going to have time for, for questions uh, for the rest of the panel. And, and for that, I, I apologize most sincerely. Uh, and I'm hopeful that uh, the, the next iteration of the ASHA event will, will schedule in some more time for that. So with that, I'm going to say thank you very much to the panel. And uh, thank you very much. I think, I think the next picture, Asha guys. has to be three days, Daryl. What do you say? So I request all participants to pose for a group photograph and Daryl to hand over a token of our appreciation. Thank you. I now call on stage Mr. Amit Datta, Chairman CII Task Force on Short Haul Air Mobility and Managing Director Hunch Air Mobility to first hand over a note of our appreciation I now request Amit Datas, Chairman CII Task Force on Short Haul Air Mobility and Managing Director, Hunch Air Mobility. Daryl, please wait. To hand over a to token of our appreciation to Daryl Swanson, our moderator for the past two days. Amit, it's over there. It's two bags. Thank you so much, Daryl.
for all the interesting and engaging conversation over the past two days. I now invite Mr. Datta to, to give the vote of thanks and close Asha 23. Good evening. It's been a very long day, right? Just a few comments. Uh, and this is really from, you know, my career. What I've learned is the future is not a linear extrapolation of the past, right? Uh, 20 years back, I joined Reliance Infocom to launch the telecom revolution, right? In 2002, the mobile phone market was 100,000 phones. And I was privileged to be part of the core committee uh, reporting to Mr. Mukesh Ambani. A uh, leading for consultancy company charged us a bomb and gave a 10 year forecast of 5 million phones, right? As you know, the next year, 2003, Reliance Infocom sold 5 million phones and the market was 1,000 million phones, right? After, ten, after I think 10 or 12 years, right? So my big learning is that if there is consumer need, right? it is very, very difficult to predict disruption. In an earlier era, the path to powered flight was opened up by dreamers and oddball inventors who braved both public ridicule and physical injury. Today, we have a different set of dreamers and scientists, engineers who are pioneering a new journey Today, indeed, is a milestone event, right? We are at the absolute nascency of the business. And I think for the Honorable Minister to Christian this as Asha, right, as a hope and inspiration is really a very apt uh, acronym for this journey. We often talk about, you know, is this really a fantasy? Will it happen? Just to remind all of you all, a month back, the first historic test flight with a Beta Alia 250 and Blade actually happened in Westchester's country, right? That was a real time event, right? And it will get simulated. It will take time for the development to follow, but this is the, uh, the actual flight of an electric craft is now reality. There is a long way to go, but I think this the collective uh, intelligence learnings from all of you here have contributed in a very, very significant way and a huge thank you. First, I would like to thank the Ministry of Civil Aviation, the DGCA and the Air Force, the Navy, the Army, who've all participated. We do know this is a regulated industry and without the active encouragement and support of the government, the regulators, Right, it's a tough journey, and the honorable minister's description of this being a round table captures the support. I'd also like to thank each and every single speaker, every single participant, and all our sponsors, right, for coming together. A lot of you have come from international markets. Thank you for taking the trouble. A special word of thanks to Daryl for having moderated this event at relatively short notice and really presenting the info in a very insightful way. And before I end, right, to CII for engaging a very large team in putting this event together and working tirelessly to ensure that the first ever event is a success, many thanks. So on that note, I bring this conference to a close. Thank you very much and we will be back very soon.